Chapter 15 of The Faith of Our Fathers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Chenevere. The Faith of Our Fathers by James Cardinal Gibbons. Chapter 15 Sacred Images. The veneration of the images of Christ and his saints is a cherished devotion in the Catholic Church, and this practice will be vindicated in the following lines. It is true, indeed, that the making of holy images was not so general among the Jews as it is among us, because the Hebrews themselves were prone to idolatry, and because they were surrounded by idolatrous people who might misconstrue the purpose for which the images were intended. For the same prudential reasons, the primitive Christians were very cautious in making images and very circumspect in exposing them to the gaze of the heathen among whom they lived, lest Christian images should be confounded with pagan idols. The catacombs of Rome, to which the faithful alone were admitted, abounded, however, in sacred emblems and pious representations, which are preserved even to this day and attest the practice of the early Christian church. We see there, painted on the walls or on vases of glass, the dove, the emblem of the Holy Ghost, Christ carrying his cross, or bearing on his shoulders the lost sheep. We meet also the Lamb, an anchor, and a ship, appropriate types of our Lord, of hope, and of the Church. The first crusade against images was waged in the eighth century by Leo the Isaurian, Emperor of Constantinople. He commanded the paintings of our Lord and his saints to be torn down from the church walls and burned. He even invaded the sanctuary of home and snatched thence the sacred emblems which adorned private residences. He caused statues of bronze, silver, and gold to be melted down and conveniently converted them into coins upon which his own image was stamped. Like Henry the Eighth and Cromwell, this royal iconoclast affected to be moved by a zeal for purity of worship, while avarice was the real motive of his action. The emperor commanded the learned librarians of his imperial library to give public approbation to his decrees against images, and when those conscientious men refused to endorse his course, they were all confined in the imperial library the building was set on fire, and thirty thousand volumes, the splendid basilica which contained them, innumerable paintings, and the librarians themselves, were involved in one common destruction. Constantine Capronimus prosecuted the vandalism of Leo, his predecessor. Stephen, an intrepid monk, presented to the emperor a coin bearing that tyrant's effigy with these words, Sire, whose image is this? it is mine replied the emperor the monk then threw down the piece of money and trampled it he was instantly seized by the imperial attendants and soon after put to a painful death alas cried the holy man to the emperor if i am punished for dishonouring the image of a mortal monarch what punishment do they deserve who burned the image of jesus christ the demolition of images was revived by the reformers of the sixteenth century Paintings and statues were ruthlessly destroyed, chiefly in the British Isles, Germany, and Holland, under the pretext that the making of them was idolatrous. But as the iconoclasts of the eighth century had no scruple about appropriating to their own use the gold and silver of the statues which they melted, neither had the iconoclasts of the sixteenth century any hesitation in confiscating and worshipping in the idolatrous churches whose statues and paintings they broke and disfigured. A stranger who visits some of the desecrated Catholic churches of Great Britain and the continent, which are now used as Protestant temples, cannot fail to notice the mutilated statues of the saints still standing in their niches. This barbaric warfare against religious memorials was not only a grievous sacrilege, but an outrage against the fine arts. And had the destroying angels extended their ravages over Europe, the immortal works of Michelangelo and Raphael would be lost to us today. The doctrine of the Catholic Church regarding the use of sacred images is clearly and fully expressed by the General Council of Trent in the following words. 
quote, the images of Christ and of his virgin mother and of other saints are to be had and retained, especially in churches, and a due honor and veneration is to be given to them, not that any divinity or virtue is believed to be in them for which they are to be honored, or that any prayer is to be made to them, or that any confidence is to be placed in them, as was formerly done by the heathens, who placed their hopes in idols. But because the honor which is given them is referred to the originals which they represent, so that by the images which we kiss, and before which we uncover our heads or kneel, we adore Christ and venerate his saints, whose likenesses they represent. Every Catholic child clearly comprehends the essential difference which exists between a pagan idol and a Christian image. The pagans looked upon an idol as a god endowed with intelligence and the other attributes of the deity. They were, therefore, idolaters or image worshippers. Catholic Christians know that a holy image has no intelligence or power to hear and help them. They pay it a relative respect, that is, their reverence for the copy is proportioned to the veneration which they entertain for the heavenly original to which it is also referred. For the sake of my Protestant readers I may here quote their own great Leibniz on the reverence paid to sacred images. He says in his Systema Theologicum, page 142, Though we speak of the honor paid to images, yet this is only a matter of speaking which really means that we honor not the senseless thing which is incapable of understanding such honor, but the prototype which receives honor through its representation, according to the teaching of the Council of Trent. It is in this sense, I take it, that scholastic writers have spoken of the same worship being paid to images of Christ as to Christ our Lord himself, for the act which is called the worship of an image is really the worship of Christ himself through and in the presence of the image and by occasion of it by the inclination of the body toward it as to christ himself as rendering him more manifestly present and raising the mind more actively to the contemplation of him certainly no sane man thinks under such circumstances of praying to this wise give me o image what i ask to thee o marble or wood i give thanks but thee o lord i adore to thee i give thanks and sing songs of praise given then that there is no more veneration of images than that which means venerations of their prototype there is surely no more idolatry in it than there is in the respect shown in the utterance of the most holy names of god and christ for after all names are but signs or symbols and even as such inferior to images for they represent much less vividly so that when there is question of honoring images, this is to be understood in the same way as when it is said that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bend, or that the name of the Lord is blessed, or that glory be given to his name. Thus the bowing before an image outside of us is no more to be reprehended than the worshipping before an external image in our own minds. For the external image does but serve the purpose of expressing visibly that which is internal. In the book of Exodus we read, Thou shalt not make to thyself a graven thing, nor the likeness of anything that is in heaven above or in the earth beneath, nor of those things that are in the waters under the earth. Thou shalt not adore them, nor serve them. Protestants contend that these words contain an absolute prohibition against the making of images, while the Catholic Church insists that the commandment referred to merely prohibits us from worshipping them as gods. The text cannot mean the absolute prohibition of making images, for in that case God would contradict himself by commanding in one part of Scripture what he condemns in another. In Exodus, for instance, he commands two cherubim of beaten gold to be made and placed on each side of the oracle, and in Numbers he commands Moses to make a brazen serpent and to set it up for a sign, that whoever being struck by the fiery serpents shall look upon it shall live. Are not cherubim and serpents the likenesses of creatures in heaven above, in the earth beneath, and in the waters under the earth? for cherubim dwell in heaven, 
and serpents are found on land and sea. We should all, without exception, break the commandment were we to take it in the Protestant sense. Have you not at home the portraits of living and departed relatives? And are not these the likenesses of persons in heaven above and on earth beneath? Westminster Abbey, though once a Catholic cathedral, is now a Protestant house of worship. It is filled with the statues of illustrious men. Yet no one will accuse the English church of idolatry in allowing those statues to remain there. But, you will say, the worshippers in Westminster have no intention of adoring these statues. Neither have we any intention of worshipping the statues of the saints. An English parson once remarked to a Catholic friend, Tom, don't you pray to images? We pray before them, replied Tom, but we have no intentions of praying to them. Who cares for your intention? retorted the parson. Don't you pray at night? observed Tom. Yes, said the parson, I pray at my bed. Yes, you pray to the bedpost. Oh, no, said the reverend gentleman. I have no intention of doing that. Who cares, replied Tom, for your intention. The moral rectitude or depravity of our actions cannot be determined without taking into account the intention. There are many persons who have been taught in the nursery tales that Catholics worship idols. These persons, if they visit Europe, and see an old man praying before an image of our Lord, or a Madonna, which is placed along the wayside, are at once confirmed in their prejudices. Their zeal against idols takes fire and they write home, adding one more proof of idolatry against the benighted Romanists. If these superficial travellers had only the patience to question the old man, he would tell them with simplicity of faith that the statue has no life to hear or help him, but that its contemplation inspired him with greater reverence for the original. As I am writing for the information of Protestants, I quote with pleasure the following passage written by one of their own theologians. In the Encyclopédie, quote, when Lot prostrates himself before the two angels, it is an act of courtesy toward their honored guests. When Jacob bows down before Esau, it is an act of deference from a younger to an elder brother. When Solomon bows low before Bathsheba, it is the honor which a son pays to his mother. When Nathan, coming in before David, had worshipped bowing down to the ground, it is the homage of a subject to his prince. But when a man prostrates himself in prayer to God, it is the creature adoring the Creator. And if these various actions are expressed, sometimes by the word adore, sometimes by worship or prostration, it is not the bare meaning of the word which has guided interpreters in rendering it, but the nature of the case. When an Israelite prostrated himself before the king, no one thought of charging him with idolatry. If he had done the same thing in the presence of an idol, the very same bodily act would have been called idolatry. And why? Because all men would have judged by his action that he regarded the idol as a real divinity, and that he would express, in respect to it, the sentiments manifested by adoration in the limited sense which we give to the word. What shall we think, then, of what Catholics do to show honor to saints, to relics, to the wood of the cross? They will not deny that their acts of reverence in such cases are very much like those by which they pay outward honor to God, but have they the same ideas about the saints, the relics, and the cross as they have about God? I believe that we cannot fairly accuse them of it." Close quote. A gentleman who was present at the unveiling of Clay's statue in the city of Richmond informed me that as soon as the curtain was uplifted and the noble form of the Kentucky statesman appeared in full view, the immense concourse of spectators instinctively uncovered their heads. "'Why do you take off your hat?' playfully remarked my friend to an acquaintance who stood by. "'In honor, of course, of Henry Clay,' he replied. "'But Henry is not there in the flesh. You see nothing but Clay. But my intention, sir,' he continued, "'is to do honor to the original.' He answered correctly. And yet how many of the same people would be shocked if they saw a man take off his hat in the presence of a statue of St. Peter? It is not, therefore, the making of the image, but its worship that is condemned by the Decalogue. 
having seen the lawfulness of sacred images let us now consider the advantage to be derived from their use first religious paintings embellish the house of god what is more becoming than to adorn the church which is the shadow of the heavenly jerusalem so beautifully described by st john solomon decorated the temple of god with images of cherubim and other representations and he overlaid the cherubim with gold and all the walls of the temple round about he carved with divers figures and carvings if it was meet and proper to adorn solomon's temple which contained only the ark of the lord how much more fitting is it to decorate our churches which contain the lord of the ark when i see a church tastefully ornamented it is a sure sign that the master is at home and that his devoted subjects pay homage to him in his court what beauty what variety what charming pictures are presented to our view in this temple of nature which we inhabit look at the canopy of heaven look at the exquisite pictures painted by the hand of the divine artist on this earth consider the lilies of the field i say to you that not even solomon in all his glory was arrayed as one of these if the temple of nature is so richly adorned should not our temples made with hands bear some resemblance to it how many professing christians must like david reproach themselves for dwelling in a house of cedar while the ark of god is lodged with skins how many are there whose private apartments are adorned with exquisite paintings who affect to be scandalized at the sight of a single pious emblem in their house of worship on the occasion of the celebration of henry w beecher's silver wedding several wealthy members of his congregation adorned the walls of plymouth church with their private paintings their object of course in doing so was not to honor god but their pastor but if the portraits of men were no desecration to that church how can the portraits of saints desecrate ours and what can be more appropriate than to surround the sanctuary of jesus christ with the portraits of the saints especially of mary and of the apostles who in their life ministered to his sacred person and is it not natural for children to adorn their homes with the likenesses of their fathers in faith second religious paintings are the catechism of the ignorant in spite of all the efforts of church and state in the cause of education a great proportion of the human race will be found illiterate descriptive pictures will teach those what books make known to the learned how many thousands would have died ignorant of the christian faith if they had not been enlightened by paintings when augustine the apostle of england first appeared before king ethelbert to announce to him the gospel a silver crucifix and a painting of our saviour were borne before the preacher and these images spoke more tenderly to the eyes than his words to the ears of his audience by means of religious emblems st francis xavier effected many conversions in india and by the same means father de smet made known the gospel to the savages of the rocky mountains third by exhibiting religious paintings in our rooms we make a silent though eloquent profession of our faith i once called on a gentleman in a distant city some time before our late war and on entering his library i noticed two portraits one of the distinguished general the other of an archbishop these portraits at once proclaimed to me the religious and patriotic sentiments of the proprietor of the house behold he said to me pointing to the pictures my religious creed and my political creed if i see a crucifix in a man's room i am convinced at once that he is not an infidel fourth by the aid of sacred pictures our devotion and love for the original are intensified because we can concentrate our thoughts more intensely on the object of our affections mark how the eye of a tender child glistens on confronting the painting of an affectionate mother what christian can stand unmoved when contemplating a picture of the mother of sorrows how much devotion has been fostered by the stations of the cross observe the intense sympathy depicted on the face of the humble christian woman as she silently passes from one station to another she follows her saviour step by step from the garden to mount calvary 
the whole scene like a panoramic view is imprinted on her mind her memory and her affections never did the most pathetic sermon on the passion enkindle such heartfelt love or invoke such salutary resolutions as have been produced by the silent spectacle of our saviour hanging on the cross fifth the portraits of the saints stimulate us to the imitation of their virtues and this is the principal aim which the church has in view in encouraging the use of pious representations one object it is true is to honor the saints another is to invoke them but the principal end is to incite us to an imitation of their holy lives we are exhorted to look and do according to the pattern shown us on the mount nor do i know a better means for promoting piety than by example if you keep at home the likenesses of george washington of patrick henry or chief justice taney or of other distinguished men the copies of such eminent originals cannot fail to exercise a salutary though silent influence on the mind and heart of your child your son will ask you who are those men and when you tell them this is washington the father of his country this is patrick henry the ardent lover of civil liberty and this is taney the incorruptible judge your boy will imperceptibly imbibe not only a veneration for those men but a relish for the civic virtues for which they were conspicuous and in like manner when our children have constantly before their eyes the purest and most exalted models of sanctity they cannot fail to draw from such contemplation a taste for the virtues that mark the lives of the originals is not our country flooded with obscene pictures and immodest representations which corrupt our youths if the agents of satan employ means so vile for a bad end if they are cunning enough to pour through the senses into the hearts of the unwary the insidious poison of sin by placing before them lascivious portraits in god's name why should not we sanctify the souls of our children by means of pious emblems why should not we make the eye the instrument of edification as the enemy makes it the organ of destruction shall the pen of the artist the pencil of the painter and the chisel of the sculptor be prostituted to the basest purposes god forbid the arts were intended to be the handmaids of religion almost every moment of the day the eye is receiving impressions from outward objects and instantly communicating these impressions to the soul thus the soul receives every day thousands of impressions good or bad according to the character of the objects presented to its gaze we cannot therefore overestimate the salutary effect produced upon us in a church or room adorned with sacred paintings we feel while in their presence that we are in the company of the just the contemplation of these pious portraits chastens our affections elevates our thoughts checks our levity and diffuses around us a healthy atmosphere i am happy to acknowledge that the outcry formerly raised against images has almost subsided of late the epithet of idolaters is seldom applied to us now even some of our dissenting brethren are beginning to recognize the utility of religious symbols and to regret that we have been permitted by the intemperate zeal of the reformers to have so long the monopoly of them crosses already surmount some of our protestant churches and replace the weathercock a gentleman of richmond recently informed me that during the preceding holy week he adorned with twelve crosses an episcopal church in which eleven years before the sight of a single one was viewed with horror by the minister may the day soon come when all christians will join with us not only in venerating the sacred symbol of salvation but in worshipping at the same altar End of chapter fifteen Chapter Sixteen of the Faith of Our Fathers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Chenever. The Faith of Our Fathers by James Cardinal Gibbons. Chapter Sixteen Purgatory and Prayers for the Dead. 
the catholic church teaches that besides a place of eternal torments for the wicked and of everlasting rests for the righteous there exists in the next life a middle state of temporary punishment allotted for those who have died in venial sin or who have not satisfied the justice of god for sins already forgiven she also teaches us that although the souls consigned to this intermediate state commonly called purgatory cannot help themselves they may be aided by the suffrages of the faithful on earth the existence of purgatory naturally implies the correlative dogma the utility of praying for the dead for the souls consigned to the middle state have not reached the term of their journey they are still exiles from heaven and fit subjects for divine clemency the doctrine of an intermediate state is thus succinctly asserted by the council of trent there is a purgatory and souls there detained are helped by the prayers of the faithful and especially by the acceptable sacrifice of the altar it is to be noted that the council studiously abstains from specifying the nature of the expatiating sufferings endured therein is it not strange that this cherished doctrine should also be called in question by the leveling innovators of the sixteenth century when we consider that it is clearly taught in the old testament that it is at least insinuated in the new testament that it is unanimously proclaimed by the fathers of the church that it is embodied in all the ancient liturgies of the oriental and the western church and that it is a doctrine alike consonant with our reason and eminently consoling to the human heart first it is a doctrine plainly contained in the old testament and piously practiced by the hebrew people at the close of an engagement which judas maccabeus had with the enemy he ordered prayers and sacrifices to be offered up for his slain comrades Quote, and making a gathering he sent twelve thousand drachmas of silver to jerusalem for sacrifice to be offered for the sins of the dead thinking well and religiously concerning the resurrection for if he had not hoped that they that were slain should rise again it would have seemed superfluous and vain to pray for the dead it is therefore a holy and wholesome thought to pray for the dead that they may be loosed from sins Close quote. these words are so forcible that no comment of mine could render them clearer passage proved a great stumbling block to the reformers finding that they could not by any evasion weaken the force of the text they impiously threw overboard the book of maccabees like a man who assassinates a hostile witness or like the jews who sought to kill lazarus lest his resurrection should be a testimony in favor of christ and pretended that the two books of maccabees were apocryphal and yet they have precisely the same authority as the gospel of st matthew or any other portion of the bible for the canonicity of the holy scriptures rests solely on the authority of the catholic church which proclaimed them inspired but even admitting for the sake of argument that the books of maccabees were not entitled to be ranked among the canonical books of holy scripture no one has ever denied that they are truthful historical monuments and as such that they serve to demonstrate that it was a prevailing practice among the hebrew people as it is with us to offer up prayers and sacrifices for the dead second when our saviour the founder of the new law appeared on earth he came to lop off those excrescences which had grown on the body of the jewish ecclesiastical code and to purify the jewish church from those human traditions which in the course of time became like tares mixed with the wheat of sound doctrine for instance he condemns the pharisees for prohibiting the performance of works of charity on the sabbath day and in the twenty-third chapter of st matthew he cites against them a long catalogue of innovations in doctrine and discipline but did our lord at any time reprove the jews for their belief in a middle state or for praying for the dead a practice which to his knowledge prevailed among the people never on the contrary more than once both he and the apostle of the gentiles insinuate the doctrine of purgatory our saviour says whosoever shall speak a word against the son of man it shall be forgiven him but he that shall speak against the holy ghost it shall not be forgiven him neither in this world nor in the world to come when our saviour declares that a sin against the holy ghost shall not be forgiven in the next life he evidently leaves us to infer that there are some sins which will be pardoned in the life to come 
Now in the next life, sins cannot be forgiven in heaven, for nothing defiled can enter there, nor can they be forgiven in hell, for out of hell there is no redemption. They must, therefore, be pardoned in the intermediate state of purgatory. St. Paul tells us that every man's work shall be manifest on the Lord's day. Fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, that is, if his works are holy, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work burn, that is, if his works are faulty and imperfect, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. His soul will be ultimately saved, but he shall suffer for a temporary duration in the purifying flames of purgatory. This interpretation is not mine. It is the unanimous voice of the fathers of Christendom. And who are they that have removed the time-honored landmarks of Christian faith by rejecting the doctrine of purgatory? They are discontented churchmen, impatient of the religious yoke, men who appeared on the stage sixteen hundred years after the foundation of Christianity. Judge you, reader, whom you ought to follow. If you want to know the true import of a vital question in the Constitution, would you not follow the decision of a story, a Jefferson, a Marshall, a Taney, jurists and statesmen, who were the recognized expounders of the Constitution? Would you not prefer their opinion to that of political demagogues, who have neither learning nor authority nor history to support them, but some selfish end to further? Now the same motive which you have for rejecting the opinion of an ignorant politician and embracing that of eminent jurists on a constitutional question impels you to cast aside the novelties of religious innovators and to follow the unanimous sentiments of the fathers in reference to the subject of purgatory. Third, I would wish to place before you extended extracts from the writings of the early fathers of the Church bearing upon this subject, but I must content myself with quoting a few of the most prominent lights of primitive Christianity. Tertullian, who lived in the second century, says that, quote, the faithful wife will pray for the soul of her deceased husband, particularly on the anniversary day of his falling asleep, death and if she fail to do so she hath repudiated her husband as far as in her lies. Close quote. Eusebius, the historian, 4th century, describing the funeral of Constantine the Great, says that the body of the blessed prince was placed on a lofty bier, and the ministers of God, and the multitude of the people, with tears and much lamentation, offered up prayers and sacrifice for the repose of his soul. He adds that this was done in accordance with the desires of that religious monarch who had erected in Constantinople the great church in honor of the apostles, so that after his death the faithful might there remember him. St. Cyril of Jerusalem, 4th century, writes, We commemorate the holy fathers and bishops and all who have fallen asleep from amongst us, believing that the supplications which we present will be of great assistance in their souls while the holy and tremendous sacrifice is offered up. Close quote. He answers by an illustration those that might be disposed to doubt the efficacy of prayers for the dead. Quote, if a king had banished certain persons who had offended him, and their relations, having woven a crown, should offer it to him in behalf of those under his vengeance, would he not grant a respite to their punishments? So we, in offering up a crown of prayers in behalf of those who have fallen asleep, will obtain for them forgiveness through the merits of Christ. St. Ephraim, in the same century, says, quote, I conjure you, my brethren and friends, in the name of that God who commands me to leave you, to remember me when you assemble to pray. Do not bury me with perfumes. Give them not to me, but to God me conceived in sorrow bury with lamentations and instead of perfumes assist me with your prayers for the dead are benefited by the prayers of living saints st ambrose same century on the death of the emperors gratian and valencian says quote, blessed shall both of you be gratian and valencian if my prayers can avail anything no day shall pass you over in silence no prayer of mine shall omit to honor you no night shall hurry by without bestowing on you a mention in my prayers. In every one of the oblations will I remember you. Close quote. On the death of the Emperor Theodosius, he offers the following prayer. 
quote, give perfect rest to thy servant theodosius that rest which thou hast prepared for thy saints may his soul return thither whence it descended where it cannot feel the sting of death i loved him and therefore will i follow him even unto the land of the living nor will i leave him until by tears and prayers i shall lead him unto the holy mountain of the lord where is life undying where corruption is not nor sighing nor mourning Close quote. St. Jerome, in the same century, in a letter of condolences to Pomachius on the death of his wife Paulina, writes, quote, Other husbands strew violets and roses on the graves of their wives. Al Palmachius bestows the hollow dust of Paulina with the basalms of alms. St. Chrysostom writes, quote, It was not without good reason ordained by the apostles that mention should be made of the dead in the tremendous mysteries because they knew well that they would receive great benefit from it st augustine who lived in the beginning of the fifth century relates that when his mother was at the point of death she made this last request of him lay this body anywhere let not the care of it in any way disturb you this only i request of you that you should remember me at the altar of the lord wherever you be and that pious son prays for his mother's soul in the most impassioned language. Quote, I therefore, he says, O God of my heart, do now beseech thee for the sins of my mother. Hear me through the medicine of the wounds that hung upon the wood. May she then be in peace with her husband. And inspire my Lord, thy servants our brethren, whom with voice and heart and pen I serve, that as many as shall read these words may remember at the altar monica thy servant Close quote. these are but a few specimens of the unanimous voice of the fathers regarding the salutary practice of praying for the dead you now perceive that this devotion is not an invention of modern times but a doctrine universally enforced in the first and purest ages of the church you see that praying for the dead was not a devotion continuously recommended by some obscure or visionary writer but an act of religion preached and inculcated by all the great doctors and fathers of the church who are the recognized expounders of the christian religion you see them too inculcating this doctrine not as a cold and abstract principle but as an imperative act of daily piety and embodying it in their ordinary exercises of devotion they prayed for the dead in their morning and evening devotions they prayed for them in their daily office and in the sacrifice of the mass they asked the prayers of the congregation for the souls of the deceased in the public services on sunday on the monuments which were erected to the dead some of which are preserved even to this day epitaphs were inscribed earnestly invoking for their souls the prayers of the living how gratifying it is to our catholic hearts that a devotion so soothing to afflicted spirits is at the same time so firmly grounded on the tradition of ages fourth that the practice of praying for the dead has descended from apostolic times is evident also from the liturgies of the church a liturgy is the established formulary of public worship containing the authorized prayers of the church the missal or mass book for instance which you see on our altars contains a portion of the liturgy of the catholic church the principal liturgies are the liturgy of st james the apostle who founded the church of jerusalem the liturgy of st mark the evangelist founder of the church of alexandria and the liturgy of st peter who established the church in rome these liturgies are called after the apostles who compiled them there are besides the liturgies of st chrysostom and st basil which are chiefly based on the model of that of st james now all these liturgies without exception have prayers for the dead and their providential preservation serves as another triumphant vindication of the venerable antiquity of this catholic doctrine the eastern and the western churches were happily united until the fourth and fifth centuries when the heresiarchs arius Destorius, and eutyches withdrew millions of souls from the centre of unity the followers of these sects were called after their founders arians nestorians and eutychians and from that day to the present the two latter bodies have formed distinct communions being separated from the catholic church in the east just as the protestant churches are separated from her in the west 
the greek schismatic church of which the present russo-greek church is the offspring severed her connection with the see of rome in the ninth century but in leaving the catholic church these eastern sects retained the old liturgies which they use to this day as i shall presently demonstrate during my sojourn in rome at the ecumenical council i devoted a great deal of my leisure time to the examination of the various liturgies of the schismatic churches of the east i found in all of them formulas of prayer for the dead almost identical with that of the roman missal Quote, remember o lord thy servants who are gone before us with the sign of faith and sleep in peace to these o lord and to all who rest in christ grant we beseech thee a place of refreshment light and peace through the same jesus christ our lord not content with studying their books i called upon the oriental patriarchs and bishops in communion with the see of rome who belong to the armenian the chaldean the coptic the marionite and syriac rites they all assured me that the schismatic christians of the east among whom they live have without exception prayers and sacrifices for the dead now i ask when could those eastern sects have commenced to adopt the catholic practice of praying for the dead they could not have received it from us since the ninth century because the greek church separated from us then and has had no communion with us since that time except at intervals up to the twelfth century nor could they have adopted the practice since the fourth or fifth century inasmuch as the arians nestorians and eutychians have had no religious communication with us since that period therefore in common with us they received this doctrine from the apostles if men living in different centuries drink wine having the same flavor and taste and color the inference is that the wine was made from the same species of grape so must we conclude that this refreshing doctrine of intercession for the dead has its root in the apostolic tree of knowledge planted by our saviour fifth i have already spoken of the devotion of the ancient jewish church to the souls of the departed but perhaps you are not aware that the jews retain to this day in their liturgy the pious practice of praying for the dead yet such in reality is the case amid all the wanderings and vicissitudes of life though dismembered and dispersed like sheep without a shepherd over the face of the globe the children of israel have never forgotten or neglected the sacred duty of praying for their deceased brethren unwilling to make this assertion without the strongest evidence i procured from a jewish convert an authorized prayer book of the hebrew church from which i extract the following formula of prayers which are prescribed for funerals Quote, departed brother mayest thou find open the gates of heaven and see the city of peace and the dwellings of safety and meet the ministering angels hastening joyfully toward thee and may the high priest stand to receive thee and go thou to the end rest in peace and rise again into life may the repose established in the celestial abode be the lot dwelling and the resting place of the soul of our deceased brother whom the spirit of the lord may guide into paradise who departed from this world according to the will of god the lord of heaven and earth may the supreme king of kings through his infinite mercy hide him under the shadow of his wing may he raise him at the end of his days and cause him to drink of the stream of his delights Close quote. among the many-sided merits of shakespeare may be mentioned his happy faculty of portraying to life the manners and customs and traditional faith of the times which he describes how deep-rooted in the christian heart in pre-reformation times was the belief in purgatory may be inferred from a passage in hamlet who probably lived in the early part of the eighth century thus speaks to hamlet the spirit of his murdered father i am thy father's spirit doomed for a certain time to walk the night and for the day confined too fast in fires till the foul crimes done in my days of nature are burnt and purged away i am happy to say that the more advanced and enlightened members of the episcopalian church are steadily returning to the faith of their forefathers regarding the prayers for the dead an acquaintance of mine once a distinguished clergyman of the episcopal communion but now a convert 
informed me that hundreds of Protestant clergymen in this country, and particularly in England, have a firm belief in the efficacy of prayers for the dead, but for well-known reasons they are reserved in the expression of their faith. He easily convinced me of the truth of his assertion, particularly as far as the Church of England is concerned, by sending me six different works published in London, all bearing on the subject of purgatory. These books are printed under the auspices of the Protestant Episcopal Church. They all contain prayers for the dead, and prove from Catholic grounds the evidence of a middle state after death and the duty of praying for our deceased brethren. To sum up, we see the practice of praying for the dead enforced in the ancient Hebrew Church and in the Jewish synagogue of today. We see it proclaimed age after age by all the fathers of Christendom. We see it incorporated in every one of the ancient liturgies of the East and of the West. We see it zealously taught by the Russian Church of today, and by that immense family of schismatic Christians scattered over the East. We behold it, in fine, a cherished devotion of three hundred millions of Catholics, as well as a respectable portion of the Episcopal Church. Would it not, my friend, be the height of rashness and presumption in you to prefer your private opinion to this immense weight of learning, sanctity, and authority? Would it not be impiety in you to stand aside with sealed lips while the Christian world is sending up an unceasing de profundis for departed brethren? Would it not be cold and heartless in you not to pray for your deceased friends on account of prejudices which have no grounds in scripture, tradition, or reason itself? If a brother leaves you to cross the broad Atlantic, religion and affection prompt you to pray for him during his absence and if the same brother crosses the narrow sea of death to pass to the shores of eternity, why not pray for him then also? When he crosses the Atlantic, his soul, imprisoned in the flesh, is absent from you. When he passes the sea of death, his soul, released from the flesh, has gone from you. What difference does this make with regard to the duty of your intercession? For what is death? A mere separation of body and soul. The body indeed dies but the soul lives and moves and has its being it continues after death as before to think to remember to love and do not god's dominion and mercy extend over that soul beyond the grave as well as this side of it who shall place the limits to god's empire and say to him thus far thou shalt go and no farther two thousand years after abraham's death our lord said I am the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. If, then, it is profitable for you to pray for your brother in the flesh, why should it be useless for you to pray for him out of the flesh? For while he was living, you prayed not for his body, but for his soul. If this brother of yours dies with some slight stains upon his soul, a sin of impatience, for instance, or an idle word, is he fit to enter heaven with these blemishes upon his soul no the sanctity of god forbids it for nothing defiled shall enter the kingdom of heaven will you consign him for these minor transgressions to eternal torments with adulterers and murderers no the justice and mercy of god forbid it therefore your common sense demands a middle place of expiation for the purgation of the soul before it is worthy of enjoying the companionship of god and his saints god quote, will render to every man according to his works close quote, to the pure and unsullied everlasting bliss to the reprobate eternal damnation to souls stained with minor faults a place of temporary purgation I cannot recall any doctrine of the Christian religion more consoling to the human heart than the article of faith which teaches the efficacy of prayers for the faithful departed. It robs death of its sting. It enriches the chamber of mourning with a rainbow of hope. It assuages the bitterness of our sorrow and reconciles us to our loss. It keeps us in touch with the departed dead as correspondence keeps us in touch with the absent living. It preserves their memory fresh and green in our hearts. It gives us that keen satisfaction which springs from the consciousness that we can aid those loved ones who are gone before us by alleviating their pains, shortening their exile, and hastening their entrance into their true country. 
it familiarizes us with the existence of a life beyond the grave and with the hope of being reunited with those whom we cherished on earth and of dwelling with them in that home where there is no separation or sorrow or death but eternal joy and peace and rest i have seen a devoted daughter minister with tender solicitude at the sick bed of a fond parent many an anxious day and sleepless night did she watch at his bedside she moistened the parched lips and cooled the fevered brow and raised the drooping head on its pillow every change in her patient for better or worse brought a corresponding sunshine or gloom to her heart it was filial love that prompted all this her father died and she followed his remains to the grave though not a catholic standing by the bier she burst those chains which a cruel religious prejudice had wrought around her heart and raising superior to her sect she cried out lord have mercy on his soul it was the voice of nature and of religion oh far from us a religion which would decree an eternal divorce between the living and the dead how consoling is it to the catholic to think that in praying thus for his departed friend his prayers are not in violation of but in accordance with the voice of the church and that as like augustine he watches at the pillow of a dying mother so like augustine he can continue the same office of piety for her soul after she is dead by praying for her how cheering the reflection that the golden link of prayer unites you still to those who fell asleep in the lord that you can still speak to them and pray for them tennyson grasps the catholic feeling when he makes his hero whose course is run thus address his surviving comrade sir bedivere i have lived my life and that which i have done may he within himself make pure but thou if thou shouldst never see my face again pray for my soul more things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of wherefore let thy voice rise like a fountain for me night and day for what are men better than sheep or goats that nourish a blind life within the brain if knowing god they lift not hands of prayer both for themselves and those who call them friend for so the whole round earth is every way bound by gold chains about the feet of god oh it is this thought that robs death of its sting and makes the separation of friends endurable if your departed friend needs not your prayers they are not lost but like the rain absorbed by the sun and descending again in fruitful showers on our fields they will be gathered by the sun of justice and will fall in refreshing showers of grace upon your head cast thy bread upon the running waters for after a long time thou shalt find it again end of chapter sixteen recorded by phil chenevere baton rouge louisiana Chapter 17 of The Faith of Our Fathers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Faith of Our Fathers by James Cardinal Gibbons. Chapter 17 Civil and Religious Liberty. A man enjoys religious liberty when he possesses the free right of worshipping god according to the dictates of a right conscience and of practising a form of religion most in accordance with his duties to god every act infringing on his freedom of conscience is justly styled religious intolerance this religious liberty is the true right of every man because it corresponds with the most certain duty which god has put upon him a man enjoys civil liberty when he is exempt from the arbitrary will of others and when he is governed by equitable laws established for the general welfare of society so long as in common with his fellow citizens he observes the laws of the state any exceptional restraint imposed upon him in the exercise of his rights as a citizen is so far an infringement on his civil liberty i here assert the proposition which i hope to confirm by historical evidence that the catholic church has always been the zealous promoter of religious and civil liberty and that whenever any encroachments on these sacred privileges of man were perpetrated by professing members of the catholic faith these wrongs far from being sanctioned by the church 
were committed in palpable violation of her authority her doctrine is that as man by his own free will fell from grace so of his own free will must he return to grace conversion and coercion are two terms that can never be reconciled it has ever been a cardinal maxim inculcated by sovereign pontiffs and other prelates that no violence or undue influence should be exercised by christian princes or missionaries in their efforts to convert souls to the faith of jesus christ pope gregory i in the latter part of the sixth century compelled the bishop of teresina to restore to the jews the synagogue which he had seized declaring that they should not be coerced into the church but should be treated with meekness and charity the great pontiff issued the same orders to the prelates of sardinia and sicily in behalf of the persecuted jews st augustine and his companions who were sent by pope gregory i to england for the conversion of that nation had the happiness of baptizing in the true faith king ethelbert and many of his subjects that monarch in the fervor of his zeal was most anxious that all his subjects should immediately follow his example but the missionaries admonished him that he should scrupulously abstain from violence in the conversion of his people for the christian religion should be voluntarily embraced pope nicholas i also warned michael king of the bulgarians against employing force or constraint in the conversion of idolaters the fourth council of toledo held in six thirty three a synod of great authority in the church ordained that no one should be compelled against his will to make a profession of the christian faith be it remembered that this council was composed of all the bishops of spain that it was assembled in a country and at a time in which the church held almost unlimited sway and among a people who have been represented as the most fanatical and intolerant of all europe perhaps no man can be considered a fairer representative of the age in which he lived than st bernard the illustrious abbot of clairvaux he was the embodiment of the spirit of the middle ages his life is the key that discloses to us what degree of toleration prevailed in those days having heard that a fanatical preacher was stimulating the people to deeds of violence against the jews as the enemies of christianity st bernard raised his eloquent voice against him and rescued those persecuted people from the danger to which they were exposed pope innocent the third in the thirteenth century promulgated the following decree in behalf of the hebrews let no jew be constrained to receive baptism and he that will not consent to be baptized let him not be molested let no one unjustly seize their property disturb their feasts or lay waste their cemeteries other succeeding pontiffs notably gregory the ninth and innocent the fourth issued similar instructions not to cite too many examples let me quote for you only the beautiful letter addressed by fenelon archbishop of cambray to the son of king james the second of england this letter not only reflects the sentiments of his own heart but formularizes in this particular the decrees of the church of which he was a distinguished ornament above all he writes never force your subjects to change their religion no human power can reach the impenetrable recess of the free will of the heart violence can never persuade men it serves only to make hypocrites grant civil liberty to all not in approving everything as indifferent but in tolerating with patience whatever almighty god tolerates and endeavoring to convert men by mild persuasion it is true indeed that the catholic church spares no pains and stops at no sacrifice in order to induce mankind to embrace her faith otherwise she would be a recreant to her sacred mission but she scorns to exercise any undue influence in her efforts to convert souls the only argument she would use is the argument of reason and persuasion the only tribunal to which she would summon you is the tribunal of conscience the only weapon she would wield is the sword of the spirit which is the word of god it is well known that the superior advantages of our female academies throughout the country 
lead many of our dissenting brethren to send their daughters to these institutions it is also well known that so warm is the affection which these young ladies entertain for their religious leaders so hallowed is the atmosphere they breathe within these seats of learning that they often beg to embrace a religion which fosters so much piety and which produces lilies so fragrant and so pure do the sisters take advantage of this influence in the cause of proselytism by no means so delicate is their regard for the religious conscience of their pupils that they rarely consent to have these young ladies baptized till after being thoroughly instructed in all the doctrines of the church they have obtained the free permission of their parents or guardians the church is indeed intolerant in this sense that she can never confound truth with error nor can she admit that a man is conscientiously free to reject the truth when its claims are convincingly brought home to the mind many protestants seem to be very much disturbed by some such argument as this catholics are very ready now to proclaim freedom of conscience because they are in the minority when they once succeed in getting the upper hand in numbers and power they will destroy this freedom because their faith teaches them to tolerate no doctrine other than the catholic it is then a matter of absolute necessity for us that they should never be allowed to get this advantage now in all this there is a great mistake which comes from not knowing the catholic doctrine in its fullness i shall not lay it down myself lest it seem to have been gotten up for this occasion i shall quote the great theologian Bacanus who taught the doctrine of the schools of catholic theology at the time when the struggle was hottest between catholicity and protestantism he says that religious liberty may be tolerated by a ruler when it would do more harm to the state or to the community to repress it the ruler may even enter into a compact in order to secure to his subjects this freedom in religious matters and when once a compact is made it must be observed absolutely in every point just as every other lawful and honest contract this is the true catholic teaching on this point according to bacanus and all catholic theologians so that if catholics should gain the majority in a community where freedom of conscience is already secured to all by law their very religion obliges them to respect the rights thus acquired by their fellow citizens what danger can there be then for protestants if catholics should be in the majority here their apprehensions are the result of vain fears which no honest mind ought any longer to harbor the church has not only respected the conscience of the people in embracing the religion of their choice but she has also defended their civil rights and liberties against the encroachments of temporal sovereigns one of the popular errors that have taken possession of some minds in our times is that in former days the church was leagued with princes for the oppression of the people this is a base calumny which a slight acquaintance with ecclesiastical history would soon dispel the truth is the most unrelenting enemies of the church have been the princes of this world and so-called christian princes too the conflict between church and state has never died out because the church has felt it to be her duty in every age to raise her voice against the despotic and arbitrary measures of princes many of them chafed under the salutary discipline of the church they wished to be rid of her yoke they desired to be governed by no law except the law of their own licentious passions and boundless ambitions and as a protestant american reviewer well said about forty years ago it was a blessing of providence that there was a spiritual power on earth that could stand like a wall of brass against the tyranny of earthly sovereigns and say to them thus far you shall go and no further and here you shall break your swelling waves of passion a power that could say to them what john said to herod this thing is not lawful for thee a power that pointed the finger of reproof to them even when the sword was pointed to her own neck and that said to them what nathan said to david 
thou art the man she told princes that if the people have their obligations they have their rights too that if the subject must render to caesar the things that are caesar's caesar must render to god the things that are god's yes the church while pursuing her divine mission of leading souls to god has ever been the defender of the people's rights st ambrose archbishop of milan affords us a striking instance of the strenuous efforts made by the catholic church in vindicating the interests of the citizen against the oppression of rulers a portion of the people of thessalonica had committed an outrage against the just authority of the emperor theodosius the offense of those citizens was indeed most reprehensible but the emperor requited the insult offered to him by a shocking and disproportioned act of retribution which has left an indelible stain upon his otherwise excellent character the inhabitants were assembled together for the ostensible purpose of witnessing a chariot race and at a given signal the soldiery fell upon the people and involved men women and children in an indiscriminate massacre to the number of about seven thousand some time after the emperor presented himself at the cathedral of milan but the intrepid prelate told him that his hands were dripping with the blood of his subjects and forbade him entrance to the church till he had made all the reparation in his power to the afflicted people of thessalonica people affect to be shocked at the sentence of excommunication occasionally inflicted by the church on evildoers here is an instance of this penalty who can complain of it as being too severe it was a salutary punishment and the only one that could bring rulers to a sense of duty the greatest bulwark of civil liberty is the famous magna charta it is the foundation not only of british but also of american constitutional freedom among other blessings contained in this instrument it establishes trial by jury and the right of habeas corpus and provides that there be no taxation without representation who were the framers of this memorial charter archbishop langton of canterbury and the catholic barons of england on the plains of runnymede in twelve fifteen they compelled king john to sign that paper which was the death-blow to his arbitrary power and the cornerstone of constitutional government turning to our century it is with no small degree of satisfaction that i point to the state of maryland as the cradle of civil and religious liberty and the land of the sanctuary of the thirteen original american colonies maryland was the only one settled by catholics she was also the only one that raised aloft over her fair lands the banner of liberty of conscience and that invited the oppressed of other colonies to seek asylum beneath its shadow lest i should be suspected of being too partial in my praise of maryland toleration i shall take most of my historical facts from bancroft a new england protestant clergyman note the first edition of bancroft's history was published in eighteen thirty four from that date till nearly half a century afterward upwards of twenty editions were issued all of which retain the passages i have cited on maryland toleration early in the eighties a new edition was given out which omits or abridges some of the passages quoted in this chapter i may add that all of bancroft's eulogies of lord baltimore's benevolent administration are borne out by the original documents and by mcmahon bozeman and mcsherry and other historians of maryland leonard calvert the brother of lord baltimore and the leader of the catholic colony having sailed from england in the ark and the dove reached his destination on the potomac in march sixteen thirty four the catholics took quiet possession of the little place and religious liberty obtained a home its only home in the wide world at the humble village which bore the name of st mary the foundation of the colony of maryland was peacefully and happily laid within six months it had advanced more than virginia had done in as many years but far more memorable was the character of the maryland institutions every other country in the world had persecuting laws 
but through the benign administration of the government of that province no person professing to believe in jesus christ was permitted to be molested on account of religion under the munificence and superintending mildness of lord baltimore a dreary wilderness was soon quickened with the swarming life and activity of prosperous settlements the roman catholics who were oppressed by the laws of england were sure to find a peaceful asylum in the quiet harbors of the chesapeake and there too protestants were sheltered against protestant intolerance such were the beautiful auspices under which maryland started into being its history is the history of benevolence gratitude and toleration maryland was the abode of happiness and liberty conscience was without restraint a mild and liberal proprietary conceded every measure which the welfare of the colony required domestic union a happy consort between all the branches of government an increasing emigration a productive commerce a fertile soil which heaven had richly favored with rivers and deep bays united to perfect the scene of colonial felicity ever intent on advancing the interests of his colony lord baltimore invited the puritans of massachusetts to emigrate to maryland offering them lands and privileges and free liberty of religion but gibbons to whom he had forwarded the commission was so wholly tutored in the new england discipline that he would not advance the wishes of the irish peer and so the invitation was declined on the second of april sixteen forty nine the general assembly of maryland passed the following act which will reflect unfading glory on that state as long as liberty is cherished in the hearts of men whereas the enforcing of conscience in matters of religion hath frequently fallen out to be of dangerous consequence in those commonwealths where it has been practised and for the more quiet and peaceable government of this province and the better to preserve mutual love and unity amongst the inhabitants no person whatsoever within this province professing to believe in jesus christ shall from henceforth be any ways troubled or molested for his or her religion nor in the free exercise thereof nor any way compelled to the belief or exercise of any other religion against his or her consent upon this noble statute bancroft makes the following candid and judicious comment the design of the law of maryland was to protect freedom of conscience and some years after it had been confirmed the apologist of lord baltimore could assert that his government had never given disturbance to any person in maryland for matter of religion that the colonists enjoyed freedom of conscience not less than freedom of person and the state as amply as ever any people in any place of the world the disenfranchised friends of prelacy from massachusetts and the puritans from virginia were welcomed to equal liberty of conscience and political rights in the roman catholic province of maryland five years later when the puritans gained the ascendancy in maryland they were guilty of the infamous ingratitude of disenfranchising the very catholic settlers by whom they had been so hospitably entertained they had neither the gratitude to respect the rights of the government by which they had been received and fostered nor magnanimity to continue the toleration to which alone they were indebted for their residence in the colony an act concerning religion forbade liberty of conscience to be extended to popery prelacy or licentiousness of opinion i shall also quote from maryland the history of a palatinate by william han brown mr brown was a graduate of the university of maryland for several years he was editor of the maryland archives and of the maryland historical society he became afterward professor of english literature in the johns hopkins university he devoted his long life to the colonial history of maryland and is justly recognized as a standard authority on that subject i may add that he cannot be suspected of undue partiality as he was not a member of the catholic church speaking of calvert the proprietary of the maryland colony the author remarks that 
while as yet there was no spot in christendom where religious belief was free and when even the commons of england had openly declared against toleration calvert founded a community wherein no man was to be molested for his faith at a time when absolutism had struck down representative government in england and it was doubtful if a parliament of free men would ever meet again he founded a community in which no laws were to be made without the consent of the freemen the ark and the dove were names of happy omen the one saved from the general wreck the germs of political liberty and the other bore the olive branch of religious peace when the rule of the catholic proprietary was overthrown and the puritans had gained the ascendancy in the province the new commissioners issued writs of election to a general assembly writs of a tenor hitherto unknown in maryland no man of the roman catholic faith could be elected as a burgess or even cast a vote the assembly obtained by this process of selection justified its choice it at once repealed the toleration act of sixteen forty nine and created a new one more to its mind which also bore the title an act concerning religion but it was toleration with a difference it provided that no one who professed the popish religion should be protected in the province but were to be restrained from the exercise thereof for protestants it provided that no one professing faith in christ was to be restrained from the exercise of his religion provided that this liberty be not extended to popery or prelacy nor to such as under the profession of christ hold forth and practice licentiousness that is with the exception of the roman catholics and churchmen together with the brownists quakers anabaptists and other miscellaneous protestant sects all others might profess their faith without molestation after the overthrow of the puritan authority and the advent to power of the members of the church of england the second act of the assembly was to make the protestant episcopal church the established church of the province the act imposed an annual tax of forty pounds of tobacco per poll on all taxables for the purpose of building churches and maintaining the clergy in seventeen o two it was reenacted with a toleration clause protestant dissenters and quakers were exempted from the penalties and disabilities and might have separate meeting-houses provided that they paid their forty pounds per poll to support the established church as for the papists it is needless to say that there was no exemption nor license for them the author then sets before us the three kinds of toleration like three portraits so that their distinctive features appear in bold relief we may now he says place side by side the three tolerations of maryland the toleration of the catholic proprietaries lasted fifty years and under it all believers in christ were equal before the law and all support to churches or ministers was voluntary the puritan toleration lasted six years and included all but papists prelatists and those who held objectionable doctrines the anglican toleration lasted eighty years and had glebes and churches for the establishment connivance for dissenters the penal laws for catholics and for all the forty per poll in fact an additional turn was given to the screw in this year the oath of abhorrency a more offensive form of the oath of supremacy being required beside the oath of allegiance and for one thing no catholic attorney was allowed to practice in the province when the members of the constitutional convention declared in seventeen eighty seven that congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof it is worthy of note that they were echoing the sentiments and even repeating the language of the maryland assembly of sixteen forty nine which declared that no person whatsoever within this province professing to believe in jesus christ shall from henceforth be any ways molested for his or her religion nor in the free exercise thereof we may therefore affirm that lord baltimore's toleration act of sixteen forty nine 
was the bright dawn that ushered in the noonday sun of freedom in 1787. And we have every reason to believe that the proprietary's character of liberty, with its attendant blessings, served as an example, an incentive, and an inspiration to some at least of the framers of the Constitution to extend over the new republic the precious boon of civil and religious liberty. It is proper to also observe that the Act of 1649 was not a new declaration of religious freedom on the part of Lord Baltimore's administration, but was a solemn affirmation of the toleration granted by the Catholic proprietary from the beginning of the settlement in 1634. I will close this subject in the words of a distinguished member of the Maryland Historical Society. Higher than all titles and badges of honor, and more exalted than royal nobility, is the imperishable distinction which the passage of this broad and liberal act won for Maryland, and for the members of that never-to-be-forgotten session, and sacred forever be the hallowed spot which gave it birth. What shall I say of the prominent part that was taken by distinguished representatives of the Catholic Church in the cause of our American independence? What shall I say of Charles Carroll of Carrollton, who, at the risk of sacrificing his rich estate, signed the Declaration of Independence? Of Reverend John Carroll, afterward the first Archbishop of Baltimore, who, with his cousin Charles Carroll and Benjamin Franklin, was sent by Congress to Canada to secure the cooperation of the people of that province in the struggle for liberty of Kosciusko, Lafayette, Pulaski, Barry, and the host of other Catholic heroes who labored so effectually in the same glorious cause. American patriots without number the Church has nursed in her bosom, a traitor, never. The father of his country was not unmindful of these services. Shortly after his election to the presidency, replying to an address of his Catholic fellow citizens, he uses the following language. I presume that your fellow citizens will not forget the patriotic part which you took in the accomplishment of their revolution and the establishment of their government, or the important assistance they received from a nation in which the Roman Catholic faith is professed. And the Catholics of our generation have nobly emulated the patriotism and the spirit of toleration exhibited by their ancestors they can neither be accused of disloyalty nor of intolerance to their dissenting brethren in more than one instance of our nation's history our churches have been desecrated and burned to the ground our convents have been invaded and destroyed our clergy have been exposed to insult and violence these injuries have been inflicted on us by incendiary mobs animated by hatred of catholicism yet in spite of these provocations our catholic citizens though wielding an immense numerical influence in the localities where they suffered have never retaliated it is in a spirit of just pride that we can affirm that hitherto in the united states no protestant house of worship or educational institution has been destroyed nor violence offered to a protestant minister by those who profess the catholic faith god grant that such may always be our record it is just because the church has ever resisted the tyranny of kings in their encroachments on the sacred rights of conscience that she has always been the victim of royal persecution in every age in the language of the psalmist the kings of the earth rose up and the princes assembled together against the lord and against his christ the brightest and most thrilling pages of ecclesiastical history are those which record the sufferings of popes and prelates at the hands of temporal sovereigns for conscience and for justice sake take for instance st john chrysostom the great archbishop of constantinople in the fifth century and the idol of the people he had the courage like john the baptist to raise his eloquent voice against the lasciviousness of the court and particularly against the empress eudoxia who ruled like another jezebel he was banished from his see treated with the utmost indignity by the soldiers and died in exile from sheer exhaustion and ill-treatment witness pope gregory the seventh the fearless hildebrand 
in his lifelong struggle with the German Emperor Henry IV. Gregory directed all the energies of his great mind toward reforming the abuses which had crept into the Church of France and Germany in the 11th century. In those days the Emperor of Germany assumed the right of naming or appointing bishops throughout his empire. This sacred office was commonly bestowed on very unworthy candidates and very often put up at auction to be sold to the highest bidder, as is now the case with the schismatic Greek church in Turkey. These bishops, too, often repaid their imperial benefactor by pandering to his passions and by the most servile flattery. The intrepid pope partially succeeded in uprooting the evil, though the effort cost him his life. The emperor invaded Rome and drove Gregory from his see, who died uttering these words with his last breath, I have loved justice and hated iniquity, and therefore I die in exile. For the same cause, Thomas a Becket, Archbishop of Canterbury, was slain at the altar by the hired assassins of Henry the Second of England. Observe how Pius the Seventh was treated by the first Napoleon in the beginning of the present century. The daydream of Napoleon was to be master of Europe and to place his brothers and friends on the thrones of the continent that they might revolve like so many satellites around his throne in france napoleon made two demands on the venerable pontiff first that he dissolve the marriage which had been contracted between the emperor's brother jerome and miss patterson of baltimore his ostensible reason for having the marriage dissolved was because miss patterson was a protestant but his real motive was to secure a royal bride for his brother instead of an American lady. Second, that he close his ports against the commerce of England, with which the nation Napoleon was then at war, and make common cause with the emperor against his enemies. The Pope rejected both demands. He told the emperor that the church held all marriages performed by her as indissoluble, even when one of the parties was not a Catholic and that, as the common father of Christendom, he could close his port against no Christian power. For refusing to comply with this second demand, the Pope was arrested and sent into exile, where he lingered for years. At this very moment, the old conflict between the Church and despotic governments is raging fiercely throughout Europe. The scene enacted by John and Herod is today reproduced in almost every kingdom of the old world. It is the old fight between brute force and the God-given rights of conscience. In Russia, we see the Bishop of Plock exiled for life from his see to Siberia. His only offense is his refusal to acknowledge that the Emperor Alexander is the head of the Christian Church. If we pass over into Italy, we see religious men and women driven from their homes, their houses and libraries confiscated, libraries which pious and learned men had been collecting and consulting for ages the only crime of those religious is that they have not the power to resist brute force cross the alps into france and there you will see that many-headed monster the commune assisting the archbishop of paris and his clergy solely because he and they were the representatives of law and order in the republic of switzerland Bishop Mermelod is expelled from Geneva without the slightest charge adduced against his character as a citizen and a Christian prelate. Faithful clergymen are deprived by the government of their parochial rights, and renegade priests are intruded in their place. The shepherd is driven away, and wolves lay waste the fold. Go to Prussia. What do you behold there? A prime minister, flushed with his recent victories over France, he is not content with seeing his master wear the imperial crown of germany he wants him to wear also the tiara of the pope bismarck like Amon, the minister of king assuarius is not satisfied with being second in the kingdom so long as mardecai that is the church refuses to bow down and worship him he finds the venerable archbishop of nessen posen and other prussian prelates again and again sells their furniture and finally sends them to prison for a protracted period st john chrysostom beautifully remarks that st paul elevated to the third heaven was glorious to contemplate 
but that far more glorious is Paul buried in the dungeons of Rome. I can say in like manner of Archbishop Letikowski of Posen that he was conspicuous in the Vatican Council among his peers, but he was still more conspicuous sitting solitary in his Prussian prison. The loyalty of the Prussian clergy is above reproach. The bishops are imprisoned because they insist on the right of educating students for the ministry, ordaining and appointing clergy without consulting the government. They are denied a right which in this country is possessed by Freemasons and every other human organization in the land. Perhaps a simple illustration will present to you in a clear light the odious character of the penal laws to which I have alluded. Suppose the government of the United States were to issue a general order requiring the clergy of the various Christian denominations to be educated in government establishments, forcing them to take an oath before entering on the duties of the ministry, and forbidding the ecclesiastical authorities to appoint or remove any clergymen without permission of the civil power at Washington. Would not the American people rise up in their might before they would submit to have fetters so galling forged on their conscience? And yet, this is precisely the odious legislation which the Prussian government is enacting against the Church. And the Catholic Church, in resisting these laws, is not only fighting her own battles, but she is contending for the principle of freedom of conscience everywhere. But thank God we live in a country where liberty of conscience is respected and where the civil constitution holds over us the aegis of her protection without intermeddling with ecclesiastical affairs. From my heart I say, America, with all thy faults, I love thee still. Perhaps at this moment there is no nation on the face of the earth where the church is less trammeled and where she has more liberty to carry out her sublime destiny than in these united states for my part i much prefer the system which prevails in this country where the temporal needs of the church are supplied by voluntary contributions of the faithful to the system which obtains in some catholic countries of europe where the church is supported by the government thereby making feeble reparation for the gross injustice it has done to the church by its former wholesale confiscation of ecclesiastical property and the church pays dearly for this indemnity for she has to bear the perpetual attempts at interference and the vexatious enactments of the civil power which aims at making her wholly dependent upon itself some years ago on my return from rome in company with the late archbishop spaulding i paid a visit to the bishop of annecy in savoy i was struck by the splendor of his palace and saw a sentinel at the door placed there by the french government as a guard of honor but the venerable bishop soon disabused me of my favorable impressions he told me that he was in a state of gilded slavery i cannot he said build as much as a sacristy without obtaining permission of the government i do not wish to see the day when the church will invoke or receive any government aid to build our churches or to pay the salary of our clergy for the government may then begin to dictate to us what doctrines we ought to preach if it is a great wrong to muzzle the press it is a greater wrong to muzzle the pulpit no amount of state subsidy would compensate for the evils resulting from the government censorship of the gospel and the suppression of apostolic freedom in proclaiming it st paul exalts in the declaration that though he is personally in chains the word of god is not enchained and moreover in proportion as state patronage would increase the sympathy and aid of the faithful would diminish May the happy condition of things now existing among us always continue, in which the relations between the clergy and the people will be direct and immediate, in which bishops and priests will bestow upon their spiritual children their voluntary labors, their tender solicitude, their paternal affection, and pour out like water their heart's blood, if necessary, and in which they will receive in return the free will offerings, the devotions and gratitude of a filial people. End of chapter 17
Chapter 18 of The Faith of Our Fathers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Faith of Our Fathers by James Cardinal Gibbons. Chapter 18 Charges of Religious Persecution. Section 1 The Spanish Inquisition but did not the spanish inquisition exercise enormous cruelties against heretics and jews i am not the apologist of the spanish inquisition and i have no desire to palliate or excuse the excesses into which that tribunal may at times have fallen from my heart i abhor and denounce every species of violence and injustice and persecution of which the spanish inquisition may have been guilty and in raising my voice against coercion for conscience sake i am expressing not only my own sentiments but those of every catholic priest and layman in the land our catholic ancestors for the last three hundred years have suffered so much for freedom of conscience that they would rise up in judgment against us were we to become the advocates and defenders of religious persecution we would be a disgrace to our sires were we to trample on the principle of liberty which they held dearer than life when i denounce the cruelties of the inquisition i am not standing aloof from the church but i am treading in her footprints bloodshed and persecution form no part of the creed of the catholic church so much does she abhor the shedding of blood that a man becomes disqualified to serve as a minister at her altars who by act or counsel voluntarily sheds the blood of another before you can convict the church of intolerance you must first bring forward some authentic act of her popes or councils sanctioning the policy of vengeance in all my readings i have yet to find one decree of hers advocating torture or death for conscience sake she is indeed intolerant of error but her only weapons against error are those pointed out by st paul to timothy preach the word be instant in season out of season reprove entreat rebuke with all patience and doctrine but you will tell me were not the authors of the inquisition children of the church and did they not exercise their enormities in her name granted but i ask you is it just or fair to hold the church responsible for those acts of her children which she disowns you do not denounce liberty as mockery because many crimes are committed in her name neither do you hold the father accountable for the sins of his disobedient children we should also bear in mind that the spaniards were not the only people who have prescribed men for the exercise of their religious belief if we calmly study the history of other nations our enmity towards spain will considerably relax and we shall have to reserve for her neighbors a portion of our indignation no impartial student of history will deny that the leaders of the reformed religions whenever they gained the ascendancy exercised violence toward those who differed from them in faith i mention this not by way of recrimination nor in palliation of the proscriptions of the spanish government for one offence is not justified by another my object is merely to show that they who live in glass houses should not throw stones and that it is not honest to make spain the scapegoat bearing alone on her shoulders the odium of religious intolerance it should not be forgotten that john calvin burned michael servetus at the stake for heresy that the arch reformer not only avowed but also justified the deed in his writings and that he established in geneva an inquisition for the punishment of refractory christians it should also be remembered that luther advocated the most merciless doctrine toward the jews According to his apologist, Seckendorf, the German reformer said that their synagogues ought to be destroyed, their houses pulled down, their prayer books, and even the books of the Old Testament to be taken from them. Their rabbis ought to be forbidden to teach and be compelled to gain their livelihood by hard labor. It should also be borne in mind that Henry the Eighth and his successors for many generations inflicted fines imprisonment and death on thousands of their subjects for denying the spiritual supremacy of the temporal sovereign 
This galling inquisition lasted for nearly three hundred years, and the severity of its decree scarcely finds a parallel in the Spanish Inquisition. Prescott avows that the administration of Elizabeth was not a whit less despotic and scarcely less sanguinary than that of Isabella. The clergy of Ireland under Cromwell were ordered, under pain of death, to quit their country, and theological students were obliged to pursue their studies in foreign seminaries. Any priest who dared to return to his native country forfeited his life. Whoever harbored a priest suffered death, and they who knew his hiding place and did not reveal it to the inquisitors had both their ears cut off. At this very moment, not only in England, but in Ireland, Scotland, and Holland, Protestants are worshipping in some of the churches erected by the piety of our Catholic forefathers and wrested from them by violence. Observe also that in all these instances the persecutions were inflicted by the express authority of the founders and heads of Protestant churches. The Puritans of New England inflicted summary vengeance on those who were rash enough to differ from them in religion. In Massachusetts, the Quakers were whipped, branded, and their ears cut off, their tongues bored with hot irons, and were banished upon pain of death in case of their return, and actually executed upon the gallows. Who is ignorant of the number of innocent creatures that suffered death in the same state on the ridiculous charge of witchcraft toward the end of the seventeenth century? Well does it become their descendants to taunt Catholics with the horrors of the Spanish Inquisition. In the religious riots of Philadelphia in 1844, Catholic churches were burned down in the name of Protestantism, and private homes were sacked. I was informed by an eyewitness that owners of houses were obliged to mark on their doors these words, This house belongs to Protestants in order to save their property from the infuriated incendiaries. For these acts, I never heard of any retaliation on the part of Catholics, and I hope I never shall, no matter how formidable may be their numbers and tempting the provocation. In spite of the boasted toleration of our times, it cannot be denied that there still lurks a spirit of inquisition, which does not indeed vent itself in physical violence, but is, nevertheless, most galling to its victims. How many persons have I met in the course of my ministry who were ostracized by their kindred and friends, driven from home, nay, disinherited by their parents, for the sole crime of carrying out the very shibboleth of Protestantism, the exercise of private judgment, and of obeying the dictates of their conscience by embracing the Catholic faith? Is not this the most exquisite torture that can be inflicted on refined natures? Ah, there is an imprisonment more lonely than the dungeon. It is the imprisonment of our most cherished thoughts in our own hearts, without a member of the family with whom to communicate. There is a sword more keen than the executioner's knife. It is the envenomed tongue of obloquy and abuse. There is a banishment less tolerable than exile from one's country. It is the excommunication from the parental roof and from the affections of those we love. Have I a right to hold the members of the Episcopal, Lutheran, Presbyterian, and Congregationalist churches responsible for these prescriptive measures to which I have referred, most of which have been authorized by their respective founders and leaders? God forbid! I know full well that these acts of cruelty form no part of the creed of the Protestant churches. I have been acquainted with Protestants from my youth. They have been among my most intimate and cherished friends, and from my knowledge of them, I am convinced that they would discountenance any physical violence which would be inflicted on their fellow citizens on account of their religious convictions they would justly tell me that the persecutions of former years of which i have spoken should be ascribed to the peculiar and unhappy state of society in which their ancestors lived rather than to the inherent principles of their religion for precisely the same reasons and for reasons still more forcible protestants should not reproach the catholic church for the atrocities of the spanish inquisition the persecutions to which I have alluded were, for the most part, 
perpetrated by the founders and heads of the protestant churches while the rigors of the spanish tribunal were inflicted by laymen and subordinate ecclesiastics either without the knowledge or in spite of the protests of the bishops of rome let us now present the inquisition in its true light in the first place the number of its victims has been wildly exaggerated as even prescott is forced to admit the popular historian of the inquisition is laurent from whom our american authors generally derive their information on this subject now who was laurent he was a degraded priest who was dismissed from the board of inquisitors of which he had been secretary actuated by interest and revenge he wrote his history at the instance of joseph bonaparte the new king of spain and to please his royal master he did all he could to blacken the character of that institution his testimony therefore should be received with great reserve to give you one instance of his unreliability he quotes the historian mariana as his authority for saying that two thousand persons were put to death in one year in the dioceses of seville and cadiz alone by referring to the pages of mariana we find that author saying that two thousand were put to death in all spain during the entire administration of torquemada which embraced a period of fifteen years before beginning to examine the character of this tribunal it must be clearly understood that the spanish inquisition was not a purely ecclesiastical institution but a mixed tribunal it was conceived systematized regulated in all its procedures and judgments equipped with officers and powers and its executions fines and confiscations were carried out by the royal authority alone and not by the church to understand the true character of the spanish inquisition and the motives which prompted king ferdinand in establishing that tribunal we must take a glance at the internal condition of spain at the close of the fifteenth century after a struggle of eight centuries the spanish nation succeeded in overthrowing the moors and in planting the national flag over the entire country at last the cross conquered the crescent and christianity triumphed over mahometanism the empire was consolidated under the joint reign of ferdinand and isabella but there still remained elements of discord in the nation the population was composed of three conflicting races the spaniards moors and jews perhaps the difficulties which beset our own government in its efforts to harmonize the white the indian and the colored population will give us some idea of the formidable obstacles with which the spanish court had to contend in its efforts to cement into one compact nation a conquering and a conquered people of different race and religion the jews and the moors were disaffected toward the spanish government not only on political but also on religious grounds they were suspected and not unjustly of desiring to transfer their allegiance from the king of spain to the king of barbary or to the grand turk the spanish inquisition was accordingly erected by king ferdinand less from motives of religious zeal than from those of human policy it was established not so much with the view of preserving the catholic faith as of perpetrating the integrity of his kingdom the moors and jews were looked upon not only as enemies of the altar but chiefly as enemies of the throne catholics were upheld not for their faith alone but because they united faith to loyalty the baptized moors and israelites were oppressed for their heresy because their heresy was allied to sedition it must be remembered that in those days heresy especially if outspoken was regarded not only as an offence against religion but also as a crime against the state and was punished accordingly this condition of things was not confined to catholic spain but prevailed across the sea in protestant england we find henry the eighth and his successors pursuing the same policy in great britain toward their catholic subjects and punishing catholicism as a crime against the state just as islamism and judaism were proscribed in spain it was therefore rather a royal and political 
than an ecclesiastical institution the king nominated the inquisitors who were equally composed of lay and clerical officials he dismissed them at will from the king and not from the pope they derived their jurisdiction and into the king's coffers and not into the pope's went all the emoluments accruing from fines and confiscations in a word the authority of the inquisition began and ended with the crown in confirmation of these assertions i shall quote from rank a german protestant historian who cannot be suspected of partiality to the catholic church in the first place says this author the inquisitors were royal officers the kings had the right of appointing and dismissing them the courts of the inquisition were subject like other magistracies to royal visitors do you know said the king to jimenez that if this tribunal possesses jurisdiction it is from the king it derives it in the second place all the profit of the confiscations by this court accrued to the king these were carried out in a very unsparing manner though the fueros privileges of aragon forbade the king to confiscate the property of his convicted subjects he deemed himself exalted above the law in matters pertaining to this court the proceeds of these confiscations formed a sort of regular income for the royal exchequer it was even believed and asserted from the beginning that the kings had been moved to establish and countenance this tribunal more by their hankering after the wealth it confiscated than by motives of piety in the third place it was the inquisition and the inquisition alone that completely shut out all extraneous interference with the state the sovereign had now at his disposal a tribunal from which no grandee no archbishop could withdraw himself as charles knew no other means of bringing certain punishment on the bishops who had taken part in the insurrection of the communidates or communes who were struggling for their rights and liberties he chose to have them judged by the inquisition it was in spirit and tendency a political institution the pope had an interest in thwarting it and he did so but the king had an interest in constantly upholding it that the inquisition acted independently of the holy see and that even the catholic hierarchy fell under the ban of this royal tribunal is also apparent from the following fact after the convening of the council of trent bartholomew carranza archbishop of toledo was arrested by the inquisition on a charge of heresy and his release from prison could not be obtained either by the interposition of pius the fourth or by the remonstrance of the council it is true that sixtus the fourth yielding to the importunities of queen isabella consented to its establishment being advised that it was necessary for the preservation of order in the kingdom but in fourteen eighty one the year following its introduction when the jews complained to him of its severity the same pontiff issued a bull against the inquisitors as prescott informs us in which he rebuked their intemperate zeal and even threatened them with deprivation he wrote to ferdinand and isabella that mercy toward the guilty was more pleasing to god than the severity which they were using when the pope could not eradicate the evil he encouraged the sufferers to flee to rome where they found asylum and where he took the fugitives under his protection in two years he received four hundred and fifty refugees from spain did the pontiff send them back or did he inflict vengeance on them at home far from it they were restored to all the rights of citizens how can we imagine that the pope would encourage in spain the legalized murder of men whom he protected from violence in his own city where he might have crushed them with impunity i can find no authenticated instance of any pope putting to death in his own dominions a single individual for his religious belief moreover sometimes the pope when he could not reach the victims censured and excommunicated the inquisitor and protected the children of those whose property was confiscated to the crown after a struggle he succeeded in preventing the spanish government from establishing its inquisition in naples or milan which then belonged to spain so great was his abhorrence of its cruelties to sum up 
i have endeavored to show that the church disavows all responsibility for the excesses of the spanish inquisition because oppression forms no part of her creed that these atrocities have been grossly exaggerated that the inquisition was a political tribunal that catholic prelates were amenable to its sentence as well as moors and jews and that the popes denounced and labored hard to abolish its sanguinary features and yet rome has to bear all the odium of the inquisition i heartily pray that religious intolerance may never take root in our favored land may the only king to force our conscience be the king of kings may the only prison erected among us for the sin of unbelief or misbelief be the prison of a troubled conscience and may our only motive for embracing truth be not the fear of man but the love of truth and of god section two what about the massacre of st bartholomew i have no words strong enough to express my detestation of that inhuman slaughter it is true that the number of its victims has been grossly exaggerated by partisan writers but that is no extenuation of the crime itself i most emphatically assert that the church had no act or part in this atrocious butchery except to deplore the event and weep over its unhappy victims here are the facts briefly presented first in the reign of charles the ninth of france the huguenots were a formidable power and a seditious element in that country they were under the leadership of admiral coligny who was plotting the overthrow of the ruling monarch the french king instigated by his mother catherine de medicis and fearing the influence of coligny whom he regarded as an aspirant to the throne compassed his assassination as well as that of his followers in paris august twenty fourth fifteen seventy two this deed of violence was followed by an indiscriminate massacre in the french capital and other cities of france by an incendiary populace who are easily aroused but not easily appeased second religion had nothing to do with the massacre coligny and his fellow huguenots were slain not on account of their creed but exclusively on account of their alleged treasonable designs if they had nothing but their protestant faith to render them odious to king charles they would never have been molested for neither did charles nor his mother ever manifest any special zeal for the catholic church nor any special aversion to protestantism unless when it threatened the throne third immediately after the massacre charles dispatched an envoy extraordinary to each of the courts of europe conveying the startling intelligence that the king and royal family had narrowly escaped from a horrible conspiracy and that its authors had been detected and summarily punished the envoys in their narration carefully suppressed any allusion to the indiscriminate massacre which had taken place but announced the event in the following words on that memorable night by the destruction of a few seditious men the king had been delivered from immediate danger of death and the realm from the perpetual terror of civil war pope gregory the thirteenth to whom also an envoy was sent acting on this garbled information ordered a te deum to be sung and a commemorative medal to be struck in thanksgiving to god not for the massacre of which he was utterly ignorant but for the preservation of the french king from an untimely and violent death and of the french nation from the horrors of a civil war sismondi a protestant historian tells us that the pope's nuncio in paris was purposely kept in ignorance of the designs of charles and rank in his history of the civil wars informs us that charles and his mother suddenly left paris in order to avoid an interview with the pope's legate who arrived soon after the massacre their guilty conscience fearing no doubt a rebuke from the messenger of the vicar of christ from whom the real facts were not long concealed fourth it is scarcely necessary to vindicate the innocence of the bishops and clergy of france in this transaction as no author how hostile soever to the church has ever to my knowledge accused them of any complicity in the heinous massacre on the contrary they used their best efforts to arrest the progress of the assailants to prevent further bloodshed and to protect the lives of the fugitives 
more than three hundred calvinists were sheltered from the assassins by taking refuge in the house of the archbishop of lyon the bishops of Lisieux, bordeaux toulouse and of other cities offered similar protection to those who sought safety in their homes thus we see that the church slept in tranquil ignorance of the stormy scene until she was aroused to a knowledge of the tempest by the sudden uproar it created like her divine spouse on the troubled waters she presents herself only to say to them peace be still section three mary queen of england i am asked must you not admit that mary queen of england persecuted the protestants of the british realm i ask this question in reply how is it that catholics are persistently reproached for the persecutions under mary's reign while scarcely a voice is raised in condemnation of the legalized fines confiscations and deaths inflicted on the catholics of great britain and ireland for three hundred years from the establishment of the church of england in fifteen thirty four to the time of the catholic emancipation elizabeth's hands were steeped in the blood of catholics puritans and anabaptists why are these cruelties suppressed or glossed over while those of mary form the burden of every nursery tale is it because persecution becomes justice when catholics happen to be the victims or is it because they are expected from long usage to be insensible to torture if we weigh in the scales of impartial justice the reigns of both sisters we shall be compelled to bring a far more severe verdict against elizabeth first mary reigned only five years and four months elizabeth's reign lasted forty-four years and four months the younger sister therefore swayed the sceptre of authority nearly nine times longer than the elder and the number of catholics who suffered for their faith during the long administration of elizabeth may be safely said to exceed in the same proportion the victims of mary's reign hallam asserts that the rack seldom stood idle in the tower for all the latter part of elizabeth's reign and its very first month was stained by an intolerant statute second the most unpardonable act of mary's life in the judgment of her critics was the execution of lady jane grey but lady jane was guilty of high treason having usurped the throne of england which she occupied for nine days elizabeth put to death her cousin mary queen of scots after a long imprisonment on the unsustained charge of aspiring to the english throne third mary's zeal was exercised in behalf of the religion of her forefathers and of the faith established in england for nearly a thousand years elizabeth's zeal was employed in extending the new creed introduced by her father in a moment of passion and modified by herself surely the coercive enforcement of a new creed is more odious than the rigorous maintenance of the time-honored faith of a nation mary therefore insisted on perpetuating the established order of things elizabeth on subverting it fourth the elder sister was propagating what she believed to be the unchangeable and infallible doctrines of jesus christ the younger sister was propagating her own and her father's novel and more or less uncertain opinions fifth while mary had no private or personal motives in oppressing protestants elizabeth's hostility to the catholic church was intensified if not instigated by her hatred of the pope who had declared her illegitimate her legitimacy before the world depended upon the success of the new religion which had legalized her father's divorce from catherine sixth hence as macaulay says mary was sincere in her religion elizabeth was not having no scruple about conforming to the romish church when conformity was necessary to her own safety retaining to the last moment of her life a fondness for much of the doctrine and much of the ceremonial of that church she had subjected that church to a persecution even more odious than the persecution with which her sister had harassed the protestants mary did nothing for her religion which she was not prepared to suffer for it she had held it firmly under persecution she fully believed it to be essential to salvation elizabeth in opinion was little more than half a protestant she had professed when it suited her to be wholly a catholic what can be said in defense of a ruler who is at once indifferent and intolerant an intelligent gentleman in north carolina once said to me tauntingly what do you think of bloody mary 
did you ever hear i replied of her sister's cruelties to catholics he answered that he never read of that mild woman persecuting for conscience sake i was amazed at his words until he acknowledged that his historical library was comprised in one work daubigny's history of the reformation that voracious author has prudently suppressed or delicately touched elizabeth's peccadilloes as not coming within the scope of his plan how many are found like our north carolina gentlemen who are familiar from their childhood with the name of smithfield but who never once heard of tyburn End of chapter 18chapter 19 of the faith of our fathers this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by beth thomas the faith of our fathers by james cardinal gibbons chapter 19 grace the sacraments original sin baptism its necessity its effects manner of baptizing the grace of god is that supernatural assistance which he imparts to us through the merits of jesus christ for our salvation it is called supernatural because no one by his own natural ability can acquire it without divine grace we can neither conceive nor accomplish anything for the sanctification of our souls not that we are sufficient says the apostle to think anything of ourselves as of ourselves but our sufficiency is from god for it is god who worketh in you both to will and to accomplish anything conducive to your salvation without me says our lord you can do nothing but in order that divine grace may effectually aid us we must cooperate with it or at least we must not resist it the grace of god is obtained chiefly by prayer and the sacraments a sacrament is a visible sign instituted by christ by which grace is conveyed to our souls three things are necessary to constitute a sacrament that is a visible sign invisible grace and the institution by our lord jesus christ thus in the sacrament of baptism there is the outward sign which consists in the pouring of water and in the formula of words which are then pronounced the interior grace or sanctification which is imparted to the soul be baptized and you shall receive the gift of the holy ghost and the ordinance of jesus christ who said teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy ghost our saviour instituted seven sacraments namely baptism confirmation eucharist penance extreme unction orders and matrimony which i shall explain separately according to the teachings of holy writ man was created in a state of innocence and holiness and after having spent on this earth his allotted terms of years he was destined without tasting death to be translated to the perpetual society of god in heaven but in consequence of his disobedience he fell from his higher state of righteousness his soul was defiled by sin he became subject to death and to various ills of the body and soul and forfeited his heavenly inheritance adam's transgression was not confined to himself but was transmitted with its long train of dire consequences to all his posterity it is called original sin because it is derived from our original progenitor wherefore says st paul as by one man sin entered into this world and by sin death and so death passed unto all men in whom all have sinned and elsewhere he tells us that we were by nature children of wrath who says job can make him clean that is conceived of unclean seed or as the septuagint version expresses it there is no one free from stain not even though his life be of one day as an infant one day old cannot commit an actual sin the stain must come from the original offence of adam behold says david i was conceived in iniquities and in sins did my mother conceive me the scripture also tells us that jeremiah and john the baptist were sanctified before their birth or purified from sin and of course at that period of their existence they were incapable of actual sin they were cleansed therefore from the original taint these passages clearly show that we have all inherited the transgression of our first parents and that we are born enemies of god and it is equally plain that these texts apply to every member of the human family to the infant of a day old as well as to the adult indeed even without the light of holy scripture we have only to look into ourselves to be convinced that our nature has undergone a rude shock how else can we account for the miseries and infirmities of our bodies the blindness of our understanding the perversity of our will inclined always to evil rather than to good the violence of our passions which are constantly waging war in our hearts how well does the catholic doctrine explain this abnormal state hence pascal truly says that man is a greater mystery to himself without original sin than is the mystery itself 
the church however declares that the blessed virgin mary was exempted from the stain of original sin by the merits of our saviour jesus christ and that consequently she was never for an instant subject to the dominion of satan this is what is meant by the doctrine of the immaculate conception but god in passing sentence of condemnation on adam consoled him by the promise of a redeemer to come i will put enmity said the lord between thee and the woman and thy seed and her seed she shall crush thy head jesus the seed of mary is the chosen one who was destined to crush the head of the infernal serpent and when the fulness of time was come god sent his son made of a woman that he might redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons jesus christ our redeemer came to wash away the defilement from our souls and to restore us to that divine friendship which we had lost by the sin of adam he is the second adam who came to repair the iniquity of the first it was our saviour's privilege to prescribe the conditions on which our reconciliation with god was to be effected now he tells us in his gospel that baptism is the essential means established for washing away the stain of original sin and the door by which we find admittance into his church which may be called the second eden we must all submit to a new birth or regeneration before we can enter the kingdom of heaven water is the appropriate instrument of this new birth as it indicates the interior cleansing of the soul and the holy ghost the giver of spiritual life is its author the church teaches that baptism is necessary for all for infants as well as adults and her doctrine rests on the following grounds our lord says to nicodemus amen amen i say to thee unless a man be born again of water and the holy ghost he cannot enter into the kingdom of god these words embrace the whole human family without regard to age or sex as is evident from the original greek text for dis which is rendered man in our english translation means any one mankind in its broadest acceptation the acts of the apostles and the epistles of st paul although containing only a fragmentary account of the ministry of the apostles plainly insinuate that the apostles baptized children as well as grown persons we are told for instance that lydia was baptized and her household by st paul and that the jailer was baptized and all his family the same apostle baptized also the household of stephanus although it is not expressly stated that there were children among these baptized families the presumption is strongly in favor of the supposition that there were but if any doubt exists regarding the apostolic practice of baptizing infants it is easily removed by referring to the writings of the primitive fathers of the church who as they were the immediate successors of the apostles ought to be the best interpreters of their doctrines and practice st irenaeus a disciple of polycarp who was a disciple of st john the evangelist says christ came to save all through himself all i say who are born anew or baptized through him infants and little ones boys and youths and aged persons origen who lived a few years later writes the church received the tradition from the apostles to give baptism even to infants the early church of africa bears triumphant testimony in vindication of infant baptism st cyprian and sixty-six suffragan prelates held a council in the metropolitan city of carthage in the year two fifty three while the council is in session a prelate named fidus writes to the fathers asking them whether infants ought to be baptized before the eighth day succeeding their birth or on the eighth day in accordance with the practice of circumcision the bishops unanimously subscribed to the following reply as to what regards the baptism of infants we all judged that the mercy and grace of god should be denied to no human being from the moment of his birth if even to the greatest delinquents the remission of sins is granted how much less should the infant be repelled who being recently born according to adam has contracted in his first birth the contagion of the ancient death the african council asserts here two prominent facts the universal contagion of the human race through adam's fall and the universal necessity of baptism without distinction of age upon this decision i will make two observations first fidus did not inquire about the necessity of infant baptism which he already admitted but about the propriety of conferring it on the eighth day in imitation of the jewish law of circumcision second the bishops assembled in that council were as numerous as the whole episcopate of the united states which contains about five thousand priests and upwards of six million catholics we may therefore reasonably conclude that the judgment of the african council represented the faith of several thousand priests and several millions of catholics st augustine commenting on this decision justly observes that st cyprian and his colleagues made no new decree but maintained most firmly the faith of the church and this is the unanimous sentiment of tradition from the days of the apostles to our own times is it not ludicrous as well as impious to see a few german fanatics in the sixteenth century raising their feeble voice against the thunder-tones of all christendom by decrying a practice which was universally held as sacred and essential 
in judging between the teachings of apostolic antiquity on the one hand and of the anabaptists on the other it is not hard to determine on which side lies the truth for what becomes of the christian church if it has erred on so vital a point as that of baptism during the entire period of its existence original sin as st paul has told us is universal every child is therefore defiled at its birth with the taint of adam's disobedience now the scripture says that nothing defiled can enter the kingdom of heaven hence baptism which washes away the original sin is as essential for the infant as for the full-grown man in order to attain the kingdom of heaven i said that regeneration is necessary for all but it is important to observe that if a man is heartily sorry for his sins if he loves god with his whole heart if he desires to comply with all of the divine ordinances including baptism but has no opportunity of receiving it or is not sufficiently instructed as to its necessity god in this case accepts the will for the deed should this man die in these dispositions he is saved by the baptism of desire as happened to the emperor valentinian who died a catechumen i lost him whom i was about to regenerate says st ambrose but he did not lose that grace he sought for or if an unbaptized person lays down his life for christ his death is accepted as more than an equivalent for baptism for he dies not only sanctified but he will wear a martyr's crown he is baptized in his own blood but is not that a heartless and cruel doctrine which excludes from heaven so many harmless babes that have never committed any actual fault to this i reply has not god declared that baptism is necessary for all and is not god the supreme wisdom and justice and mercy i am sure then that there can be nothing cruel or unjust in god's decrees the province of reason consists in ascertaining that god has spoken when we know that he has spoken then our investigation ceases and faith and obedience begin instead of impiously criticizing the divine decree we should exclaim with the apostle oh the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of god how incomprehensible are his judgments and how unsearchable his ways for who hath known the mind of the lord or who hath been his counsellor let us remember that heaven is a place to which none of us has any inherent right or natural claim but that it is promised to us by the pure favour of god he can reject and adopt whom he pleases and can without injustice prescribe his own conditions for accepting his proffered boon if your child is deprived of heaven by being deprived of baptism god does it no wrong because he infringes no right to which your child had any inalienable title if your child obtains the grace of baptism be thankful for the gift it is proper here to state briefly what the church actually teaches regarding the future state of unbaptized infants though the church in obedience to god's word declares that unbaptized infants are excluded from the kingdom of heaven it should not hence be concluded that they are consigned to the place of the reprobate none are condemned to the torments of the damned but such as merit divine vengeance by their personal sins all that the church holds on this point is that unregenerate children are deprived of the beatific vision or the possession of god which constitutes the essential happiness of the blessed now between the supreme bliss of heaven and the torments of the reprobate there is a very wide margin all admit that the condition of unbaptized infants is better than non-existence there are some catholic writers of distinction who even assert that unbaptized infants enjoy a certain degree of natural beatitude that is a happiness which is based on the natural knowledge and love of god from what has been said you may well judge how reprehensible is the conduct of catholic parents who neglect to have their children baptized at the earliest possible moment thereby risking their own souls as well as the souls of their innocent offspring how different was the practice of the early christians who as st augustine testifies hastened with their newborn babes to the baptismal font that they might not be deprived of the grace of regeneration if an infant is sick no expense is spared that its life may be preserved the physician is called in medicine is given to it and the mother will spend sleepless nights watching every movement of the infant she will sacrifice her repose her health nay she will expose even her own life that the life of her offspring may be saved and yet the supernatural happiness of the child is too often imperilled without remorse by the criminal postponement of baptism but if they are to be censured who are slow in having their children baptized what are we to think of that large body of professing christians who on principle deny baptism to little ones till they come to the age of discretion what are we to think of those who set their private opinions above scripture the early fathers of the church and the universal practice of christendom we may smile indeed at a theological opinion no matter how novel or erroneous it may be so long as it does not involve any dangerous consequences but when it is given in a case of life and death how terrible is the responsibility of those who propagate doctrines so erroneous the opposite practice of the catholic and the baptist churches in their treatment of the newborn infant may be well compared to the conduct of the true and the false mother who both claimed the child at the tribunal of solomon the king exclaimed divide the living child in two and give half to the one and half to the other the pretended mother consented saying let it be neither mine nor thine but divide it 
but the woman whose child was alive said to the king for her bowels were moved upon her child i beseech thee my lord give her the child alive and do not kill it while the baptist church is willing that the child should die a spiritual death the true mother the catholic church cries out keep the child provide that spiritual life is saved even at your hands let it be clothed with the robe of innocence even by a stranger let it be nursed at the breasts even of a stepmother better it should live without me than perish before my face i will still be its mother though it know me not ah my baptist friend you think that baptism is not necessary for your child's salvation the old church teaches the contrary you admit that you may be wrong and it is a question of life and death take the safe side give your child the benefit of the doubt let it be baptized baptism washes away original sin and also actual sins from the adult who may have contracted them the cleansing efficiency of baptism was clearly foreshadowed by the prophet ezekiel in these words i will pour upon you clean water and you shall be cleansed from all your filthiness and i will give you a new heart and will put a new spirit within you when the jews asked st peter what they should do to be saved the apostle replied repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of jesus christ for the remission of your sins and ananias said to saul after his conversion rise up and be baptized and wash away thy sins we were by nature says st paul children of wrath but by our regeneration or new birth in baptism we become christians and children of god for ye are all the children of god by faith in christ jesus for as many of you as have been baptized in christ have put on christ we are adopted into the same family with jesus christ what he is by nature we are by grace children of god and consequently brethren of christ nay our union with jesus is still more close we become true members of his mystical body which is his church and his divine image is stamped upon our soul baptism also clothes us with the garment of sanctity so that our soul becomes a fit dwelling place for the holy ghost the apostle after giving a fearful catalogue of the vices of the pagans says to the corinthians and such some of you were but ye are washed ye are sanctified and ye are justified in the name of our lord jesus christ and in the spirit of god baptism in fine makes us heirs of heaven and co-heirs with jesus christ we ourselves also says st paul were sometimes unwise incredulous erring slaves to the diverse desires and pleasures living in malice and envy hateful and hating one another but when the goodness and kindness of god our saviour appeared he saved us by the labour of regeneration and renovation of the holy ghost whom he hath poured forth abundantly upon us through jesus christ our saviour that being justified by his grace we may be heirs according to the hope of life everlasting here we plainly see that the forgiveness of sin the adoption into the family of god the sanctification of the soul and the pledge of eternal life are ascribed to the due reception of baptism not indeed that water or the words of the minister have any intrinsic virtue to heal the soul but because jesus christ whose word is creative power is pleased to attach to this rite its wonderful efficacy of healing the soul as he imparted to the pool of bethsaida the power of healing the body from what has been said i ask you candidly what are you to think of the decision rendered in eighteen seventy two by the bishops of the protestant episcopal church who in their convention in baltimore declared that by the word regeneration we are not to understand a moral change if no moral change is effected by baptism then there is no change at all for certainly baptism produces no physical change in the soul is it no change to pass from sin to virtue from a child of wrath to a child of god from corruption to sanctification from the condition of heirs of death to the inheritance of heaven if all this implies no moral change then those words have lost their meaning modes of baptizing the baptists err in asserting that baptism by immersion is the only valid mode baptism may be validly administered in either of three ways by immersion or by plunging the candidate into the water by infusion or by pouring the water and by aspersion or sprinkling as our lord nowhere prescribes any special form of administering the sacrament the church exercises her discretion in adopting the most convenient mode according to the circumstances of time and place for several centuries after the establishment of christianity baptism was usually conferred by immersion but since the twelfth century the practice of baptizing by infusion has prevailed in the catholic church as this manner is attended with less inconvenience than baptism by immersion to prove that baptism by infusion or by sprinkling is as legitimate as by immersion it is only necessary to observe that though immersion was the more common practice in the primitive church the sacrament was frequently administered even then by infusion and aspersion after st peter's first discourse three thousand persons were baptized it is not likely that so many could have been immersed in one day especially when we consider the time occupied in instructing the candidates 
On reading the account of the baptism of St. Paul and the jailer, the context leaves a strong impression on the mind that both received the sacrament by aspersion or by infusion. Early ecclesiastical history records a great many instances in which baptism was administered to sick persons in their beds, to prisoners in their cells, and to persons on shipboard. The fathers of the church never called in question the validity or the legitimacy of such baptisms. Now it is almost impossible to believe that candidates in such situations could receive the rite by immersion. We have seen, moreover, that baptism has always been declared necessary for salvation. It is reasonable, hence, to believe that our Lord would have afforded the greatest facility for the reception of so essential a sacrament. But if baptism by immersion only is valid, how many sick and delicate persons, how many prisoners and seafaring people, how many thousands living in the frigid zone or even in the temperate zone, in the depth of an inclement winter, though craving the grace of regeneration, would be deprived of God's seal, or would receive it at the risk of their lives? Surely God does not ordinarily impose his ordinances upon us under such a penalty. Moreover, if immersion is the only valid form of baptism, what has become of the millions of souls who in every age and country have been regenerated by the infusion or the aspersion of water in the Christian church? End of chapter 19 Chapter 20 of the Faith of Our Fathers This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Faith of Our Fathers by James Cardinal Gibbons Chapter 20 The Sacrament of Confirmation Confirmation is a sacrament in which, through the imposition of the bishop's hands, unction, and prayer, baptized persons receive the Holy Ghost, that they may steadfastly profess their faith and lead upright lives. This sacrament is called confirmation because it confirms or strengthens the soul by divine grace. Sometimes it is named the laying on of hands because the bishop imposes his hands on those whom he confirms. It is also known by the name of chrism because the forehead of the person confirmed is anointed with chrism in the form of a cross. Frequent mention is made of this sacrament in the Holy Scripture. In the Acts, it is written that when the apostles who were in Jerusalem had heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who, when they were come, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For he was not yet come upon any of them, but they were only baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. It is also related that the disciples at Ephesus were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, and when Paul had imposed his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came upon them, and they spoke tongues and prophesied. In his epistle to the Hebrews, St. Paul enumerates confirmation, or the laying on of hands, together with baptism and penance, among the fundamental truths of Christianity. To the Corinthians he writes, He that confirmeth us with you in Christ, and that hath anointed us, is God, who also hath sealed us and given the pledge of the Spirit in our hearts. God confirmeth us in faith. He hath anointed us by spiritual unction, typified by the sacred chrism which is marked on our foreheads. He hath sealed us by the indelible character stamped on our souls, which is indicated by the sign of the cross impressed on us. He hath given the pledge of the Holy Ghost in our hearts, by the testimony of a good conscience, as an earnest of future glory. The bishop performs the external unction, but God, who worketh all in all, sanctifies the soul by his secret operation. It cannot be asserted that the laying on of hands and the graces which followed from it, as recorded in the Acts, were not intended to be continued after the Apostles' times, for there is no warrant for such an assumption. This function of imposing hands formed as regular and imperative a part of the apostolic ministry as the duties which they exercised in preaching, baptizing, ordaining, etc., Hence, the successors of the apostles in the 19th century have precisely the same authority and obligation to confirm as they have to preach, to baptize, or to ordain. 
those who were confirmed by the apostles usually gave evidence of the grace which they received by prophecy, the gift of tongues and the manifestation of other miraculous powers. It may be asked, Why do not these gifts accompany now the imposition of hands? I answer, because they are no longer needed. The grace which the apostolic disciples received was for their personal sanctification. The gift of tongues which they exercised was intended by Almighty God to edify and enlighten the spectators and to give divine sanction to the apostolic ministry. But now that the Church is firmly established and the divine authority of her ministry is clearly recognized, these miracles are no longer necessary. St. Gregory illustrates this point by a happy comparison. As a sapling, he says, when it is first planted, is regularly watered by the gardener, who softens the earth around it, that the sun and the moisture may nourish its roots, until it takes deep root and it no longer requires any special care. So the church in her infancy had to be nourished by the miraculous power of God. But after it had taken root in the hearts of the people and spread its branches over the earth, it was left to the ordinary agencies of providence. St. Augustine writes also on the same subject. In the first days of the church, the Holy Ghost came down on believers, and they spoke in tongues which they had not learned. These were miracles suited to the times. Is it now expected that they upon whom hands are laid should speak with tongues? Or, when we imposed hands on these children, did each of you wait to see whether they would speak with tongues? If then, there be not now a testimony to the presence of the Holy Spirit by means of these miracles, whence is it proved that he has received the Holy Spirit? Let him ask his own heart. If he loves his brother, the Spirit of God abides in him. Following in the footsteps of the apostles, we find the fathers of the church, from the earliest age, recognizing confirmation as a divine and sacramental institution and proclaiming its salutary effects. The flesh, says Tertullian, is anointed, that the soul may be consecrated. The flesh is marked, that the soul may be fortified. The flesh is overshadowed by the imposition of hands, that the soul may be enlightened with the spirit. St. Cyprian, speaking of the Christians baptized in Samaria, says, Because they had received the legitimate baptism, what was wanting, that was done by Peter and John, that prayer being made for them and hands imposed, the Holy Ghost should be invoked and poured forth upon them, which now also is done amongst us, so that they who are baptized in the church are presented to the bishops of the church, and by our prayer and imposition of hands, they receive the Holy Ghost and are perfected with the seal of the Lord. St. Cyril of Jerusalem compares the sacred chrism in confirmation to the Eucharist. You were anointed with oil, being made sharers and partners of Christ. And see well that you regard it not as mere ointment, for as the bread of the Eucharist, after the invocation of the Holy Ghost, is no longer mere bread but the body of Christ. So likewise this holy ointment is no longer common ointment after the invocation, but the gift of Christ and of the Holy Ghost, being rendered efficient by His divinity. You were anointed on the forehead, that you might be delivered from the shame, which the first transgressor always experienced, and that you might contemplate the glory of God with an unveiled countenance. As Christ, after His baptism and the descent of the Holy Ghost upon Him, going forth overcame the adversary. So you likewise, after holy baptism and the mysterious unction, clothed with the panoply of the Holy Ghost, stand against the adverse power and subdue it, saying, I can do all things in Christ, who strengtheneth me. St. Ambrose, commenting on these words of the Apostle, God hath given us the pledge of the Spirit. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22 expressly applies the text to the seal of confirmation. Remember, he says, that you have received the spiritual seal, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and fortitude, the spirit of knowledge and piety, the spirit of holy fear. God the Father hath sealed you, Christ the Lord hath confirmed you, and hath given the pledge of the Spirit in your heart, as you have learned from the lesson read from the Apostle. 
St. Ambrose here speaks of the sevenfold gifts of the Holy Ghost which are received in confirmation, and every bishop in our day invokes these same gifts on those whom he is about to confirm. Do you know, writes St. Jerome against the sect of Luciferians of his time, that it is the practice of the churches that the imposition of hands should be performed over baptized persons, and the Holy Ghost thus invoked? Do you ask where it is written? In the Acts of the Apostles. But were there no scriptural authority at hand, the consent of the whole world in this regard would have the force of law. You willingly understand, says St. Augustine, by this ointment the sacrament of chrism, which indeed, in the class of visible seals, is as sacred as baptism itself. The Oriental schismatic churches recognize confirmation as a sacrament, and administer the rite as we do, by the imposition of hands and the application of chrism. Now, some of these churches have been separated from the Catholic Church since the 4th and 5th centuries. This fact is an eloquent vindication of the apostolic antiquity of confirmation, and is an ample refutation of those who would ascribe to it a more recent origin. Protestantism, which made such havoc of the other sacraments, did not fail to abolish confirmation in its sweeping revolution. The Episcopal Church retains, indeed, the name of confirmation in its ritual, and even borrows a portion of her prayers and ceremonial. But in opposition to the uniform teaching of the Catholic, as well as of all the Oriental churches, both Orthodox and Schismatic, it declares confirmation to be a mere rite and not a sacrament. In violation of the practice of all antiquity, it mutilates the rite by omitting the sacred unction. It retains the shadow without the substance. It raises, indeed, its hands over the candidates, but they are not the anointed hands of Peter or John, or Cyprian, or Augustine, to whom it is said, Whatsoever thou shalt bless, let it be blessed. Whatsoever thou shalt sanctify, let it be sanctified. Their hands were lifted up with authority and clothed with supernatural power, but the hands of the Episcopal bishops are spiritually paralyzed by the suicidal act of the Reformers and they expressly disclaim any sacramental efficacy in the rite which they administer. End of chapter 20 Chapter 21 of The Faith of Our Fathers This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Veronica Jenkins the Faith of Our Fathers by James Cardinal Gibbons Chapter 21 The Holy Eucharist Among the various dogmas of the Catholic Church, there is none which rests on stronger scriptural authority than the doctrine of the real presence of Jesus Christ in the Holy Eucharist. So copious indeed and so clear are the passages of the New Testament which treat of this subject that I am at a loss to determine which to select and find it difficult to compress them all within the compass of this short chapter. The evangelists do not always dwell upon the same mysteries of religion. Their practice is rather to supplement each other, so that one of them will mention what the others have omitted, or have touched in a cursory way. But in regard to the Blessed Eucharist, the sacred writers exhibit a marked deviation from this rule. We find that the four evangelists, together with St. Paul, have written so explicitly and abundantly on this subject that one of them alone would be amply sufficient to prove the dogma without taking them collectively. These five inspired writers gave the weight of their individual testimony to the doctrine of the Eucharist because they foresaw, or rather the Holy Ghost speaking through them foresaw, that this great mystery which exacts so strong an exercise of our faith and which bids us bow down our understanding unto the obedience of Christ, would meet with opposition in the course of time from those who would measure the infallible word of God by the erring standard of their own judgment. I shall select three classes of arguments from the New Testament which satisfactorily demonstrate the real presence of Christ in the Blessed Sacrament. The first of these texts speaks of the promise of the Eucharist, the second of its institution, and the third of its use among the faithful. To begin with the words of the promise, 
while jesus was once preaching near the coast of the sea of galilee he was followed as usual by an immense multitude of persons who were attracted to him by the miracles which he wrought and the words of salvation which he spoke seeing that the people had no food he multiplied five loaves and two fishes to such an extent as to supply the wants of five thousand men besides women and children our lord considered the present a favorable occasion for speaking of the sacrament of his body and blood which was to be distributed not to a few thousands but to millions of souls not in one place but everywhere not at one time but for all days to the end of the world i am he says to his hearers the bread of life your fathers did eat manna in the desert and died i am the living bread which came down from heaven if any man eat of this bread he shall live for ever and the bread which i will give is my flesh for the life of the world the jews therefore disputed among themselves saying how can this man give us his flesh to eat then jesus said to them amen amen i say to you unless ye eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood ye shall not have life in you he that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath everlasting life and i will raise him up on the last day for my flesh is meat indeed and my blood drink indeed if these words had fallen on your ears for the first time and if you had been among the number of our saviour's hearers on that occasion would you not have been irresistibly led by the noble simplicity of his words to understand him as speaking truly of his body and blood for his language is not susceptible of any other interpretation when our saviour says to the jews your fathers did eat manna and died but he that eateth this eucharistic bread shall live for ever he evidently wishes to affirm the superiority of the food which he would give over the manna by which the children of israel were nourished now if the eucharist were merely commemorative bread and wine instead of being superior it would be really inferior to the manna for the manna was supernatural heavenly miraculous food while bread and wine are a natural earthly food but the best and most reliable interpreters of our saviour's words are certainly the multitude and the disciples who are listening to him they all understood the import of his language precisely as it is explained by the catholic church they believed that our lord spoke literally of his body and blood the evangelist tells us that the jews disputed among themselves saying how can this man give us his flesh to eat even his disciples though avoiding the disrespectful language of the multitude gave expression to their doubt in this milder form this saying is hard and who can hear it so much were they shocked at our saviour's promise that after this many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him they evidently implied by their words and conduct that they understood jesus to have spoken literally of his flesh for had they interpreted his words in a figurative sense it would not have been a hard saying nor have led them to abandon their master but perhaps i shall be told that the disciples and the jews who heard our saviour may have misinterpreted his meaning by taking his words in the literal acceptation while he may have spoken in a figurative sense this objection is easily disposed of it sometimes happened indeed that our saviour was misunderstood by his hearers on such occasions he always took care to remove from their mind the wrong impression they had formed by stating his meaning in simpler language thus for instance having told nicodemus that unless a man be born again he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven and having observed that his meaning was not correctly apprehended by his disciple our saviour added unless a man be born again of water and the holy ghost he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven and again when he warned his disciples against the leaven of the pharisees and finding that they had taken an erroneous meaning from his word he immediately subjoined that they should beware of the doctrine of the pharisees but in the present instance does our saviour alter his language when he finds his words taken in the literal sense does he tell his hearers that he has spoken figuratively 
does he soften the tone of his expression far from weakening the force of his words he repeats what he said before and in language more emphatic amen amen i say unto you unless ye eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood ye shall not have life in you when our saviour beheld the jews and many of his disciples abandoning him turning to the chosen twelve he said feelingly to them will ye also go away and simon peter answered him lord to whom shall we go thou hast the words of eternal life you my dear reader must also take your choice will you reply with the jews or with the disciples of little faith or with peter ah let some say with the unbelieving jews how can this man give us his flesh to eat let others say with the unfaithful disciples this is a hard saying who can hear it but do you say with peter lord to whom shall we go thou hast the words of eternal life so far i have dwelt on the words of the promise i shall now proceed to the words of the institution which are given in almost the same expression by st matthew st mark and st luke in the gospel according to st matthew we read the following narrative and while they were at supper jesus took bread and blessed and broke and gave to his disciples and said take ye and eat this is my body and taking the chalice he gave thanks and gave to them saying drink ye all of this for this is my blood of the new testament which shall be shed for many unto remission of sins i beg you to recall to mind the former text relative to the promise and to compare it with this how admirably they fit together like two links in a chain how faithfully has jesus fulfilled the promise which he made could any idea be expressed in clearer terms than these this is my body this is my blood why is the catholic interpretation of these words rejected by protestants is it because the text is in itself obscure and ambiguous by no means but simply because they do not comprehend how god could perform so stupendous a miracle as to give his body and blood for our spiritual nourishment is then the power or the mercy of god to be measured by the narrow rule of the human understanding is the almighty not permitted to do anything except what we can sanction by our reason is a thing to be declared impossible because we cannot see its possibility has not god created the heavens and the earth out of nothing by the fiat of his word what a mystery is this does he not hold this world in the midst of space does he not transform the tiny blade into nutritious grain did he not feed upwards of five thousand persons with five loaves and two fishes what a mystery did he not rain down manna from heaven for forty years to feed the children of israel in the desert did he not change rivers into blood in egypt and water into wine at the wedding of cana does he not daily make devout souls the tabernacles of the holy ghost and shall we have the hardihood to deny in spite of our lord's plain declaration that god who works these wonders is able to change bread and wine into his body and blood for the food of our souls you tell me it is a mystery above your comprehension a mystery indeed a religion that rejects a revealed truth because it is incomprehensible contains in itself the seeds of dissolution and will end in rationalism is not everything around us a mystery are we not a mystery to ourselves explain to me how the blood circulates in your veins how the soul animates and permeates the whole body how the hand moves at the will of the soul explain to me the mystery of life and death is not the scripture full of incomprehensible mysteries do you not believe in the trinity a mystery not only above but apparently contrary to reason do you not admit the incarnation that the helpless infant in bethlehem was god i understand why rationalists who admit nothing above their reason reject the real presence but that bible christians should reject it is to me incomprehensible but do those who reject the catholic interpretation explain this text to their own satisfaction this is my body etc alas here their burden begins only a few years after the early reformers had rejected the catholic doctrine of the eucharist 
No fewer than one hundred meanings were given to these words. This is my body. It is far easier to destroy than to rebuild. Let me now offer you some additional reasons in favor of the Catholic or literal sense. According to a common rule observed in the interpretation of the Holy Scripture, we must always take the words in their literal signification, unless we have some special reason which obliges us to accept them in a figurative meaning. Now in the present instance, far from being forced to employ the words above quoted in a figurative sense, every circumstance connected with the delivery of them obliges us to interpret them in their plain and literal acceptation. To whom did our Savior address these words? At what time and under what circumstances did he speak? He was addressing his few chosen disciples, to whom he promised to speak in future, not in parables, nor in obscure language, but in the words of simple truth. He uttered these words the night before his passion. And when will a person use plainer speech than at the point of death? These words, This is my body, this is my blood, embodied a new dogma of faith, which all were obliged to believe, and a new law, which all were obliged to practice. They were the last will and testament of our blessed Savior. What language should be plainer than that which contains an article of faith? What words should be more free from tropes and figures than those which enforce a divine law? But above all, where will you find any words more plain and unvarnished than those contained in a last will? Now, if we understand these words in their plain and obvious, that is, in their Catholic sense, no language can be more simple and intelligible. But if we depart from the Catholic interpretation, then it is impossible to attach to them any reasonable meaning. We now arrive at the third class of Scripture texts which have reference to the use or reception of the sacrament among the faithful. When Jesus, as you remember, instituted the Eucharist at his last supper, he commanded his disciples and their successors to renew till the end of time in remembrance of him the ceremony which he performed. What I have done, do ye also for the commemoration of me. We have a very satisfactory means of ascertaining the apostolic belief in the doctrine of the Eucharist by examining what the apostles did in commemoration of our Lord. Did they bless and distribute mere bread and wine to the faithful, or did they consecrate, as they believed, the body and blood of Jesus Christ? If they professed to give only bread and wine in memory of our Lord's Supper, then the Catholic interpretation falls to the ground. If, on the contrary, we find the apostles and their successors, from the first to the nineteenth century, professing to consecrate and dispense the body and blood of Christ, and doing so by virtue of the command of their Saviour, then the Catholic interpretation alone is admissible. Let St. Paul be our first witness. Represent yourself as a member of the primitive Christian congregation assembled in Corinth. About eighteen years after St. Matthew wrote his Gospel, a letter is read from the Apostle Paul, in which the following words occur. The chalice of benediction which we bless is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? And the bread which we break, is it not the partaking of the body of the Lord? For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread and giving thanks, break it and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which shall be delivered for you. Do this for the commemoration of me. In like manner also the chalice, after the supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do ye, as often as ye shall drink, for the commemoration of me. For as often as ye shall eat this bread and drink the cup, ye shall show the death of the Lord until he come. Therefore, whoever shall eat this bread or drink the chalice of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and of the blood of the Lord, but let a man prove himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the chalice. For he who eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh judgment to himself, not discerning the body of the Lord. Could St. Paul express more clearly his belief in the real presence, 
than he has done here? The apostle distinctly affirms that the chalice and bread which he and his fellow apostles bless is a participation of the body and blood of Christ, and surely no one could be said to partake of that divine food by eating ordinary bread. Mark these words of the apostle, Whoever shall take the sacrament unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. What a heinous crime! For these words signify that he who receives the sacrament unworthily shall be guilty of the sin of high treason and of shedding the blood of his Lord in vain. But how could he be guilty of a crime so enormous if he had taken in Eucharist only a particle of bread and wine? Would a man be accused of homicide in this commonwealth if he were to offer violence to the statue or painting of the governor? Certainly not. In like manner, St. Paul would not be so unreasonable as to declare a man guilty of trampling on the blood of his Savior by drinking in an unworthy manner a little wine in memory of him. Study also these words. He who eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh condemnation to himself, not discerning the body of the Lord. The unworthy receiver is condemned for not recognizing or discerning in the Eucharist the body of the Lord. How could he be blamed for not discerning the body of the Lord if there were only bread and wine before him? Hence, if the words of St. Paul are figuratively understood, they are distorted, forced and exaggerated terms, without meaning or truth. But if they are taken literally, they are full of sense and of awful significance, and an eloquent commentary on the words I have quoted from the evangelist. The fathers of the church, without an exception, re-echo the language of the apostle of the Gentiles by proclaiming the real presence of our Lord in the Eucharist. I have counted the names of sixty-three fathers and eminent ecclesiastical writers flourishing between the first and sixth century, all of whom proclaim the real presence, some by explaining the mystery, others by thanking God for his inestimable gift, and others by exhorting the faithful to its worthy reception. From such a host of witnesses, I can select here only a few at random. St. Ignatius, a disciple of St. Peter, speaking of a sect called Gnostics, says, They abstain from the Eucharist and prayer, because they confess not that the Eucharist and prayer is the flesh of our Saviour Jesus Christ. St. Justin Martyr, in an apology to the Emperor Antoninus, writes in the second century, We do not receive these things as common bread and drink, but as Jesus Christ our Saviour was made flesh by the word of God, even so we have been taught that the Eucharist is both the flesh and the blood of the same incarnate Jesus. Origen, 3rd century, writes, If thou wilt go up with Christ to celebrate the Passover, he will give to thee that bread of benediction, his own body, and will vouchsafe to thee his own blood. St. Cyril of Jerusalem, 4th century, instructing the catechumens, observes, he himself having declared, This is my body, who shall dare to doubt henceforward? And he having said, This is my blood, who shall ever doubt, saying, This is not his blood? He once at Cana turned water into wine, which is akin to blood, and is he undeserving of belief when he turned wine into blood? He seemed to be arguing with modern unbelief. St. John Chrysostom, who died in the beginning of the 5th century, preaching on the Eucharist, says, If thou wert indeed incorporal, he would have delivered to thee those same incorporal gifts, without covering. But since the soul is united to the body, he delivers to thee in things perceptible to the senses the things to be apprehended by the understanding. How many nowadays say, would that they could look upon his, Jesus, form, his figure, his raiment, his shoes, lo, thou seest him, touchest him, eatest him. St. Augustine, 5th century, addressing the newly baptized, says, I promised you a discourse wherein I would explain the sacrament of the Lord's table, which sacrament you even now behold, and of which you were last night made partakers. You ought to know what you have received. The bread, which you see on the altar, after being sanctified by the word of God, 
is the body of Christ. That chalice, after being sanctified by the word of God, is the blood of Christ. But why multiply authorities? At the present day, every Christian communion throughout the world, with the sole exception of Protestants, proclaim its belief in the real presence of Christ in the sacrament. The Nestorians and Eutychians, who separated from the Catholic Church in the 5th century, admit the corporeal presence of our Lord in the Eucharist. Such also is the faith of the Greek Church, which seceded from us a thousand years ago, of the present Russian Church, of the schismatic Copts, the Syrians, Chaldeans, Armenians, and, in short, of all the Oriental sects no longer in communion with the See of Rome. End of chapter 21 Read by Veronica Jenkins in Ottawa, Illinois Chapter 22 of Faith of Our Father This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Faith of Our Fathers by James Cardinal Gibbons Chapter 22 Communion Under One Kind Our Saviour gave communion under both forms of bread and wine to His Apostles at the Last Supper. Officiating bishops and priests are always required, except on Good Friday, to communicate under both kinds. But even the clergy of every rank, including the Pope, receive only of the consecrated bread, unless when they celebrate Mass. The Church teaches that Christ is contained, whole and entire, under each species, so that whoever communicates under the form of bread or of wine receives not a mutilated sacrament or a divided Saviour, but shares in the whole sacrament as fully as if he participated in both forms. Hence the layman who receives the consecrated bread partakes as copiously of the body and blood of Christ as the officiating priest who receives both consecrated elements. Our Lord says, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live for ever. And the bread which I will give is my flesh for the life of the world. He that eateth me, the same also shall live by me. He that eateth this bread shall live for ever. From this passage it is evident that whoever partakes of the form of bread partakes of the living flesh of Jesus Christ, which is inseparable from his blood, and which, being now in a glorious state, cannot be divided. For Christ rising from the dead dieth now no more. Our Lord, in his words quoted, makes no reference to the sacramental cup, but only to the Eucharistic bread, to which he ascribes all the efficacy which is attached to communion under both kinds, viz. union with him, spiritual life, eternal salvation. St. Paul, writing to the Corinthians, says, Whoever shall eat this bread, or drink the chalice of the Lord unworthily, shall be guilty of the body and of the blood of the Lord. The Apostle here plainly declares that, by an unworthy participation in the Lord's Supper, under the form of either bread or wine, we profane both the body and the blood of Christ. How could this be so unless Christ is entirely contained under each species? So forcibly, indeed, did the Apostle assert the Catholic doctrine that the Protestant translators have perverted the text by rendering it whosoever shall eat this bread and drink the chalice, substituting and for or, in contradiction to the Greek original, of which the Catholic version is an exact translation. It is also the received doctrine of the Fathers that the Eucharist is contained in all its integrity either in the consecrated bread or in the chalice. St. Augustine, who may be taken as a sample of the rest, says that each one receives Christ the Lord entire under each particle. Luther himself, even after his revolt, was so clearly convinced of this truth that he was an uncompromising advocate of communion under one kind. If any council, he says, should decree or permit both species, we would by no means acquiesce. 
but in spite of the council and its statute we would use one form or neither and never both leibniz the eminent protestant divine observes it cannot be denied that christ is received entire by virtue of concomitance under each species nor is his flesh separated from his blood as the same virtue is contained in the sacrament whether administered in one or both forms the faithful gain nothing by receiving under both kinds and lose nothing by receiving under one form consequently we nowhere find our saviour requiring the communion to be administered to the faithful under both forms but he has left this matter to be regulated by the wisdom and discretion of the church as he has done with regard to the manner of administering baptism our redeemer it is true has said drink ye all of this but it should be remembered that these words were addressed not to the people at large but only to the apostles who alone were also commanded on the same occasion to consecrate his body and blood in remembrance of him now we have no more right to infer that the faithful are obliged to drink of the cup because the apostles were commanded to drink of it than we have to suppose that the laity are required or allowed to consecrate the bread and wine because the power of doing so was at the last supper conferred on the apostles it is true also that our lord said to the people unless ye eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood ye shall not have life in you but this command is literally fulfilled by the laity when they partake of the consecrated bread which as we have seen contains christ the lord in all his integrity hence if our saviour has said whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath everlasting life he has also said the bread which i will give is my flesh for the life of the world it seems to me that the charge of withholding the cup comes with very bad grace from protestant teachers who destroy the whole intrinsic virtue of the sacrament by giving to their followers nothing but bread and wine the difference between them and us lies in this that under one form we give the substance while they under two forms confessedly give only the shadow in examining the history of the church on the subject we find that up to the twelfth century communion was sometimes distributed in one form sometimes in another commonly in both first st luke tells us that the converts of jerusalem were persevering in the doctrine of the apostles and in the communion of bread as the eucharist was sometimes familiarly called and in prayer again he speaks of the christian disciples assembled at troas on the lord's day to break bread we are led to conclude from these passages that the apostles sometimes distributed the communion in the form of bread alone as no reference is made to the cup it was certainly the custom to carry to the sick only the consecrated host surely if there is any period of life when nothing should be neglected which conduces to salvation it is the time of approaching death eusebius tells us that the aged serapion received only the sacred bread at the hands of the priest in the life of saint ambrose we are told that in his last illness the consecrated host alone was given to him the christians in time of persecution confessors of the faith confined in prison travellers on their journey soldiers before engaging in battle and hermits living in the desert were permitted to keep with them and to fortify themselves with the consecrated bread as tertullian cyprian basil ambrose and other fathers of the church testify moreover the mass of the pre-sanctified celebrated in the latin church on good friday only and in the greek church on every day in lent except saturdays and sundays the officiating priest receives the consecrated bread alone in all these instances the communicants never doubted that they received the lord's supper in its integrity surely the conscientious guides of the faith would sooner withhold altogether the sacred host from their flocks than permit them to partake 
of a mutilated sacrament. Second, in the primitive days of the Church, the Holy Communion used to be imparted to infants, but only in the form of wine. The priest dipped his finger in the consecrated chalice and gave it to be sucked by the infant. This custom prevails to this day among the schismatic Christians of all Oriental rites. In some instances the sacred host, saturated in the cup, is given to the child. Third, public communion was, indeed, usually administered in the first ages under both forms. The faithful, however, had the privilege of dispensing with the cup, and of partaking only of the bread, until the time of Pope Galatius in the fifth century, when this general but hitherto optional practice of receiving under both kinds was enforced as a law for the following reason. The Manichaean sect abstained from the cup on the erroneous assumption that the use of wine was sinful. Pope Galatius, in order to detect and condemn the error of those sectaries, left it no longer optional with the faithful to receive under one or both forms, but ordained that all should communicate under both kinds. This law continued in force for several ages, but towards the thirteenth century, for various causes, it had gradually grown into disuse, with the tacit approval of the Church. The Council of Constance, which convened in 1414, established a law requiring the faithful to communicate under the form of bread only, and, in taking this step, the Council was actuated both by reasons of propriety and religion. The widespread diffusion of Christianity throughout the world had rendered it very difficult to supply all the faithful with consecrated wine. Such inconvenience is scarcely felt by Protestant communicants, whose numbers are limited, and who ordinarily communicate only on certain Sundays of each month. The Catholics of the world, on the contrary, number about three hundred millions, and, as communion is administered to some of the faithful almost every day in most of our churches and chapels, and as the annual communions in every parish church are generally at least twice as numerous as its aggregate Catholic population, the sum total of annual communions throughout the globe may be estimated, in round numbers, at not less than five hundred millions. What effort would be required to procure altar wine for such a multitude? In my missionary journeys through North Carolina, I have often found it no easy task to provide for the celebration of Mass a sufficiency of pure wine, which is essential for the validity of the sacrifice. This embarrassment would be increased beyond measure if the cup had to be extended to the laity, and still more in the coal regions, where the cultivation of the grape is unknown, and where imported wine is exclusively used. It would be very distasteful, besides, for so many communicants to drink successively out of the same chalice, which would be unavoidable if the sacrament were administered in both forms. In our larger churches, where communion is distributed every Sunday to hundreds, there would be great danger of spilling a portion of the consecrated chalice, and of thus exposing it to profanation. But above all, as the church in the fifth century, through her chief pastor, Galatius, enforced the use of the cup to expose and reprobate the error of the Manichees, who imagined that the use of wine was sinful, so, in the fifteenth century, she withdrew the cup to condemn the novelties of the Calixtines, who taught that the consecrated wine was necessary for a valid communion. Should circumstances ever justify or demand a change from the present discipline, the Church will not hesitate to restore the cup to the laity. End of chapter 22「Chapter twenty three of the Faith of Our Fathers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Chenever. The Faith of Our Fathers by James Cardinal Gibbons. Chapter twenty three. The Sacrifice of the Mass. Sacrifice is the oblation or offering made to God of some sensible object with the destruction or change of the object, to denote that God is the author of life and death. Thus in the old law, before the coming of Christ, 
When the Hebrew people wished to offer sacrifice to God, they took a lamb or some other animal, which they slew and burned its flesh, acknowledging by this act that the Lord was the supreme master of life and death. The ancients offered to God two kinds of sacrifices, viz., living creatures such as bulls, lambs, and birds, and inanimate objects such as wheat and barley, and in general the first fruits of the earth. All nations, whether Jews, idolaters, or Christians, except Mohammedans and modern Protestants, have made sacrifice their principal act of worship. If you go back to the very dawn of creation, you will find the children of Adam offering sacrifices to God. Abel offered to the Lord the firstlings of his flock, and Cain offered the fruits of the earth. When Noah and his family are rescued from the deluge, which had spread over the face of the earth, his first act on issuing from the ark, when the waters disappear, is to offer holocausts to the Lord in thanksgiving for his preservation. Abraham, the great father of the Jewish race, offered victims to the Almighty at his express command. We read that Job was accustomed to offer holocausts to the Lord, to propitiate his favor in behalf of his children, and to obtain forgiveness for the sins they might have committed. When Jehovah delivered to Moses the written law on Mount Sinai, he gave his servant the most minute details with regard to all the ceremonies to be observed in the sacrifices which were to be offered to him. He prescribed the kinds of victims to be immolated, the qualifications of the priests who were to minister at the altar, and the place and manner in which the victims were to be offered. Hence it was the custom of the Jewish priests to slay every day two lambs as a sacrifice to God. And in doing this they were prefiguring the great sacrifice of the new law, in which we daily offer up on the altar the Lamb of God, who taketh away the sins of the world. In a word, in all their public calamities, whenever they were threatened by their enemies, whenever they were about to engage in war, whenever they were visited by any plague or pestilence, the Jews had recourse to God by solemn sacrifices. Like the Catholic Church of the present day, they had sacrifices not only for the living, but also for the dead, as we read in sacred scripture that Judas Maccabeus ordered sacrifice to be offered up for the souls of his men who were slain in battle. We find sacrifices existing not only among the Jews, who worship the true God, but also among pagan and idolatrous nations. No matter how confused, imperfect, or erroneous was their knowledge of the deity, the pagan nations retained sufficient vestiges of primitive tradition to admonish them of their obligation of appeasing the anger and invoking the blessings of the divinity by victims and sacrifices. Plutarch, an ancient writer of the second century, says of these heathen people, quote, you may find cities without walls, without literature, and without the arts and sciences of civilized life, but you will never find a city without priests and altars, or which has not sacrifices offered to the gods." The Indians of our own country were accustomed to offer sacrifice to the Great Spirit, as Father Jacques and other pioneer missionaries inform us but all those ancient sacrifices were only the types and figures of the great sacrifice of the new law, from which they derived all their efficacy, just as the old law itself was the type of the new law of grace. Since the ancient sacrifices were but figures and shadows, they were imperfect and insufficient, for it is impossible, says St. Paul, that by the blood of oxen and of goats sins should be taken away. Wherefore, when he, Jesus, cometh into the world, he said, Sacrifice and oblation thou wouldst not, but a body thou hast fitted to me. Holocausts for sin did not please thee. Then said I, Behold, I come. As if he should say, The blood of oxen and of goats is not sufficient to appease thy vengeance, and to cleanse thy people from their sins. Therefore, I come, that I may offer myself an acceptable sacrifice for the sins of the world. The prophet Isaiah declared that the Jewish sacrifices had become displeasing to God and would be abolished. To what purpose, says the Lord by his prophet, do you offer me the multitude of your victims? I desire not holocausts of rams and blood of calves and lambs and buck goats. Offer sacrifice no more in vain. 
But did God, in rejecting the Jewish oblations, intend to abolish sacrifices altogether? By no means. On the contrary, he clearly predicts by the mouth of the prophet Malachi that the immolations of the Jews would be succeeded by a clean victim which would be offered up not on a single altar, as was the case in Jerusalem, but in every part of the known world. Listen to the significant words addressed to the Jews by this prophet. Quote, I have no pleasure in you, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will not receive a gift of your hand. Far from the rising of the sun, even to the going down, my name is great among the Gentiles, and in every place there is sacrifice, and there is offered to my name a clean oblation, for my name is great among the Gentiles, said the Lord of hosts. Close quote. The prophet here clearly foretells that an acceptable oblation would be offered to God not by the Jews, but by the Gentiles, not merely in Jerusalem, but in every place from the rising to the setting of the sun. These prophetic words must have been fulfilled. Where shall we find the fulfillment of the prophecy? We may divide the inhabitants of the world into five different classes of people, professing different forms of religion. Pagans, Jews, Mohammedans, Protestants, and Catholics. Among which of these shall we find the clean oblation of which the prophet speaks? Not among the pagan nations, for they worship false gods, and consequently cannot have any sacrifice pleasing to the Almighty. Not among the Jews, for they have ceased to sacrifice altogether, and the words of the prophet apply not to the Jews but to the Gentiles. Not among the Mohammedans, for they also reject sacrifices. Not among any of the Protestant sects, for they all distinctly repudiate sacrifices. Therefore it is only in the Catholic Church that is fulfilled this glorious prophecy, for withsoever you go you will find the clean oblation offered on Catholic altars. If you travel from America to Europe, to Oceania, to Africa or Asia, you will see our altars erected and our priests daily fulfilling the words of the prophets by offering the clean oblation of the body and blood of Christ. This oblation of the new law is commonly called Mass. The word Mass is derived by some from the Hebrew term Misak, which means a free offering. Others derive it from the word Misa, which the priest uses when he announced to the congregation that divine service is over. It is an expression indelibly marked on our English tongue from the origin of our language, and we find it embodied in such words as Candlemas, Michaelmas, Martin Mass, and Christmas. The sacrifice of the Mass is the consecration of the bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ, and the oblation of this body and blood to God by the ministry of the priest for a perpetual memorial of Christ's sacrifice on the cross. The sacrifice of the Mass is identical with that of the cross, both having the same victim and high priest, Jesus Christ. The only difference consists in the manner of the oblation. Christ was offered up on the cross in a bloody manner, and in the Mass he is offered up in an unbloody manner. On the cross he purchased our ransom, and in the Eucharistic sacrifice the price of that ransom is applied to our souls. Hence all the efficacy of the Mass is derived from the sacrifice of Calvary. It was on the night before he suffered that our Lord Jesus Christ instituted the sacrifice of the new law. Jesus, says St. Paul, the night in which he was betrayed took bread, and giving thanks broke and said, Take ye and eat, this is my body, which shall be delivered for you. This do for the commemoration of me. In like manner also the chalice, after he had supped, saying, This chalice is the new testament in my blood. This do ye, as often as you shall drink, for the commemoration of me, for as often as ye shall eat this bread, and drink the chalice, ye shall show the death of the Lord until he comes. From these words we learn that the principal motive which our Saviour had in view in instituting the sacrifice of the altar was to keep us in perpetual remembrance of his sufferings and death. He wished that the scene of Calvary should ever appear in panoramic view before our eyes, and that our heart, memory, and intellect should be filled with the thoughts of his passion. 
He knew well that this would be the best means of winning our love and exciting sorrow for sin in our soul. Therefore, he designed that in every church throughout the world an altar should be erected to serve as a monument of his mercies to his people, as the children of Israel erected a monument on crossing the Jordan to commemorate his mercies to his chosen people. The Mass is truly the memorial service of Christ's Passion. In compliance with the command of our Lord, the adorable sacrifice of the altar has been daily renewed in the Church, from the death of our Saviour till the present time, and will be perpetuated till time shall be no more. In the Acts it is said that while Saul and others were ministering, or, as the Greek text expresses it, sacrificing to the Lord, and fasting, the Holy Spirit said to them, Set apart for me Saul and Barnabas. St. Paul, in his epistle to the Hebrews, frequently alludes to the sacrifice of the Mass. We have an altar, he says, whereof they cannot eat who serve the tabernacle. The Apostle here plainly declares that the Christian Church has its altars as well as the Jewish synagogue. An altar necessarily supposes a sacrifice, without which it has no meaning. The Apostle also observes that the priesthood of the new law was substituted for that of the old law. Now the principal office of priests has always been to offer sacrifice. Priest and sacrifice are as closely identified as judge and court. St. Paul, after David, calls Jesus a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. He is named a priest because he offers a sacrifice, a priest forever because his sacrifice is perpetual, according to the order of Melchizedek, because he offers up consecrated bread and wine, which were prefigured by the bread and wine offered by Melchizedek, the priest of the Most High God. Tradition, with its hundred tongues, proclaims the perpetual oblation of the sacrifice of the Mass from the time of the Apostles to our own days. If we consult the fathers of the Church, who have stood like faithful sentinels on the watch-tires of Israel, guarding with a jealous eye the deposit of faith, and who have been the faithful witnesses of their own times and the recorders of the past, if we consult the general councils at which were assembled the venerable hierarchy of Christendom, they will all tell us with one voice that the sacrifice of the Mass is the center of their religion and the acknowledged institution of Jesus Christ. Another remarkable evidence in favor of the divine institution of the Mass is furnished by the Nestorians and Eutychians, who separated from the Catholic Church in the fifth century, and who still exist in Persia and in other parts of the East, as well as by the Greek schismatics who severed their connection with the church in the ninth century. All these sects, as well as the numerous others scattered over the East, retain to this day the oblation of the Mass in their daily service. As these Christian communities have had no communication with the Catholic Church since the period of their separation from her, they could not, of course, have borrowed from her the doctrine of the Eucharistic sacrifice. Consequently, they must have received it from the same source from which the Church derived it, viz. from the Apostles themselves. But of all proofs in favor of the apostolic origin of the sacrifice of the Mass, the most striking and the most convincing is found in the liturgies of the Church. The liturgy is the established ritual of the Church. It is the collection of the authorized prayers of divine worship. These prayers are fixed and immovable. Among others we have the liturgy of Jerusalem, ascribed to the Apostle St. James, the Liturgy of Alexandria, ascribed to St. Mark the Evangelist, and the Liturgy of Rome, referred to St. Peter. There are various other liturgies accredited to the Apostles, or to their immediate successors. Now I wish to call your attention to this remarkable fact, that all these liturgies, though compiled by different persons at different times, in various places, and in diverse languages, contain without exception, in clear and precise language, the prayers to be said at the celebration of Mass, prayers in substance the same as those found in our prayer books at the canon of the Mass. We cannot account for this wonderful uniformity, except by supposing that the doctrine respecting the Mass was received by the Apostles from the common fountain of Christianity, Jesus Christ Himself. 
It was such facts as these that opened the eyes of those eminent English divines who, during the present century, have abandoned heresy and schism and rich preferments, and who have embraced the Catholic faith, though by taking such a step they had to sacrifice all that was dear to them on earth. The following passages from St. Paul's Epistle to the Hebrews are sometimes urged as an argument against the sacrifice of the Mass. Quote, Christ, neither by the blood of goats or of calves, but by his own blood, entered once into the holies, having obtained eternal redemption, nor yet that he should offer himself often, as the high priest entereth into the holies every year, again, every priest standeth indeed daily ministering, and often offering the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins, but this man, offering one sacrifice for sin, for ever sitteth at the right hand of God. St. Paul says that Jesus was offered once. How then can we offer him daily? I answer that Jesus was offered once in a bloody manner, and it is of this sacrifice that the Apostle speaks. But in the sacrifice of the Mass he is offered up in an unbloody manner. Though he is daily offered on ten thousand altars, the sacrifice is the same as that of Calvary, having the same high priest and victim, Jesus Christ. The object of St. Paul is to contrast the sacrifice of the new law, which has only one victim, with the sacrifices of the old law, where the victims were many, and to show the insufficiency of the ancient sacrifices, and the all-sufficiency of the sacrifice of the new dispensation. But if the sacrifice of the cross is all-sufficient, what need, then, you will say, is there for a commemorative sacrifice of the Mass? I would ask a Protestant in return, Why do you pray and go to church? And why were you baptized and received communion and the rite of confirmation? What is the use of all these exercises if the sacrifice of the cross is all-sufficient? You will tell me that in all these acts you apply to yourselves the merit of Christ's passion. I will tell you in a like manner that in the sacrifice of the Mass I apply to myself the merits of the sacrifice of the cross, from which the Mass derives all its efficacy. Christ indeed by his death made full atonement for our sins, but he has not released us from the obligation of cooperating with him by applying his merits to our souls. What better or more efficacious way can we have of participating in its merits than by assisting at the sacrifice of the altar, where we vividly recall to mind his sufferings, where Calvary is represented before us, where we show the death of the Lord until he comes, and where we draw abundantly to our souls the fruit of his passion by drinking of the same blood that was shed on the cross. In the old law there were different kinds of sacrifices offered up for different purposes. There were sacrifices of praise and thanksgiving to God for his benefits, sacrifices of propitiation to implore his forgiveness for the sins of the people, and sacrifices of supplication to ask his blessing and protection. The sacrifice of the Mass fulfills all these ends. It is a sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, a sacrifice of propitiation and of supplication, Hence that valued book, The Following of Christ, says, quote, When a priest celebrates Mass, he honors God, he rejoices the angels, he edifies the church, he helps the living, he obtains rest for the dead, and makes himself a partner of all that is good. Close quote. To form an adequate idea of the efficacy of the divine sacrifice of the Mass, we have only to bear in mind the victim that is offered, Jesus Christ the Son of the Living God. First, the Mass is a sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. If all human beings in this world and all living creatures and all inanimate objects were collected and burned as a holocaust to the Lord, they would not confer as much praise on the Almighty as a single Eucharistic sacrifice. These earthly creatures, how numerous and excellent soever, are finite and imperfect while the offering made in the Mass is of infinite value, for it is our Lord Jesus, the acceptable Lamb without blemish, the beloved Son, in whom the Father is well pleased, and who is always heard on account of his reverence. With what awe and grateful love should we assist at this sacrifice? The angels were present at Calvary. Angels are present also at the Mass. 
If we cannot assist with the seraphic love and rapt attention of the angelic spirits, let us worship at least with the simple devotion of the shepherds of Bethlehem and the unswerving faith of the Magi. Let us offer to our God the golden gift of a heart full of love and the incense of our praise and adoration, repeating often during the holy oblation the words of the psalmist, The mercies of the Lord I will sing forever. Second, the Mass is also a sacrifice of propitiation. Jesus daily pleads for our cause in this divine oblation before his heavenly Father. If any man sin, says St. John, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the just, and he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. Hence the priest, whenever he offers up the holy sacrifice, recites this prayer at the offertory. Quote, Receive, O Holy Father, Almighty, Eternal God, this immaculate victim, which I, thy unworthy servant, offer to thee, my living and true God, for my innumerable sins, offenses, and negligences, for all here present, and for all the faithful living and dead, that it may avail me and them to everlasting life. Whenever, therefore, we assist at Mass, let us unite with Jesus Christ in imploring the mercy of God for our sins. Let us represent to ourselves the Mass as another Calvary, which it is in reality. Like Mary, let us stand in spirit beneath the cross, and let our souls be pierced with grief for our transgressions. Let us acknowledge that our sins were the cause of that agony and of the shedding of that precious blood. Let us follow in mind and heart that crowd of weeping penitents who accompanied our Saviour to Calvary, striking their breasts, and let us say, Spare, O Lord, spare thy people. Or let us repeat with the publican this heartfelt prayer, O God, be merciful to me, a sinner. At the death of Jesus the sun was darkened, the earth trembled, the very rocks were rent as if to show that even inanimate nature sympathized with the sufferings of its God. And should not we tremble for our sins? Should not our hearts, though cold and hard as rocks, be softened at the spectacle of our God, suffering for love of us and in expiation for our offenses? Third, the sacrifice of the Mass is, in fine, a sacrifice of supplication. For if the blood of goats and of oxen, and the ashes of a heifer being sprinkled, sanctify such as are defiled to the cleansing of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the Holy Spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? If the prayers of Moses and David and the patriarchs were so powerful in behalf of God's servants, what must be the influence of Jesus' intercession? If the wounds of the martyrs plead so eloquently for us, how much more eloquent is the blood of Jesus shed daily upon our altars? His blood cries louder for mercy than the blood of Abel cried for vengeance. If God inclines his ear to us miserable sinners, how can he resist the pleadings in our behalf of the Lamb of God who taketh away the sins of the world? Let us go, therefore, with confidence to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace in seasonable aid. End of chapter 23 Chapter 24 of The Faith of Our Fathers This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Chenevere the faith of our fathers by james cardinal gibbons chapter twenty four the use of religious ceremonies dictated by right reason by religious ceremonies we mean certain expressive signs and actions which the church has ordained for the worthy celebration of the divine service true devotion must be interior and come from the heart for quote, the true adorers shall adore the father in spirit and in truth for the Father indeed seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. But we are not to infer from this that exterior worship is to be condemned because interior worship is prescribed as essential. On the contrary, the rites and ceremonies enjoined in the worship of God and the administration of the sacraments 
are dictated by right reason are sanctioned by almighty god in the old law and by christ and his apostles in the new the angels being pure spirits without a body render to god a purely spiritual worship the sun moon and stars of the firmament pay him a kind of external homage in the prophet daniel we read quote, sun and moon bless the lord stars of heaven bless the lord praise and exalt him above all forever Close quote. the heavens show forth the glory of god the firmament announces the work of his hands man by possessing a soul of spiritual substance partakes of the nature of angels and by possessing a body partakes of the nature of the heavenly bodies it is therefore his privilege as well as his duty to offer to god the twofold homage of body and soul in other words to honor him by internal and external worship genuine piety cannot long be concealed in the heart without manifesting itself by exterior practices of religion hence though interior and exterior worship are distinct they cannot be separated in the present life fire cannot burn without sending forth flame and heat neither can the fire of devotion burn in the soul without being reflected on the countenance and even in speech it is natural for man to express his sentiments by signs and ceremonies for quote, from the fullness of the heart the mouth speaketh close quote and as fuel is necessary to keep a fire alive even so the flame of piety is nourished by the outward forms of religion a devoted child will not be content with loving his father in his heart but will manifest that love by affectionate language and by the service of his body if necessary so will the child of god show his affection for his heavenly father not only by interior devotion but also by the homage of his body Quote, I beseech you, says the Apostle, by the mercy of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly pleasing unto God, your reasonable service. Close quote. The fruit of a tree does not consist in its bark, its leaves, and its branches. Nevertheless, you never saw a tree bearing fruit, unless when clothed with bark, adorned with branches, and covered with leaves. These are necessary for the protection of the fruit. In a like manner, though the fruit of piety does not consist in exterior forms it must however be fostered by some outward observances or it will soon decay there is as close a relation between devotion and ceremonial as exists between the bark and the fruit of a tree the man who daily bends his knee to the maker who recites or sings his praises who devoutly makes the sign of the cross who assists without constraint at the public services of the church who observes an exterior decorum in the house of god who gives to the needy according to his means and duly attends to the other practices and ceremonies of religion will generally be one whose heart is united to god and who yields to him a ready obedience show me on the contrary a man who habitually neglects these outward observances of religion and charity and i will show you one in whose soul the fire of devotion if not quite extinguished at least burns very faintly the ceremonies of the church not only render divine service more solemn but also rivet our attention and lift it up to god our mind is so active so volatile so full of distractions our imagination so fickle that we have need of some external objects on which to fix our thoughts almighty god considered ceremonial so indispensable to interior worship that we find him in the old law prescribing in minute detail the various rites ceremonies and ordinances to be observed by the jewish priests and people in their public worship what is the entire book of leviticus but an elaborate ritual of a jewish church not indeed that external rites are to be compared in merit with interior worship but because they are as necessary for nourishing internal devotion as food is necessary for our animal life our saviour though he came to establish a more spiritual religion than that of the hebrew people did not discard the outward forms of worship he was accustomed to accompany his religious acts by appropriate ceremonies in the garden of gethsemane quote, he fell upon his face close quote, in humble supplication he went to jerusalem accompanied by a great multitude who sang hosanna to the son of david at the last supper 
he invoked a blessing on the bread and wine, and afterward chanted a hymn with his disciples. When the deaf and dumb man was brought to him, before healing him, he put his fingers into his ears and touched his tongue with spittle, quote, and looking up to heaven, he groaned and said, Epitha, which is, Be thou opened. Close quote. When he imparted the Holy Ghost to his disciples, he breathed on them, and the same apostles afterward communicated the Holy Ghost to others by laying hands on them. The Apostle St. James directs that if any man is sick, he shall call in the priest who will anoint him with oil. Now are not all these acts which I have just recorded, the prostration and procession, the prayerful invocation, the chanting of a hymn, the touching of the ears, the lifting up of the eyes to heaven, the breathing on the apostles, the laying on of hands, and the unction of the sick, are not all these acts so many ceremonies serving as models to those which the Catholic Church employs in her public worship and in the administration of her sacraments? The ceremonies now accompanying our public worship are, indeed, usually more impressive and elaborate than those recorded by our Saviour, but it is quite natural that the majesty of ceremonial should keep pace with the growth and development of Christianity. But where shall we find a ritual so gorgeous as that presented to us in the book of Revelation, which is descriptive of the worship of God in the heavenly Jerusalem? Angels with golden censers stand before the throne, while elders cast their crowns of gold before the Lamb once slain. Then that unnumbered multitude of all nations, tongues, and people, clothed in white raiment, bearing palms of victory, virgins too with harp and canticle, follow near the Lamb singing the new song which they alone can utter. How glorious the pageant! How elaborate the detail! Surely there ought to be some analogy and resemblance, some proportion and harmony between the public worship which is paid to God in the church militant on earth, and that which is offered to Him in the church triumphant in heaven. Strange would it be if God, who, in the dispensation past and that to come, is seen delighting in external majesty, should have deprived the Christian church, the living link between the past and the future, of all external glory. For, as St. Paul says, if the ministry of condemnation is glory, much more the ministry of justice aboundeth in glory. It is true that God uttered this complaint against the children of Israel. Quote, These people draw near me with their mouth, and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Close quote. It is also true that he was displeased with their sacrifices and religious festivals. But he blamed them not because they praised him with their voice, but because their hearts felt not what their lips uttered. He rejected their sacrifices because they were not accompanied by the more precious sacrifice of a penitent spirit. The same Lord, who declares that the true adorer shall adore the Father in spirit, commands also that public praise be given to him in his holy temple. Praise ye the Lord, he says, in his holy places. Praise him with sound of trumpet, praise him with psaltery and harp, praise him with timbrel and choir, praise him with strings and organs. If he says in one place, quote, Rend your hearts and not your garments, close quote, immediately after he adds, quote, Blow the trumpet in Sion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather together the people, sanctify the church. Between the porch and the altar, the priests, the Lord's ministers, shall weep and shall say, Spare, O Lord, spare thy people. Close quote. The prophet first points out the absolute necessity of interior sorrow and contrition of heart. Then he insists on the duty of performing some acts of expiation, penance, and humiliation, as you do when you have your forehead marked with ashes on Ash Wednesday and when you observe the fast and abstinence of Lent. When St. Paul says that, though he speak with the tongues of angels and of men, and distribute all his goods to feed the poor, and deliver his body to be burned, and have not the love of God, it profiteth him nothing. He points out the necessity of interior worship. And when he says elsewhere that, quote, In the name of Jesus every knee should bend of those who are in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, close quote, he shows us the duty of exterior and ceremonial worship. 
when political leaders desire to influence the masses in their favor they are not content with addressing themselves to the intellect they appeal also to the feelings and imagination they have torchlight processions accompanied by soul-stirring music discoursing popular airs they have flags and banners floating in the breeze they have public meetings at which they deliver patriotic speeches to arouse the enthusiasm of the people what these men do for political reasons the church performs from the higher motives of religion therefore she has her solemn processions she has her heavenly music to soften the heart and raise it to god she consecrates her sacred banners especially the cross the banner of salvation she preaches with a hundred tongues speaking not only to our head and heart by the word of god but to our feelings and imagination by her grand and imposing ceremonial end of chapter twenty four chapter twenty five of the faith of our fathers this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by phil chenever the faith of our fathers by james cardinal gibbons chapter twenty five ceremonials of the mass let us now dear reader walk together into a catholic church in time to assist at the late mass which is the most solemn service of the catholic liturgy meantime i shall endeavor to explain to you the principal objects which attract your attention as we enter i dip my fingers into a vase placed at the church door and fill with holy water i make the sign of the cross praying at the same time to be purified from all defilement so that with a clean heart i may worship in god's holy temple the church through her ministers blesses everything used in her service for st paul says that quote, every creature of god is good that is received with thanksgiving for it is sanctified by the word of god and by prayer Close quote. before mass begins the priest sprinkles the assembled congregation with holy water reciting at the same time these words of the fiftieth psalm quote, thou shalt sprinkle me with hyssop and i shall be cleansed thou shalt wash me and i shall be made whiter than snow Close quote. the practice of using blessed water dates back to a very remote antiquity and is alluded to by several fathers of the primitive church as we advance up the aisle you observe lying open on the altar a large book which is called a missal or mass book because it contains the prayers said at mass the office of the mass consists of selections from the old and the new testament the canon and other appropriate prayers the canon of the mass never varies throughout the year and ascends to us from the first ages of the church with scarcely the addition of a word nearly all the collects are also very old many of them dating back to a period prior to the seventh century i am acquainted with no prayers that can compare with the collects of the missal in earnestness and vigor of language in conciseness of style and unction of piety it is evident that their authors were men who felt what they said and were filled with the spirit of god despising quote, the persuasive words of human wisdom close quote unlike so many modern prayer composers whose rounded periods are directed rather to tickle the ears of men than to pierce the clouds you are probably familiar with the episcopal book of common prayer and have no doubt admired its beautiful simplicity of diction but perhaps you will be surprised when i inform you that this prayer book is for the most part a translation from our missal let us now reverently follow the officiating priest through the service of the mass you see him advance from the sacristy and stand at the foot of the altar where he makes a humble confession of his sins to god and his saints he then ascends the altar and nine times the divine clemency is invoked in the kyrie eleison christe eleison he intones the sublime doxology gloria in excelsis deo sings the collects of the day reads the lesson or epistle and chants the gospel after which the sermon is usually preached next he recites the nicene creed which for upwards of fifteen centuries has been resounding in the churches of christendom then you perceive him making the oblation of the bread and wine he washes the tips of his fingers reciting the words of the psalmists quote, i will wash my hands among the innocent and will encompass thy altar o lord he is admonished by this ceremony 
to be free from the least stain in view of the sacred act he is going to perform the preface and canon follow including the solemn words of consecration during which the bread and wine are changed by the power of jesus christ into his body and blood he proceeds with other prayers including the best of all the our father as far as the communion when he partakes of the consecrated bread and chalice giving the holy communion afterward to such as are prepared to receive it he continues the mass gives his blessing to the kneeling congregation and concludes with the opening words of the sublime gospel of st john here you have not merely a number of prayers strung together but you witness a scene which rivets pious attention and warms the heart into fervent devotion you participate in an act of worship worthy of god to whom it is offered but you are anxious that i should explain to you the reason why the mass is said in latin when christianity was first established the roman empire ruled the destinies of the world pagan rome had dominion over nearly all europe and large portions of asia and africa the latin was the language of the empire wherever the roman standard was planted there also was spread the latin tongue just as at the present time the english language is spoken wherever the authority of great britain or of the united states is established the church naturally adopted in her liturgy or public worship the language which she then found prevailing among the people the fathers of the early church generally wrote in the latin tongue which thus became the depository of the treasures of sacred literature in the church in the fifth century came the disruption of the roman empire new kingdoms began to be formed in europe out of the ruins of the old empire the latin gradually ceased to be a living tongue among the people and new languages commenced to spring up like so many shoots from the parent stock the church however retained in her liturgy and in the administration of the sacraments the latin language for very wise reasons some of which i shall briefly mention first the catholic church has always one and the same faith the same form of public worship the same spiritual government as her doctrine and liturgy are unchangeable she wishes that the language of her liturgy should be fixed and uniform faith may be called the jewel and language is the casket which contains it so careful is the church of preserving the jewel intact that she will not disturb even the casket in which it is set living tongues unlike a dead language are continually changing in words and meaning the english language as written four centuries ago would be now almost as unintelligible to an english reader as the latin tongue in an old bible published in the fourteenth century st paul calls himself the villain of jesus christ the word villain in those days meant a servant but the term would not be complimentary now to one even less holy than the apostle this is but one instance out of many which i could adduce to show the mutations which our language has undergone but the latin being a dead language is not liable to these changes second the catholic church is spread over the whole world embracing in its fold children of all climes and nations and peoples and tongues under the sun how i ask could the bishops of these various countries communicate with one another in council if they had not one language to serve as a common medium of communication it would be simply impossible a church that is universal must have a universal tongue whilst a national church or a church whose members speak one and the same language and whose doctrines conveniently change to suit the times can safely adopt the vernacular tongue in its liturgy a few years ago a convocation was held in england composed of british and american episcopal bishops they had no difficulty in communicating with one another because all spoke their mother tongue but suppose they had representatives from spain france and germany the lips of those continental bishops would be sealed because they could not speak to their english brothers their ears would be sealed because they could not comprehend what was said to them in eighteen sixty nine at the ecumenical council of the vatican were assembled bishops from all parts of the world speaking all the civilized languages of christendom had those bishops no uniform language to express their thoughts public debates and familiar conversation among them would have been impracticable the council chamber would have been a confused babble of tongues but thanks to the latin language which they all spoke except a few orientals their speeches were as plainly understood as if they had spoken in his native dialect third 
moreover the bishops and clergy of the catholic church are in frequent correspondence with the holy see this requires that they should communicate in one uniform language otherwise the pope would be compelled to employ secretaries speaking every language in christendom but if the priest says mass in an unknown tongue are not the people thereby kept in ignorance of what he says and is not their time wasted in church we are forced to smile at such charges which are flippantly repeated from year to year these assertions arise from a total ignorance of the mass many protestants imagine that the essence of public worship consists in a sermon hence to their minds the primary duty of a congregation is to listen to a discourse from the pulpit prayer on the contrary according to catholic teaching is the most essential duty of a congregation though they are regularly instructed by sermons now what is the mass it is not a sermon but it is a sacrifice of prayer which the priest offers up to god for himself and the people when the priest says mass he is speaking not to the people but to god to whom all languages are equally intelligible the congregation indeed could not be expected to hear the priest even if he spoke in english since his face is turned from them and the greater part of what he says is pronounced in an undertone but this was the system of worship god ordained in the ancient dispensation as we learn from the old testament and from the first chapter of st luke the priest offered sacrifice and prayed for the people in the sanctuary while they prayed at a distance in the court in all the schismatic churches of the east the priest in the public service prays not in the vulgar but in a dead language such also is the practice in the jewish synagogues at this day the rabbi reads the prayers in hebrew a language with which many of the congregation are not familiar but is it true that the people do not understand what the priest says at mass not at all for by the aid of an english missal or any other missal they are able to follow the officiating clergyman from the beginning to the end of the service you also observe lighted tapers on the altar and you desire to know for what purpose they are used in the old law the almighty himself ordained that lighted chandeliers should adorn the tabernacle assuredly that cannot be improper in the new dispensation which god sanctioned in the old the lights upon our altars have both a historical and a symbolic meaning in the primitive days of the church christianity was not tolerated by the pagan world the christians were consequently obliged to assemble for public worship in the catacombs of rome and other secret places these catacombs or subterranean rooms still exist and are objects of deep interest to the pious stranger visiting the eternal city as these hidden apartments did not admit the light of the sun the faithful were obliged to have lights even in open day in commemoration of the event the church has retained the use of lights on her altars lighted candles have also a symbolic meaning they represent our saviour who is the light of the world who enlightens every man that cometh into the world without whom we should be wandering in darkness and in the shadow of death they also serve to remind us to quote, let our light so shine before men by our good example that they may see our good works and glorify our father who is in heaven Close quote. lights are used too as a sign of spiritual joy st jerome who lived in the fourth century remarks quote, throughout all the churches of the east before the reading of the gospel candles are lighted at midday not to dispel darkness but as a sign of joy Close quote. you also notice the priest incensing the altar incense is a striking emblem of prayer which should ascend to heaven from hearts burning with love just as a fragrant smoke ascends from the censer let my prayer says the royal prophet ascend like incense in thy sight god enjoined in the old law the use of incense quote, aaron shall burn sweet-smelling incense upon the altar in the morning Close quote. hence we see the priest zachariah offer incense on going into the temple of the lord and all the multitude were praying without at the hour of incense you perceive that the altar is decorated to-day with vases and flowers because this is a festival of the church there is one spot on earth which can never be too richly adorned and that is the sanctuary in which our lord vouchsafes to dwell among us nothing is too good nothing too beautiful nothing too precious for god 
he gives us all we possess and the least we can do in return is to ornament that spot which he has chosen for his abode on earth the almighty it is true has no need of our gifts he is rich without them the earth is the lord's and the fullness thereof nevertheless he is pleased to accept our offerings when they are bestowed upon him as a mark of our affection just as a father joyfully receives from his child a present bought with his own means our saviour gratefully accepted the treasures of the magi though he could have done without such gifts some persons when they see our sanctuary sumptuously decorated will exclaim would it not have been better to give to the poor the money spent in purchasing these things so complained judas though caring not for the poor when mary poured from an alabaster vase the precious ointment on the feet of an approving saviour why should not we imitate mary by placing at his feet around his sanctuary our vases with their chaste and fragrant flowers that the church may be filled with their perfume as simon's house was filled with the odour of the ointment does not the almighty at certain seasons adorn with lilies and flowers of every hue this earth which is the great temple of nature and what is more appropriate than that we should on special occasions embellish our sanctuary the place which he has chosen for his habitation among us it is sweet to snatch from the field its fairest treasures wherewith to beautify the temple made with hands the sacred vestments which you saw worn by the officiating priest must have struck you as very antique and out of fashion nor is this surprising for if you saw a lady enter church to-day with a head-dress such as worn in the days of queen elizabeth her appearance would look to you very singular now our priestly vestments are far older in style than the days of queen elizabeth much older even than the british empire eusebius and other writers of the fourth century speak of them as already existing in their times it is no wonder therefore that these vestments look odd to the unfamiliar eye in the old law god prescribed to the priests the vestments which they should wear while engaged in their sacred office quote, and these shall be the vestments which they shall make for the priest a rational and an ephod a tunic and a straight linen garment a mitre and a girdle they shall make the holy vestments for thy brother aaron and his sons that they may do the office of priesthood unto me Close quote guided by heaven the church also prescribes sacred garments for her ministering priests for it is eminently proper and becoming that the minister of god while engaged in the sacred mysteries should be arrayed in garments which would constantly impress upon him his sacred character and remind him as well as the congregation of the sublime functions he is performing the vestments worn by the priest while celebrating mass are an amict or white cloth around the neck an alb or white garment reaching to his ankles and bound around his waist by a cincture a maniple suspended from his left arm a stole which is placed over his shoulders and crossed at the breast and a chasuble or large outer garment the chasuble stole and mandible vary in color according to the occasion thus white vestments are used at christmas easter and other festivals of joy also on feast of confessors and virgins red are used at pentecost and on festivals of apostles and martyrs green from trinity sunday to advent on days having no special feast purple during lent and advent and black in masses for the dead one more word on this subject only a few years ago the whole protestant world was united in denouncing the use of floral decorations on our altars incense sacred vestments and even the altar itself as abominations of popery but of late a better spirit has taken possession of a respectable portion of the protestant episcopal church after having exhausted their wrath against our vestments and vilifying them as the rags of the wicked women of babylon the members of the ritualistic church have with remarkable dexterity passed from one extreme to the other they don our vestments they swing our censer erect altars in their churches and adorn them with flowers and candlesticks these ritualists are however easily discerned from the true priest should one of them ever appear before the father of the faithful in these ill-fitting robes the venerable pontiff would exclaim with the patriarch of old quote, the voice indeed is the voice of jacob but the hands are the hands of esau Close quote. i feel the garment of the priest but i hear the voice of the parson 
God grant that, as our misguided brothers have assumed our sacerdotal garments, they may adopt our faith, that their speech may conform to their dress. Then, having laid aside their earthly stoles, may they deserve, like all faithful priests, to be seen, quote, standing before the throne and in sight of the Lamb, with white stoles and palms in their hands, saying, Salvation to our God, who sitteth upon the throne and to the Lamb. Close quote. End of chapter 25chapter twenty six part one of the faith of our fathers this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the faith of our fathers by james cardinal gibbons chapter twenty six the sacrament of penance part one the divine institution of the sacrament of penance the whole history of jesus christ is marked by mercy and compassion for suffering humanity from the moment of his incarnation till the hour of his death every thought and word and act of his divine life was directed toward the alleviation of the ills and miseries of fallen man as soon as he enters on his public career he goes about doing good to all men he gives sight to the blind hearing to the deaf vigor to paralyzed limbs he applies the salve of comfort to the bleeding heart and raises the dead to life but while jesus occupied himself in bringing relief to corporal infirmities the principal object of his mission was to release the soul from the bonds of sin the very name of jesus indicates this important truth thou shalt call his name jesus says the angel for he shall save his people from their sins for if jesus had contented himself with healing the maladies of our body without attending to those of our soul he would deserve indeed to be called our physician but would not merit the more endearing titles of saviour and redeemer but as sin was the greatest evil of man and as jesus came to remove from us our greatest evils he came into the world chiefly as the great absolver from sin Magdalen seems to have a consciousness of this. She casts herself at his feet, which she washes with her tears and wipes with her hair, while Jesus pronounces over her the saving words of absolution. The very demons recognized Jesus as the enemy of sin, for they dreaded his approach, knowing that he would drive them out of the bodies of men. Our Lord makes the healing of the body secondary to that of the soul when he delivers the body from its distempers his object is to win the confidence of the spectators by compelling them to recognize him as the soul's physician he says for instance to the palsied man thy sins are forgiven the scribes are offended at our saviour for presuming to forgive sins he replies in substance if you do not believe my words believe my acts and he at once heals the man of his disease after he had cured the man that had been languishing for thirty-eight years he whispered to him this gentle admonition sin no more lest some worse thing may happen to thee as much as our spiritual substance excels the flesh that surrounds it so much more did our saviour value the resurrection of a soul from the grave of sin than the resurrection of the body from that of death hence st augustine pointedly remarks that while the gospel relates only three resurrections of the body our lord during his mortal life raised thousands of souls to the life of grace as the church was established by jesus christ to perpetuate the work which he had begun it follows that the reconciliation of sinners to god was to be the principal office of sacred ministers but the important question here presents itself how was man to obtain forgiveness in the church after our lord's ascension was jesus christ to appear in person to every sinful soul and say to each penitent as he said to magdalen thy sins are forgiven thee or did he intend to delegate this power of forgiving sins to ministers appointed for that purpose we know well that our saviour never promised to present himself visibly to each sinner nor has he done so his plan therefore must have been to appoint ministers of reconciliation to act in his name 
it has always indeed been the practice of almighty god both in the old and the new law to empower human agents to execute his merciful designs when jehovah resolved to deliver the children of israel from the captivity of egypt he appointed moses their deliverer when god wished them to escape from the pursuit of pharaoh across the red sea did he intervene directly no but by his instructions moses raised his hand over the waters and they were instantly divided when the people were dying from thirst in the desert did god come visibly to their rescue no but moses struck the rock from which the water instantly issued when paul breathing vengeance against the christians was going to damascus did our saviour personally restore his sight convert and baptize him no he sent paul to his servant ananias who restored his sight and baptized him the same apostle beautifully describes to us in one sentence of his epistle to the corinthians the arrangement of divine providence in the reconciliation of sinners god he says hath reconciled us to himself through christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation for christ therefore we are ambassadors god as it were exhorting through us that is to say god sends christ to reconcile sinners christ sends us we are his ambassadors reconciling sinners in his name when i think of this tremendous power that we possess i congratulate the members of the church for whose benefit it is conferred i tremble for myself and my fellow ministers for terrible is our responsibility while we have nothing to glory in christ is the living fountain of grace we are but the channels through which it is conveyed to your souls christ is the treasure we are but the pack-horses that carry it we bear this treasure in earthen vessels christ is the shepherd we are the pipe he uses to call his sheep our words sounding in the confessional are but the feeble echo of the voice of the spirit of god that purified the apostles in the cenacle of jerusalem but have we gospel authority to show that our saviour did confer on the apostles and their successors the power to forgive sins we have the most positive testimony and our saviour's words conferring this power are expressed in the plainest language which admits of no misconception in the gospel of st matthew our saviour thus addresses peter thou art peter and on this rock i will build my church and i will give to thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound also in heaven and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed also in heaven and to all the apostles assembled together on another occasion he uses the same forcible language whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound also in heaven and whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed also in heaven the soul is enchained by sin i give you power says our lord to release the penitent soul from its galling fetters and to restore it to the liberty of a child of god in the gospel of st john we have a still more striking declaration of the absolving power given by our saviour to his apostles jesus after his resurrection thus addresses his disciples peace be with you as the father hath sent me i also send you receive ye the holy ghost whose sins ye shall forgive they are forgiven them and whose sins ye shall retain they are retained that peace which i give to you you will impart to repentant souls as a pledge of their reconciliation with god the absolving power i have from my father the same i communicate to you receive the holy ghost that you may impart this holy spirit to souls possessed by the spirit of evil if their sins are as scarlet they shall be made as white as snow and if they be red as crimson they shall be white as wool if they are as numerous as the sands on the seashore they shall be blotted out provided they come to you with contrite hearts the sentence of mercy which you shall pronounce on earth i will ratify in heaven from these words of st john i draw three important conclusions it follows first that the forgiving power was not restricted to the apostles but extended to their successors in the ministry unto all times and places 
the forgiveness of sin was to continue while sin lasted in the world and as sin alas will always be in the world so will the remedy for sin be always in the church the medicine will coexist with the disease the power which our lord gave the apostles to preach to baptize to confirm to ordain etc was transmitted by them to their successors why not also the power which they had received to forgive sins since man's greatest need is his reconciliation with god by the forgiveness of his offences it follows secondly that forgiveness of sin was ordinarily to be obtained only through the ministry of the apostles and their successors just as it was from them that the people were to receive the word of god and the grace of baptism the pardoning power was a great prerogative conferred on the apostles but what kind of prerogative would it be if people could always obtain forgiveness by confessing to god secretly in their rooms how few would have recourse to the apostles if they could obtain forgiveness on easier terms god says to his chosen ministers i give you the keys of my kingdom that you may dispense the treasures of mercy to repentant sinners but of what use would it be to give the apostles the keys of god's treasures for the ransom of sinners if every sinner could obtain his ransom without applying to the apostles if i gave you dear reader the keys of my house authorizing you to admit whom you please that they may partake of the good things contained in it you would conclude that i had done you a small favor if you discovered that every one was possessed of a private key and could enter when he pleased without consulting you i have said that forgiveness of sins is ordinarily to be obtained through the ministry of the apostles and of their successors because it may sometimes happen that the services of god's minister cannot be obtained a merciful lord will not require in this conjuncture more than a hearty sorrow for sin joined with a desire of having recourse as soon as practicable to the tribunal of penance for god's ordinances bind only such as are able to fulfil them it follows in the third place that the power of forgiving sins on the part of god's minister involves the obligation of confessing them on the part of the sinner the priest is not empowered to give absolution to every one indiscriminately he must exercise the power with judgment and discretion he must reject the impenitent and absolve the penitent but how will he judge of the disposition of the sinner unless he knows his sins and how will the priest know his sins unless they are confessed hence we are not surprised when we read in the acts that many of them who believed came confessing and declaring their deeds to the apostles why did they confess their sins unless they were bound to do so hence also we understand why st john says if we confess our sins he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all iniquity the strength of these texts of scripture will appear to you much more forcible when you are told that all the fathers of the church from the first to the last insist upon the necessity of sacramental confession as a divine institution we are not unfrequently told by those who are little acquainted with the doctrine and history of the church that sacramental confession was not introduced into the church until twelve hundred years after the time of our saviour in vindication of their bold assertion they even introduce quotations from saints basil ambrose augustine jerome and chrysostom these quotations are utterly irrelevant but if seen in the context they will tend to prove instead of disproving the catholic doctrine of confession for the sake of brevity i shall cite only a few passages from the fathers referred to these citations i take almost at random from the copious writings of these fathers on confession from these extracts you can judge of the sentiments of all the fathers on the subject of confession abuno dice omnes st basil writes in the confession of sins the same method must be observed as in laying open the infirmities of the body for as these are not rashly communicated to every one but to those only who understand by what method they may be cured 
so the confession of sins must be made to such persons as have the power to apply a remedy later on he tells us who those persons are necessarily our sins must be confessed to those to whom has been committed the dispensation of the mysteries of god thus also they are found to have acted who did penance of old in regard of the saints it is written in the acts they confessed to the apostles by whom also they were baptized two conclusions obviously follow from these passages of saint basil first the necessity of confession second the obligation of declaring our sins to a priest to whom in the new law is committed the dispensation of the mysteries of god st ambrose of milan writes the poison is sin the remedy the accusation of one's crime the poison is iniquity confession is the remedy of the relapse and therefore it is truly a remedy against poison if thou declare thine iniquities that thou mayest be justified art thou ashamed this shame will avail thee little at the judgment seat of god the following passage clearly shows that the great light of the church of milan is speaking of confession to priests there are some continues st ambrose who ask for penance that they may at once be restored to communion these do not so much desire to be loosed as to bind the priest for they do not unburden their conscience but they burden his who is commanded not to give holy things unto dogs that is not easily to admit impure souls to the holy communion paulinus the secretary of st ambrose in his life of that great bishop relates that he used to weep over the penitents whose confessions he heard st augustine writes our merciful god wills us to confess in this world that we may not be confounded in the other and again let no one say to himself i do penance to god in private i do it before god is it then in vain that christ hath said whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven is it in vain that the keys have been given to the church do we make void the gospel void the words of christ in this extract how well doth the great doctor meet the sophistry of those who in our times say that it is sufficient to confess to god st chrysostom in his thirtieth homily says lo we have now at length reached the close of holy lent now especially we must press forward in the career of fasting and exhibit a full and accurate confession of our sins that with these good works having come to the day of easter we may enjoy the bounty of the lord for as the enemy knows that having confessed our sins and shown our wounds to the physician we attain to an abundant cure he in an especial manner opposes us again he says do not confess to me only of fornication nor of those things that are manifest among men but bring together also the secret calumnies and evil speakings and all such things the great doctor plainly enjoins here a detailed and specific confession of our sins not to god but to his minister as the whole context evidently shows the same father in an eloquent treatise on the power of the sacred ministry uses the following words to the priests is given a power which god would not grant either to angels or archangels inasmuch that what the priests do below god ratifies above and the master confirms the sentence of his servants for he says whose sins you shall retain they are retained what power i ask can be greater than this the father hath given all power to the son and i see all this same power delivered to them by god the son to cleanse the leprosy of the body or rather to pronounce it cleansed was given to the jewish priests alone but to our priests is granted the power not of declaring healed the leprosy of the body but of absolutely cleansing the defilements of the soul and again if a sinner as becomes him would use the aid of his conscience and hasten to confess his crimes and disclose his ulcer to his physician who may heal and not reproach and receives remedies from him if he would speak to him alone without the knowledge of any one and with care lay all before him 
easily would he amend his failings for the confession of sins is the absolution of crimes st jerome writes if the serpent the devil secretly bite a man and thus infect him with the poison of sin and this man shall remain silent and do not penance nor be willing to make known his wound to his brother and master the master who has a tongue that can heal cannot easily serve him for if the ailing man be ashamed to open his case to the physician no cure can be expected for medicine does not cure that of which it knows nothing elsewhere he says with us the bishop or priest binds or looses not them who are merely innocent or guilty but having heard as his duty requires the various qualities of sin he understands who should be bound and who loosed could the catholic doctrine regarding the power of the priests and the obligation of confession be expressed in stronger language than this and yet these are the very fathers who are represented to be opposed to sacramental confession with a reckless disregard of the unanimous voice of antiquity our adversaries have the hardihood to assert that private or sacramental confession was introduced at a period subsequent to the twelfth century they do not however vouchsafe to inform us by what pope or bishop or father of the church or by what council or in what country this monstrous innovation was foisted on the christian republic surely an institution which in their estimation has been fraught with such dire calamity to christendom ought to have its origin marked with more precision it is sometimes prudent however not to be too particular in fixing dates i shall now i trust show to the satisfaction of the reader first that sacramental confession was not introduced second that it could not have been introduced into the church since the days of the apostles and consequently that it is apostolic in its origin that confession was not invented since the days of the apostles is manifest as soon as we attempt to fix the period of its first establishment let us go back step by step from the nineteenth to the first century it had not its origin in the present century as everybody will admit nor did it arise in the sixteenth century since the general council of trent held in that age speaks of it as an established and venerable institution and luther says that auricular confession as now in vogue is useful nay necessary nor would i he adds have it abolished since it is the remedy of afflicted consciences even henry the eighth before he founded a new sect wrote a treatise in defence of the sacraments including penance and confession it was not introduced in the thirteenth century for the fourth council of lateran passed a decree in twelve fifteen obliging the faithful to confess their sins at least once a year this degree of course supposes confession to be already an established fact some protestant writers fall into a common error in interpreting the decree of the lateran council by saying sacramental confession was never required in the church of rome until the thirteenth century the council simply prescribed a limit beyond which the faithful should not defer their confession these writers seem incapable of distinguishing between a law obliging us to a certain duty and a statute fixing the time for fulfilling it they might as well suppose that the revenue officer creates the law regarding the payment of taxes when he issues a notice requiring the revenue to be paid within a given time going back to the ninth century we find that confession could not have had its rise then it was at that period that the greek schism took its rise under the leadership of Photius. the greek schismatic church has remained since then a communion separate from the catholic church having no spiritual relations with us now the greek church is as tenaciously attached to private confession as we are for the same reasons confession could not date its origin from the fifth or fourth century the arians revolted from the church in the fourth century and the nestorians and eutychians in the fifth the last two named sects still exist in large numbers in persia abyssinia and along the coast of malabar and retain confession as one of their most sacred and cherished practices 
in fine no human agency could succeed in instituting confession between the first and fourth century for the teachings of our divine redeemer and of his disciples had made too vivid an impression on the christian community to be easily effaced and the worst enemies of the church admit that no spot or wrinkle had yet deformed her fair visage in this the golden age of her existence these remarks suffice to convince us that sacramental confession was not instituted since the time of the apostles i shall now endeavor to prove to your satisfaction that its introduction into the church since the apostolic age was absolutely impossible there are two ways in which we may suppose that error might insinuate itself into the church namely suddenly or by slow process now the introduction of confession in either of those ways was simply impossible first nothing can be more absurd than to suppose that confession was immediately forced upon the christian world for experience demonstrates with what slowness and difficulty men are divested of their religious impressions whether true or false if such is the case with individuals how ridiculous would it seem for whole nations to adopt in a single day some article of belief which they had never admitted before hence we cannot imagine without doing violence to our good sense that all the good people of christendom went to rest one night ignorant of the sacrament of penance and rose next morning firm believers in the catholic doctrine of auricular confession as well might we suppose that the citizens of the united states would retire to rest believing that they were living under a republic and awake impressed with a conviction that they were under the rule of queen victoria nor is it less absurd to suppose that the practice of confession was introduced by degrees how can we imagine that the fathers of the church the clements the leos the gregories the chrysostoms the jeromes the basils and augustines those intrepid high priests of the lord who in every age at the risk of persecution exile and death have stood like faithful sentinels on the watch towers of israel defending with sleepless eyes the outskirts of the city of god from the slightest attack how can we imagine i say that they would suffer the enemy of truth to invade the very sanctuary of god's temple if they were so vigilant in cutting off the least withered branch of error how would they tamely submit to see so monstrous and exotic engrafted on the fruitful tree of the church what gives additional weight to these remarks is the reflection that confession is not a speculative doctrine but a doctrine of the most practical kind influencing our daily actions words and thoughts a sacrament to which thousands of christians have constant recourse in every part of the world it is a doctrine moreover hard to flesh and blood and which no human power even if it had the will could impose on the human race it is only a god that in such a case could exact the homage of our assent in whatever light therefore we view the present question whether we consider the circumstances of time place manner of its introduction the same inevitable conclusion stares us in the face that sacramental confession is not the invention of man but the institution of jesus christ but the doctrine of priestly absolution and the private confession of sins is not confined to the roman catholic and oriental schismatic churches the same doctrine is also taught by a large and influential portion of the protestant episcopal church of england the rev c s gruber a clergyman of the church of england has recently published a catechism in which the absolving power of the minister of god and the necessity and advantage of confession are plainly set forth i will quote from the reverend gentleman's book his identical words question what do you mean by absolution answer the pardon or forgiveness of sin question by what special ordinance of christ are sins committed after baptism to be pardoned answer by the sacrament of absolution question who is the minister of absolution answer a priest question do you mean that a priest can really absolve answer yes question in what place of the holy scripture is it recorded that christ gave this power to the priesthood answer 
in John 20, 23. See also Matthew 18, 18. Question. What does the prayer book or book of common prayer say? Answer. In the office for the ordaining of priests, the bishop is directed to say, Receive the Holy Ghost for the office and work of a priest in the church of God. Whose sins thou dost forgive, they are forgiven. In the office for the visitation of the sick, it is said, Our Lord Jesus Christ hath left in his church power to absolve all sinners that truly repent and believe in him. In the order for morning and evening prayer, we say again, Almighty God hath given power and commandment to his ministers to declare and pronounce to his people, being penitent, the absolution and remission of their sins. Question. For what purpose hath Christ given this power to priests to pronounce absolution in his name? Answer. For the consolation of the penitent, the quieting of his conscience. Question. What must precede the absolution of the penitent? Answer. Confession. Before absolution privately given, confession must be made to a priest privately. Question. In what case does the Church of England order her ministers to move people to private or, as it is called, to auricular confession? Answer. When they feel their conscience troubled by any weighty matter. Question. What is weighty matter? Answer. Mortal sin certainly is weighty. Sins of omission or commission of any kind that press upon the mind are so too. Anything may be weighty that causes scruple or doubtfulness. Question. At what times in particular does the church so order? Answer. In the time of sickness and before coming to the Holy Communion. Question. Is there any other class of persons to whom confession is profitable? Answer. Yes. To those who desire to lead a saintly life. These indeed are the persons who most frequently resort to it. Question. Is there any other object in confession besides the seeking absolution for past sin and the quieting of the penitent's conscience? Answer. Yes, the practice of confessing each single sin is a great check upon the commission of sin and the preservative of purity of life. Here we have the divine institution of priestly absolution and the necessity and advantage of sacramental confession plainly taught not in a speculative treatise, but in a practical catechism by a distinguished minister of the Church of England, taught by a minister who draws his salary from the funds of the Protestant Episcopal Church, who preaches and administers in a church edifice recognized as a Protestant Episcopal Church, and who is in strict communion with the bishop of the Protestant Episcopal Church of England and these doctrines are upheld not by one eminent divine only but by hundreds of clergymen as well as by thousands of the protestant episcopalians of england what a strange spectacle to behold the same church teaching diametrically opposed doctrines what is orthodox in the diocese of bath and wells is decidedly heterodox in the diocese of north carolina an ordinance which Rev. Mr. Gruber proclaims to be of divine faith is characterized by Right Rev. Bishop Atkinson as the invention of men. What Dr. Gruber inculcates as a most salutary practice, Dr. Atkinson anathematizes as pernicious to religion. Confession, which in the judgment of the former is a great check upon the commission of sin, is stigmatized by the latter as an incentive to sin. Behold how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Suppose that the venerable Protestant Episcopal Bishop of North Carolina, in passing through England, were invited by the Reverend Mr. Gruber to preach in his church in the morning, and that the right Reverend Prelate chose for his subject the Sermon on Confession. And suppose that the Reverend Mr. Gruber selected in the evening as the subject of his discourse the doctrine advanced by him in his catechism. Let us imagine some benighted dissenter attending Mr. Gruber's church at the morning and evening service with the view to being enlightened in the teachings of the Protestant church. Would not our dissenter be sorely perplexed on returning home at night as to what the Protestant Episcopal Church really did teach? 
some episcopalians are pleased to admit that confession may be resorted to with spiritual profit in certain abnormal cases for instance in time of sickness so that in their judgment a religious observance which is salutary to a sick man is pernicious to him in good health for the life of me i cannot see how the circumstances of bodily health can affect the moral character of a religious act that a minister of the baptist or the methodist church should deny the power of priestly absolution i readily understand since these churches disclaim in their confessions of faith any such prerogative for their clergy but i cannot well conceive why a protestant episcopalian should repudiate the pardoning power which is plainly asserted in his standard prayer book whenever an episcopalian bishop imposes hands on candidates for the ministry he employs the following words which are found in the book of common prayer receive the holy ghost for the office and work of a priest in the church of god now committed unto thee by the imposition of our hands whose sins thou dost forgive they are forgiven and whose sins thou dost retain they are retained if these words do not mean that the minister receives by the imposition of the bishop's hands the power of forgiving sin they mean nothing at all when the bishop pronounces this sentence either he intends to convey this power of absolution or he does not if he intended to confer this power he could not employ more clear and precise language to express his idea if he did not intend to confer this power then his language is calculated to mislead just imagine that prelate addressing a candidate for holy orders in the morning with the words whose sins thou dost forgive they are forgiven and after divine service saying to the young minister remember sir you have no power to forgive sins the words of ordination are a mere figure of speech when a catholic bishop ordains priests he uses the precise words which i have quoted because the book of common prayer borrows them from our pontifical but he means exactly what he says namely that the priest receives through the ministration of the bishop the power of forgiving sins to sum up we have seen that the sacrament of penance and absolution by the priest is taught in scripture proclaimed by the fathers upheld not only by roman catholics throughout the world but also by all the schismatic christians of the east it is inculcated in those old and genuine editions of the book of common prayer which have not been enervated by being subjected to the pruning knife in this country and the same practice is encouraged by an influential portion of the protestant episcopal church in england and i will add also in the united states again some object to priestly absolution on the assumption that the exercise of such a function would be a usurpation of an incommunicable prerogative of god who alone can forgive sins this was precisely the language addressed by the scribes to our saviour they exclaimed he blasphemeth who can forgive sins but god only my answer therefore will be equally applicable to old and modern objectors it is not blasphemy for a priest to claim the power of forgiving sins since he acts as the delegate of the most high it would indeed be blasphemous if a priest pretended to absolve in his own name and by virtue of his own authority but when the priest absolves the penitent sinner he acts in the name and by the express authority of jesus christ for he says i absolve thee in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy ghost let it be understood once for all that the priest arrogates to himself no divine powers he is but a feeble voice it is the holy spirit that operates sanctity in the soul of the penitent not a few protestant episcopalians i believe still admit that original sin is washed away in the sacrament of baptism if the minister is not guilty of blasphemy in being the instrument of god's mercy in forgiving sins by baptism how can a priest blaspheme in being the instrument of divine mercy in absolving sinners in the sacrament of penance the same lord who instituted baptism for the remission of original sin establishes penance for the forgiveness of sins committed after baptism 
did not the apostles exercise divine power in raising dead bodies to life and in raising souls that were dead to the life of grace and yet no one but scribes and pharisees accused them of usurping god's powers cannot the almighty without derogating from his own glory give to men in the nineteenth century privileges which he accorded to them in the first age of the church far then from dishonoring we honor god by having recourse to the earthly physician whom he has appointed for us and like the multitude in the gospel we glorify god who hath given such power to men others object thus why confess to a priest when you may confess to god in secret i will retort by asking why do you build fine temples when you can worship god in the great temple of nature why pray in churches when you can pray in your chamber? Why listen to a minister expounding the word of God when you can read the gospel at your leisure at home? You answer that the Lord authorizes these things. So does he authorize priestly absolution. This objection is not new. It is very old. St. Augustine, who lived 1,400 years ago, will answer the objection for me. Let no one, remarks this illustrious doctor, say to himself i do penance to god in private i do it before god is it then in vain that christ has said whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven is it in vain that the keys have been given to the church the question for us is not what god is able to do but what he has willed to do god might have adopted other means for the justification of the sinner as he might have created a world different from the present one but it is our business to take our father at his word and to have recourse with gratitude to the system he has actually established for our justification now we are assured by his infallible word that it is by having recourse to his consecrated ministers that our sins will be forgiven us it is related in the book of kings that naaman the syrian was afflicted with a grievous leprosy which baffled the skill of the physicians of his country he had in his household a jewish maidservant she spoke to her master of the great prophet eliseus who lived in her native country to whom the lord had given the power of performing miracles she besought her master to consult the prophet naaman accordingly set out for the country of israel and begged eliseus to heal him the prophet told him to go and wash seven times in the jordan but naaman instead of doing as he was directed became very angry and said i thought he would have come out to me and touched with his hand the place of the leprosy and healed me are not the abana and the far far rivers of damascus better than all the waters of israel that i may wash in them and be made clean but the servants of naaman remonstrated with him and besought him to comply with the prophet's injunction telling him that the conditions were easy and the jordan was at hand naaman went and washed and was cleansed our opponents like naaman cry out why should you go to a priest a sinner like yourself when secretly in your own room you can approach god the pure fountain of grace to be washed from your sins i answer because jesus christ a prophet and more than a prophet has commanded you to do so the last charge that i will notice is the most serious and the most offensive we are told that private confession is lawless that the conscience soon becomes enfeebled and chained and starved by it and worse and worse that sins are more readily committed if followed by an absolution conveying pardon in other words that the more attached catholics are to the practice of their holy religion the more depraved and corrupt they become or if they remain faithful to god this is not by reason of but in spite of their religious exercises surely this was not the sentiment of the late dr ives once protestant bishop of north carolina and of many other illustrious converts who from the day of their conversion to the hour of their death never failed to receive consolation and strength from the sacred tribunal nor is it the sentiment of rev father lyman a catholic priest of baltimore and brother of the assistant protestant bishop of north carolina nor of the present archbishops of baltimore and philadelphia 
of the bishops of Wilmington, Cleveland, Columbus, and Ogdensburg, and a host of others, both of the Protestant clergy and laity, who within the last fifty years have entered the Catholic Church. If we compare the Protestant and Catholic systems for the forgiveness of sins, the Catholic system will not suffer by the comparison. According to the Protestant system, repentance is necessary and sufficient for justification. The Catholic system also requires repentance on the part of the sinner as an indispensable prerequisite for the forgiveness of sin. But it requires much more than this. Before the penitent receives absolution, he must carefully examine his conscience and confess his sins according to their number and kind. He is obliged to have a firm purpose of amendment, to promise restitution, if he has defrauded his neighbor to repair any injury done his neighbor's character, to be reconciled with his enemies, and to avoid the occasions of sin. Do not these obligations afford a better safeguard against a relapse into sin than a simple internal act of contrition? Many most eminent Protestants, and even infidel writers, who were conversant with the practical workings of the confessional in the countries in which they lived, bear testimony to the moral reformation produced by it. The famous German philosopher Leibniz admits that it is a great benefit conferred on men by God that he left in his church the power of forgiving sins. Voltaire, certainly no friend of Christianity, avows that there is not perhaps a more useful institution than confession. Rousseau, not less hostile to the church, exclaims, how many restitutions and reparations does not confession cause among Catholics? The Protestant authorities of Nuremberg in Germany, shortly after the establishment of the Reformed doctrines in that city, were so much alarmed by the laxity of morals which succeeded after the abolition of confession that they petitioned their Emperor Charles V to have it restored. It is a favorite custom for the adversaries of the Catholic Church to refer to the alleged loose morals prevailing in France and in other Catholic countries as a proof of the inferior standard of Catholic morality. This is a safe and, at the same time, not the most honorable mode of attack, as the people of those nations are too far off to defend themselves. For my part, I have spent a considerable time in various portions of France, and more edifying Christians I have never witnessed than those I met in that country. For six years I had for my professors French priests, whose exemplary lives were a daily sermon to all around them. I submit that the cosmopolitan city of Paris, waiving for the present the enormities of which it is accused, is not to be adduced as a fair criterion of French morality. Let us stay at home and judge of Catholic morals by the examples furnished under our eyes. The influence of the confessional has been fairly tested in this country since the foundation of our republic. Are practical Catholics enfeebled in conscience? Is their conscience chained and starved? Has the absolution they received whetted their appetites for more sin? Are they monsters of immorality? I think that an enlightened Protestant public will pronounce a contrary verdict. I feel that I can say with truth that Catholics who frequent the confessional are generally virtuous in their private lives, just and honorable in their dealings with others, and that they cultivate charity and goodwill toward their fellow citizens. It will not do to reply that it is the system, not the individual, that is attacked. How can we judge of a system unless by its practical working in the individual? By their fruits ye shall know them, says our Savior. Vices, indeed, we have to deplore among certain classes of our people, which are often superintended by their migratory habits and irregular mode of life. But they are commonly sins of frailty, and these are not the persons that are accustomed to approach the confessional. If they did, their lives would be very different from what they are. The best of us, alas, are not what we ought to be, considering the graces we receive. But if you seek for canting hypocrites or colossal defaulters, or perpetrators of well-laid schemes of forgery, or of systematic licentiousness, or premeditated violence, 
you will seek for such in vain among those who frequent the confessional there is another objection which is difficult to kill it dies hard and like banquo's ghost it will not down if you drive it from the city it will fly to the town if you expel it from the town it will take refuge in the village if you eject it from the village it will hide itself like some noxious animal in some desert place until it makes its rounds again i allude to the charge that a price has to be paid for remitting sins you have only say these slanders to pay a certain toll at the confessional gate and you can pass the biggest load of sin it is hard to treat these objections seriously i have been hearing confessions for fifty years and of all who have come to me not one has had the sense of duty to offer me any compensation for absolving them and this is true of every priest with whom i have been acquainted the truth is the priest who would solicit a fee for absolution knows that he would be guilty of simony and would be liable to suspension but we are told that confession is an intolerable yoke that it makes its votaries the slaves of the priests before answering this objection let me call your attention to the inconsistency of our adversaries who blow hot and cold in the same breath they denounce confession as being too hard a remedy for sin and condemn it at the same time as being a smooth road to heaven in one sentence they style it a bed of roses in the next a bed of thorns in a preceding objection it was charged that the votaries of confession had no moral constraint at all now it is said that their conscience is bound in chains of slavery surely confession cannot be hard and easy at the same time i have already refuted i trust the former charge i shall now answer the second i am not aware in what sense our people are less independent than those of any other class of the community the only restraint as far as i know imposed on catholics by their priests is the yoke of the gospel and to this restraint no christian ought to object in my estimation no body of christians enjoys more apostolic freedom than those of the catholic communion because they are guided in their conduct not by the ever-changing ipse dixit of any minister but by the unchangeable teachings of the church of jesus christ but if to love their priest to reverence his sacred character to obey his voice as the voice of god if to be willing to make any sacrifice for their spiritual father if i say you call this slavery then our catholic people are slaves indeed and what is more they are content with their chains even our manuals of devotion have not escaped the lash of wanton criticism they have excited the pious horror of some modern pharisees because they contain a table of sins for the use of those preparing for confession the same flower that furnishes honey to the bee supplies poison to the wasp and in like manner the same book that gives only the honey of consolation to the devout reader has nothing but moral poison for those that search its pages for nothing else how can any one object to the table of sins in our prayer books and consistently advocate the circulation of the bible which contains incomparably plainer and more palpable allusions to gross crimes than are found in our books of devotion let us not forget the adage ani soit qui mal y pense i may be permitted in concluding this subject to add the testimony of my own experience on the beneficent influence of the confessional for like my brethren in the ministry i am in the language of dryden one bred apart from worldly noise to study souls their cures and their diseases since the time of my ordination up to the present hour i have been accustomed to hear confessions almost every day i have therefore had a fair opportunity of ascertaining the value of the system the impressions forced upon my mind far from being peculiar to myself are shared by every catholic priest throughout the world charged with the care of souls the testimony of ten experienced confessors ought in my estimation to have more weight in enabling men to judge the moral tendencies of the confessional than the gratuitous assertions of a thousand individuals who have no personal experience of it but who draw on their heated imaginations or on the pages of sensational novels for the statements they offer 
My experience is that the confessional is the most powerful lever ever erected by a merciful God for raising men from the mire of sin. It has more weight in withdrawing people from vice than even the pulpit. In public sermons we scatter the seed of the word of God. In the confessional we reap the harvest. In sermons, to use a military phrase, the fire is at random, but in confession it is a dead shot. The words of the priest go home to the heart of the penitent. In a public discourse, the priest addresses all in general, and his words of admonition may be applicable to very few of his hearers. But his words spoken in the confessional are directed exclusively to the penitent, whose heart is open to receive the word of God. The confessor exhorts the penitent according to his spiritual wants, he cautions him against the frequentation of dangerous company and other occasions of sin, or he recommends special practices of piety suited to the penitent's wants. Hence, missionaries are accustomed to estimate the fruit of a mission more by the number of penitents who have approached the sacred tribunal than by the number of persons who have listened to their sermons of all the labors that our sacred ministry imposes on us there is none more arduous and more irksome than that of hearing confessions if i may make a revelation of my own life i deferred receiving holy orders for two years from a sense of the dread responsibility connected with the confessional it is no trifling task to sit for six or eight consecutive hours on a hot summer day listening to stories of sin and sorrow and misery. It is only the consciousness of the immense good he is doing that sustains the confessor in the sacred tribunal. He is one who can have compassion on the ignorant and erring because he himself is also encompassed with infirmity. I have seen the man whose conscience was weighed down by the accumulated sins of twenty winters, upon his face were branded guilt and shame remorse and confusion there he stood by the confessional with downcast countenance ashamed like the publican to look up to heaven he glided into the little mercy seat no human ear will ever learn what there transpired the revelations of the confessional are a sealed book but during the brief time spent in the confessional a resurrection occurred more miraculous than the raising of lazarus from the tomb it was the resurrection from the grave of sin of a soul that had long lain worm-eaten during those precious moments a ray from heaven dispelled the darkness and gloom from that self-accuser's mind the genial warmth of the holy spirit melted his frozen heart and the purifying influence of the same spirit that came upon the apostles like a mighty wind from heaven scattered the poisonous atmosphere in which he lived and filled his soul with divine grace when he came out there was quickness in his step joy on his countenance a new light in his eye had you asked him why he would have answered because i was lost and am found having been dead i am come to life again End of chapter 26, part 1. Chapter 26, part 2 of The Faith of Our Fathers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org the faith of our fathers by james cardinal gibbons chapter twenty six the sacrament of penance part two on the relative morality of catholic and protestant countries it has been gravely asserted that the confession of sin and the doctrine of absolution tend to the spread of crime and immorality statistics are produced to show that murder and illegitimate births are largely in excess in countries under catholic influence and that this prevalence of wickedness is the result of confession and easy absolution if our system of absolving only those who both repent and confess leads to laxity of morals how much more must the protestant system which omits that which is most humiliating 
and admits the sinner to reconciliation on condition of mere interior dispositions as all our catechisms teach and as every catholic knows there is no pardon of sin without sorrow of heart and purpose of amendment it is a great mistake to suppose that the most ignorant catholic believes he can procure the pardon of his sins by simply confessing them without being truly sorry for them the estimate which so many protestants set on the virtue of even the lower classes of roman catholics is clearly enough evinced in the preference which they constantly manifest in their employment of catholics practical catholics catholics who go to confession i maintain therefore that confession far from being an incentive to sin as our adversaries have the hardihood to affirm is a most powerful check on the depravity of men and a most effectual preventative of their criminal excesses but is it true that crimes especially murder and illegitimacy are more prevalent in catholic than in protestant countries i utterly deny the assertion and also appeal to statistics in support of the denial whence do our opponents derive their information forsooth from rev m hobart seymour's knights among romanists and similar absolutely unreliable compilations the false statements of which have been again and again refuted rev mr seymour gives the following list of the number of murders in england france and ireland ireland nineteen homicides to the million of inhabitants france thirty one england four the reader of the above might well draw back in astonishment and exclaim truly a moral atmosphere of england but how do these statements compare with the official records which i submit to the unprejudiced reader recent returns from the handbook for france and tom's official directory for england and ireland eighteen sixty nine are as follows eighteen sixty four france nine convictions and sentences to death five executions eighteen sixty seven england and wales twenty seven convictions and sentences ten executions ireland three convictions and sentences zero executions these figures which are from authenticated sources do not bear out our accusers in their assertion that murders are more prevalent in catholic than in protestant countries the statistics of this crime are limited or they are not in very general circulation but we have more extensive information in reference to the other great crimes which it is charged prevails to a much more alarming extent in countries under catholic influence namely illegitimacy here again we shall meet statistics with counter statistics to refute unjust declarations we do not wish to be understood as advocating the immaculateness of catholic communities we frankly admit and heartily deplore the disorders which catholics commit but we deny that they are worse than their protestant neighbors and still more emphatically do we deny that the church is responsible for their disorders the journal of the statistical society of london of the years eighteen sixty sixty two sixty five sixty seven gives the number of illegitimate births in england and wales as six and one half in every hundred whilst in the catholic kingdom of sardinia the number is slightly over two in the hundred and in ireland three in every hundred if the test of illegitimacy is a correct index of the morality of a country how refreshing to pass from protestant england across to catholic ireland or to the continent and visit sardinia the moral atmosphere of these countries compared with england must be as a healthful breeze to a pestilential marsh that we may see at a glance the real condition of european countries in reference to the species of crime i will here insert as correct a table as can be made from the latest reports see catholic world volume eleven page one twelve percentage of illegitimacy in protestant and catholic countries of europe protestant countries holland four per cent switzerland five point five per cent protestant prussia ten per cent england and wales six point five per cent sweden and norway nine point six per cent 
Scotland, 10.1%. Denmark, 11%. German states, 14.8%. Württemberg, 16.4%. Catholic countries. Italy, 5.1%. Spain, 5.5%. France, 7.2%. Catholic Prussia, 6.5%. Belgium, 7.2%. Austria, 11.1%. Ireland, 3%. We have divided Prussia into Protestant and Catholic because statistics are kept according to the religious creed of the people, and we discover that whilst among the Catholic population of the empire there is but a percentage of six and a half of illegitimate births, among the Protestants it runs up to 10%. And the same remark is applicable to Ireland. The Scotman whose statements are based on the report of the British Registrar-General, publishes the following statistics. The proportion of illegitimate births to the total number of births is in Ireland 3.8%. In England, the proportion is 6.4%. In Scotland, 99 .9. In other words, England is nearly twice and Scotland nearly thrice worse than Ireland. Something worse has to be added from which no consolation can be derived. The proportion of illegitimacy is very unequally distributed over Ireland, and the inequality rather humbling to us as Protestants, and still more as Presbyterians and Scotchmen. Taking Ireland according to the registration divisions, the proportion of illegitimate births varies from 6.2 to 1.3. The division showing this lowest figure is the western, being substantially the province of Connaught, where about 19 twentieths of the population are Celtic and Roman Catholic. The division showing the highest proportion of illegitimacy is the northeastern, which comprises, or almost consists of, the province of Ulster, where the population is almost equally divided between Protestants and Roman Catholics and where the great majority of Protestants are of Scotch blood and of the Presbyterian Church. The sum of the whole matter is that semi-Presbyterian and semi-Scotch Ulster is fully three times more immoral than wholly Popish and wholly Irish Connaught, which corresponds with wonderful accuracy to the more general fact that Scotland as a whole is three times more immoral than Ireland as a whole it is worthy too of notice that in the tabular statement above presented the percentage of illegitimacy in holland and switzerland where there are large catholic minorities is lower than in any other protestant country we have at hand evidences furnished by protestant writers of the hideous immoralities of certain european nations that are more thoroughly protestantized than england itself thus mr lang writes of the 2,714 children born in Stockholm, 1,577 were legitimate, 1,137 illegitimate, making only a balance of 440 chaste mothers out of 2,714, and the proportion of illegitimate to legitimate children not as 1 to 2 and 3 tenths, but as 1 to 1 and a half from a tour of sweden in eighteen thirty eight but we are not disposed to parade these monstrous vices no matter by whom committed we allude to them with feelings of shame not of pleasure and give them a passing notice merely in self-defence against the gratuitous assertions of our adversaries we certainly do not wish to exclude or palliate the evil deeds of catholics who with all the blessed aids which their religion affords ought to be much better than they are yet we will add quoting the words of the catholic world if we are not very much better than our neighbors we are not any worse and are not to be hounded down with the cry of vice and immorality by a set of pharisees who are constantly lauding their own superiority and thanking god they are so much better than we poor catholics end of chapter twenty six part two Chapter 27 of the Faith of Our Fathers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit 
LibriVox.org. Recording by Bill Mosley. The Faith of Our Fathers by James Cardinal Gibbons. Chapter 27 Indulgences. There are few tenets of the Catholic Church so little understood or so grossly misrepresented by her adversaries as her doctrine regarding indulgences. One of the reasons of the popular misapprehension of an indulgence may be ascribed to the change which the meaning of that term has gradually undergone. The term indulgence originally signified favor, remission, or forgiveness. Now it is commonly used in the sense of unlawful gratification and of free scope to the passions. Hence, when some ignorant or prejudiced persons hear of the church granting an indulgence, the idea of license to sin is at once presented to their minds. An indulgence is simply a remission in whole or in part through the superabundant merits of Jesus Christ and his saints of the temporal punishment due to God on account of sin after the guilt and eternal punishment have been remitted. It should be borne in mind that, even after our guilt is removed, there often remains some temporal punishment to be undergone, either in this life or the next, as an expiation to divine sanctity and justice. The Holy Scripture furnishes us with many examples of this truth. Mary, the sister of Moses, was pardoned the sin which she had committed by murmuring against her brother. Nevertheless, God inflicted on her the penalty of leprosy and of seven days separation from the people. Nathan the prophet announced to David that his crimes were forgiven, but that he should suffer many chastisements from the hand of God. That our Lord has given to the church the power of granting indulgences is clearly deduced from the sacred text. To the prince of the apostles he said, quote, Whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound also in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed also in heaven. End quote. And to all the apostles assembled together he made the same solemn declaration. By these words our Savior empowered his church to deliver her children, if properly disposed, from every obstacle that might retard them from the kingdom of heaven. Now there are two impediments that withhold a man from the heavenly kingdom, sin and the temporal punishment incurred by it. And the church, having power to remit the greater obstacle, which is sin, has power also to remove the smaller obstacle, which is the temporal punishment due on account of it. The prerogative of granting indulgence has been exercised by the teachers of the church from the beginning of her existence. St. Paul exercised it in behalf of the incestuous Corinthian, whom he had condemned to a severe penance proportioned to his guilt. Quote, that his spirit might be saved in the day of the Lord, end quote. And having learned afterwards of the Corinthians' fervent contrition, the apostle absolves him from the penance which he had imposed. Quote, to him that is such a one, this rebuke is sufficient, which is given by many, so that contrarywise you should rather pardon and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. And to whom you have pardoned anything, I also. For what I have pardoned, if I have pardoned anything, for your sakes I have done it in the person of Christ. End quote. Here we have all the elements that constitute an indulgence. First, a penance or temporal punishment proportioned to the gravity of the offense, is imposed on the transgressor. Second, the penitent is truly contrite for his crime. Third, this determines the apostle to remit the penalty. Fourth, the apostle considers the relaxation of the penance ratified by Jesus Christ, in whose name it is imparted. We find the bishops of the church after the apostle wielding this same power, 
no one disputes the right which they claim from the very first ages of inflicting canonical penances on grievous criminals who were subjected to long fasts severe abstinences and other mortifications for a period extending from a few days to five or ten years and even to a lifetime according to the gravity of the offence these penalties were in several instances mitigated or cancelled by the church according to her discretion for a society that can inflict a punishment can also remit it our lord gave his church power not only to bind but also to loose this discretionary prerogative was often exercised by the church at the intercession of those who were condemned to martyrdom when the penitents themselves gave strong marks of fervent sorrow as we learn from the writings of tertullian and cyprian the general council of nice and other synods authorized bishops to mitigate or even to remit altogether public penances whenever in their judgment the penitent manifested special marks of repentance now in relaxing the canonical penances or in substituting for them a milder satisfaction the bishops granted what we call an indulgence this sentence of remission on the part of the bishops was valid not only in the sight of the church but also in the sight of god although the church imposes canonical penances no longer god has never ceased to inflict temporal punishment for sin hence indulgences continue to be necessary now if not as substitute for canonical penances at least as a mild and merciful payment of the temporal debt due to god an indulgence is called plenary or partial according as it remits the whole or a part of the temporal punishment due to sin an indulgence for instance of forty days remits before god so much of the temporal punishment as would have been expiated in the primitive church by a canonical penance of forty days although the very name of indulgence is now so repugnant to our dissenting brethren there was a time when the protestant church professed to grant them in the canons of the church of england reference is made to indulgences and to the disposition to be made of the money paid for them from what i have said you may judge for yourself what to think of those who say that an indulgence is the remission of past sins or a license to commit sin granted by the pope as a spiritual compensation to the faithful for pecuniary offerings made him i need not inform you that an indulgence is neither the one nor the other it is not a remission of sin since no one can gain an indulgence until he is already free from sin it is still less a license to commit sin for every catholic child knows that neither priest nor bishop nor pope nor even god himself with all reverence be it said can give license to commit the smallest faults but are not indulgences at variance with the spirit of the gospel since they appear to be a mild and feeble substitute for almsgiving fasts abstinences and other penitential austerities which jesus christ inculcated and practised and which the primitive church enforced the church as every one must know who is acquainted with her history never exempts her children from the obligation of doing works of penance no one can deny that the practices of mortification are more frequent among catholics than among protestants where will you find the evangelical duty of fasting enforced if not from the catholic pulpit it is well known that among the members of the catholic church those who avail themselves of the boon of indulgences are usually her most practical edifying and fervent children their spiritual growth far from being retarded is quickened by the aid of indulgences which are usually accompanied by acts of contrition devotion self-denial and the reception of the sacraments but do what we will we cannot please our opponents if we fast and give alms if we crucify our flesh 
and make pilgrimages and perform other works of penance we are accused of clinging to the rags of dead works instead of holding on to jesus by faith if on the other hand we enrich our souls with the treasures of indulgences we are charged with relying on the vicarious merits of others and of lightening too much the salutary burden of the cross but how can protestants consistently find fault with the church for mitigating the austerities of penance since their own fundamental principle rests on faith alone without good works but have not indulgences been the occasion of many abuses at various times particularly in the sixteenth century i will not deny that indulgences have been abused but are not the most sacred things liable to be perverted this is a proper place to refer briefly to the bull of pope leo x proclaiming the indulgence which afforded luther a pretext for his apostasy leo determined to bring to completion the magnificent church of st peter commenced by his predecessor julius the second with that view he issued a bull promulgating an indulgence to such as would contribute some voluntary offering toward the erection of the grand cathedral those however who contributed nothing shared equally in the treasury of the church provided they complied with the essential conditions for gaining the indulgence the only indispensable conditions enjoined by the papal bull were sincere repentance and confession of sins d'aubigne admits this truth though in a faltering manner when he observes that quote, in the pope's bull something was said of the repentance of the heart and the confession of the lips the applicants for the indulgence knew well that no matter how munificent were their offerings these would avail them nothing without true contrition of heart no traffic or sale of indulgences was consequently authorized or countenanced by the head of the church since the contributions were understood to be voluntary in order to check any sordid love of gain in those charged with preaching the indulgence quote, the hand that delivered the indulgence end quote, as d'aubigne testifies quote, could not receive the money that was forbidden under the severest penalties end quote. wherein then was the conduct of the pope reprehensible certainly not in soliciting the donations of the faithful for the purpose of erecting a temple of worship a temple which today stands unrivaled in majesty and beauty but thou of temples old or altars new standest alone with nothing like to thee worthiest of god the holy and the true since zion's desolation when that he forsook his former city what could be of earthly structures in his honor piled of a sublimer aspect majesty power glory strength and beauty all are aisled in this eternal art of worship undefiled if moses was justified in appealing to the hebrew people in the old law for offerings to adorn the tabernacle why should not the pope be equally justified in appealing for similar offerings to the christian people among whom he exercises supreme authority as moses did among the israelites nor did the pope exceed his legitimate powers in promising to the pious donors spiritual favors in exchange for their donations for if our sins can be redeemed by alms to the poor as the scripture tells us why not as well by offerings in the cause of religion when protestant ministers appeal to their congregations in behalf of themselves and their children or in support of a church they do not fail to hold out to their hearers spiritual blessings in reward for their gifts it is not long since a methodist parson of new york addressed these sacred words to cornelius vanderbilt the millionaire 
who had endowed a methodist college Quote, cornelius thy prayer is heard and thy alms are had in remembrance in the sight of god End quote. the minister is more indulgent than even the pope to whom were given the keys of the kingdom of heaven for the minister declares cornelius absolved without the preliminary of confession or contrition while even according to d'albigny the inflexible pope insisted on the necessity of quote, repentance of the heart and confession of the lips end quote, before the donor's offering could avail him to salvation john tetzel a dominican monk who had been appointed the chief preacher to announce the indulgence in germany was accused by luther of exceeding his powers by making them subservient to his own private ends tetzel's conduct was disavowed and condemned by the representative of the holy see the council of trent held some time after took effectual measures to put a stop to all irregularities regarding indulgences and issued the following decree quote, wishing to correct and amend the abuses which have crept into them and on occasion of which this signal name of indulgences is blasphemed by heretics the holy synod enjoins in general by the present decree that all wicked traffic for obtaining them which has been the fruitful source of many abuses among the christian people should be wholly abolished End of chapter 27 Recording by Bill Mosley, Frelsberg, Texas, USA Chapter 28 The Faith of Our Fathers This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Faith of Our Fathers by James Cardinal Gibbons Chapter 28 Extreme Unction Extreme Unction is a sacrament in which the sick, by the anointing with holy oil and the prayers of the priests, receive spiritual succor and even corporal strength, when such is conducive to their salvation. This unction is called extreme, because it is usually the last of the holy unctions administered by the church the apostle st james clearly refers to this sacrament and points out its efficacy in the following words is any man sick among you let him bring in the priests of the church and let them pray over him anointing him with oil in the name of the lord and the prayer of the faith shall save the sick man and the lord shall raise him up and if he be in sins they shall be forgiven him several of the ancient fathers allude to this sacrament origen third century writes there is also a remission of sins through penitence when the sinner is not ashamed to declare his sin to the priests of the lord and to seek a remedy wherein that also is fulfilled which the apostle james saith but if any be sick among you let him call in the priests of the church, and let them impose hands on him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. St. Chrysotom, 4th century, says, Not only when they, the priests, regenerate us, but they also have power to forgive sins committed afterward. For he says, Is any man sick among you? Let him call in the priests of the church, and let them pray over him anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Pope Innocent I, 5th century, in a letter to a bishop named Decentius, after quoting the words of St. James, proceeds, These words, there is no doubt, ought to be understood of the faithful, who are sick, who can be anointed with holy oil, which, having been prepared by a bishop, may be used not only for priests, but for all Christians. The sacramentary, or ancient Roman ritual, revised by Pope St. Gregory in the 6th century, prescribes the blessing of oil by the bishop, and the prayers to be recited in the anointing of the sick. The Venerable Bede of England, who lived in the 8th century, referring to the words of St. James, writes, 
the custom of the church requires that the sick be anointed by the priest with consecrated oil and be sanctified by the prayer which accompanies it the greek church which separated from the roman catholic church in the ninth century says in its profession of faith the seventh sacrament is extreme unction prescribed by christ for after he had begun to send his disciples two and two mark six seven through thirteen they anointed and healed many which unction the church has since maintained by pious usage as we learn from the epistle of st james is any man sick among you etc the fruits proper to this sacrament as st james declares are the remission of sins health of soul strength in fine of body but though it does not always produce this last result it always at least restores the soul to a better state by the forgiveness of sins this is precisely the catholic teaching on this subject all the other oriental churches some of which separated from rome in the fifth century likewise enumerate extreme unction among their sacraments such identity of doctrine proclaimed during so many ages by churches so wide apart can have no other than apostolic origin the eminent protestant leibnitz makes this candid admission there is no room for much discussion regarding the unction of the sick it is supported by the words of the scripture the interpretation of the church in which pious and catholic men safely confide nor do i see what any one can find reprehensible in this practice which the church accepts protestants though professing to be guided by the holy scripture entirely disregard the admonition of st james luther acted with more consistency finding that the injunction of the apostle was too plain to be explained away by subtlety of words he boldly rejected the entire epistle which he contemptuously styled a letter of straw it is sad to think that our separated brethren discard this consoling instrument of grace though pressed upon them by an apostle of jesus christ for surely a spiritual medicine which diminishes the terrors of death comforts the dying christian fortifies the soul in its final struggle and purifies it for its passage from time to eternity should be gratefully and eagerly made use of especially when prescribed by an inspired physician end of chapter twenty eight Chapter 29 of The Faith of Our Fathers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Faith of Our Fathers by James Cardinal Gibbons. Chapter 29 The Priesthood. The apostles were clothed with the powers of Jesus Christ. The priest, as the successor of the apostles, is clothed with their power. This fact reveals to us the eminent dignity of the priestly character. The exalted dignity of the priest is derived not from the personal merits for which he may be conspicuous, but from the sublime functions which he is charged to perform. To the carnal eye the priest looks like other men, but to the eye of faith he is exalted above the angels, because he exercises powers not given even to angels the priest is the ambassador of god appointed to vindicate his honor and to proclaim his glory we are ambassadors for christ says the apostle god as it were exhorting by us if it is esteemed a great privilege for a citizen of the united states to represent our country in any of the courts of europe how much greater is the prerogative to represent the court of heaven among the nations of the earth as the Father hath sent me, says our Lord to his apostles, I also send you. Going therefore, teach ye all nations, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you all days, even to the consummation of the world. The jurisdiction of earthly representatives is limited, but the authority of the ministers of God extends over the whole earth, go ye into the whole world and preach the gospel says christ to every creature 
not only does jesus empower his ministers to preach in his name but he commands their hearers to listen and obey whosoever will not receive you nor hear your words going forth from that house or city shake off the dust from your feet amen i say to you it shall be more tolerable for the land of sodom and gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city he that heareth you heareth me and he that despiseth you despiseth me and he that despiseth me despiseth him that sent me god requires not only that his gospel should be heard with reverence but that the persons of his apostles should be honored as no greater insult can be offered to a nation than to insult its representative at a foreign court so no greater injury can be offered to our lord than to do violence to his representatives the priests of his church touch not my anointed and do no evil to my prophets god avenged the crime of two and forty boys who mocked the prophet eliseus by sending wild beasts to tear them in pieces the frightful death of maria monk the calumniator of consecrated priests and virgins who ended her life a drunken maniac on blackwell's island proves that our religious institutions are not to be mocked with impunity when an ambassador is accredited from this country to a foreign court he is honored with the confidence of the president from whom he receives private instructions so does jesus honor his ambassadors with his friendship and communicate to them the secrets of heaven i will not now call you servants for the servant knoweth not what his lord doeth but i have called you friends because all things whatsoever i have heard of my father i have made known to you what a privilege to be the herald of god's law to the nations of the earth how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings and that preacheth peace of him that showeth forth good that preacheth salvation that saith to sion thy god shall reign how cherished a favor to be the bearer of the olive branch of peace to a world deluged by sin to be appointed by heaven to proclaim a gospel which brings glory to god and peace to men that gospel which strengthens the weak converts the sinner reconciles enemies consoles the afflicted heart and holds out to all the hope of eternal salvation i have often reflected on a remark made to me by senator bayard of delaware you of the clergy he said have a great advantage as public speakers over us political men you enjoy the confidence of your hearers you can speak as long as you please you can admonish and rebuke as much as you please without any fear of contradiction while we are constantly liable to interruption oh what a tremendous power is wielded by the catholic preacher hundreds of souls are hanging on his words hundreds are sustained by him in spiritual life and leave the church depending on him whether they go forth fortified with the bread of life or famished and disappointed i can say of every priest what simeon said of our lord this man is set for the fall and the resurrection of many in israel not only are priests the ambassadors of god but they are also the dispensers of his graces and the almoners of his mercy let a man so regard us says the apostle as ministers of christ and dispensers of the mysteries of god how can he be called a dispenser of god's mysteries whose labors are confined to preaching but he is truly a dispenser of divine mysteries who distributes to the faithful the sacraments the mysterious symbols and efficient causes of grace as st john chrysostom observes it was not to angels or archangels but to the priests of the new law that christ said whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound also in heaven and whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed also in heaven to them alone he gave the power to forgive sin saying whose sins you shall forgive they are forgiven to them alone he gave the power of consecrating his body and blood and dispensing the same to the faithful he has empowered the priests of the new law to impart the grace of regeneration in baptism he has assigned to them the solemn duty of preparing the dying christian for his final journey to eternity is any man sick among you 
let him bring in the priests of the church and let them pray over him anointing him with oil in the name of the lord as far as heaven is above earth as eternity is above time and the soul is above the body so far are the prerogatives vested in god's ministers higher than those of any earthly potentate an earthly prince can cast into prison or release therefrom but his power is over the body he cannot penetrate into the sanctuary of the soul whereas the minister of god can release the soul from the prison of sin and restore it to the liberty of a child of god to sum up in a few brief sentences the titles of a catholic priest he is a king reigning not over unwilling subjects but over the hearts and affections of his people his spiritual children pay him not only the tribute of their money but also the tribute of their love which royalty can neither purchase nor exact he is a shepherd because he leads his flock into the delicious pastures of the sacraments and shelters them from the wolves that lie in wait for their souls he is a father because he breaks the bread of life to his spiritual children whom he has begotten in christ jesus through the gospel he is a judge whose office it is to pass sentence of pardon on self-accusing criminals he is a physician because he heals their souls from the loathsome distempers of sin st john in his apocalypse represents the church under the figure of a city i saw the holy city the new jerusalem coming down from heaven from god prepared as a bride adorned for her husband our saviour is the architect and founder of this celestial city the apostles are its foundation the faithful are the living stones of the edifice the anointed ministers of the lord are the workmen chosen to adjust and polish these stones that they may reflect the beauty and glory of the sun of justice that perpetually illumines this city the priests are engaged in adorning the interior of the heavenly jerusalem by enriching with virtue the precious souls entrusted to their charge god gave some indeed apostles and some prophets and others evangelists and others pastors and doctors for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry for the building up of the body of christ which is his church what an honor is this to the priest of the new law surely god hath not done alike to every nation and his judgments he hath not made manifest to them with how much more force may we apply to the successors of the apostles the words which god spoke to the priests of the old law hear ye sons of levi it is a small thing unto you that the god of israel hath separated you from all the people and joined you to himself that he should serve him in the service of the tabernacle and should stand before the congregation of the people and minister unto him our lord affectionately puts this question three times to peter simon lovest thou me and three times peter answers him lord thou knowest that i love thee what proof of love then does jesus exact of peter does he say if thou lovest me chastise thy body by fasting and stripes prophesy work miracles lay down thy life for me no but feed my lambs feed my sheep this was to be the closest bond of peter's devotion to his master and of the master's affection for his disciple and our lord declares that the reward of his disciples would be commensurate with the dignity of their ministry behold says peter we have left all things and have followed thee what therefore shall we have and jesus said to them amen i say to you that you who have followed me in the regeneration when the son of man shall sit on the seat of his majesty you shall also sit on twelve seats judging the twelve tribes of israel and immediately after he adds that the worthy successors of the apostles shall share in their felicity and every one that hath left house or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my name's sake shall receive a hundredfold and shall possess life everlasting i know that there are many in our days who deny that priests possess any spiritual power as if god could not communicate such power to men 
I understand why atheists and rationalists who reject all revelation should deny all supernatural authority to the ministers of God, but that professing Christians who accept the testimony of Scripture should share in this unbelief passes my comprehension. Has not the Almighty, in numberless instances recorded in Holy Writ, made man the instrument of his power? Did not Moses convert the rivers of Egypt into blood? did he not cause water to issue from the barren rock did not the prophets predict future events did not the sun stand still in the heavens at the command of joshua did not eliseus the prophet raise the dead to life why do we believe all these prodigies because the scriptures record them does not the same word of god declare that the apostles received power to confer the holy ghost by the imposition of hands to forgive sins to consecrate the body and blood of christ etc is not the new testament as worthy of belief as the old has not jesus christ solemnly promised to be always with the ministers of his church even to the consummation of the world strengthening them to repeat those miracles of mercy that were wrought by his first disciples can the god of truth be unfaithful to his promises is he not as strong and merciful now as he was in the days of the prophets and apostles and are not we as much in need of the holy ghost as the primitive christians were if god could make feeble men the ministers of his mercy then why not now but should a priest consider himself greater than other men because he exercises such authority far from it he ought to humble himself beneath others when he reflects to what weak hands god assigns power so tremendous he should remember what our saviour said to the seventy-two disciples who returning with joy from their first mission cried out to him lord even the devils are subject to us in thy name but jesus checked their vainglory saying i saw satan like lightning fall from heaven behold i have given you power but rejoice not in this that spirits are subject to you but rejoice in this that your names are written in heaven the priest does not forget that the most severe judgment shall be for them that bear rule and that judgment should begin at the house of god the words of the apostle are present to his mind what hast thou that thou hast not received and if thou hast received why dost thou glory as if thou hadst not received it as well might the vessel that is filled with precious liquor boast of being superior to the vessel that is filled with water the priest knows full well that the powers he has received from god are given to him not to feed his own vanity but to enrich the hearts of the faithful and that though instrumental in pointing out to others the way to heaven he himself unless adorned with personal virtues will become a reprobate like those unhappy priests of jerusalem who directed the magi to jesus in bethlehem but did not go thither themselves i have planted says the apostle apollo watered but god gave the increase therefore neither he that planteth is anything nor he that watereth but god that giveth the increase we perform the outward ceremony god alone supplies the grace the obligations of the minister of god are therefore commensurate with his exalted dignity the priest is required to be a man of profound learning and of solid piety the lips of the priest shall keep knowledge and they the people shall seek the law at his mouth the lord denounces the priests of the old law because they neglected to study the sacred sciences because thou hast rejected knowledge i will reject thee that thou shalt not do the office of priesthood for me and thou hast forgotten the law of thy god i will also forget thy children to you says our lord to his apostles it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of god to the rest in parables the priests of the new law like the apostles are the custodians of the mysteries of religion now we know that the knowledge of god's kingdom is not imparted to us by inspiration or revelation christ does not personally teach us as he taught his apostles it is by hard study that the knowledge of his law is acquired by us 
He does not lift us up on angels' wings to the spiritual Parnassus. It is only by the royal road of earnest labor that we can attain those heights which will enable us to contemplate the kingdom of heaven and describe it to others. As physician of the soul, he must be conversant with its various distempers and must know what remedy is to be applied in each particular case. If society justly holds the unskillful physician responsible for the fatal consequences of his malpractice, surely God will call to a strict account the spiritual physician who, through criminal ignorance, prescribes injudicious remedies to the souls of the patients committed to his charge. As judge of souls, he must know when to bind and when to loose, when to defer and when to pronounce sentence of absolution. If nothing is so disastrous to the Republic as an incompetent judge, whose decisions, though involving life and death, are rendered at haphazard and not in accordance with the merits of the case, so nothing is more detrimental to the Christian commonwealth than an ignorant priesthood, whose decisions injuriously affect the salvation of souls. The advocate in our courts of justice feels bound in conscience and in honor to study the case of his client with the utmost diligence and to defend him before the jury with all the eloquence he can muster and yet the suit may not involve more than a brief imprisonment or even a lifetime fine but the priest like moses stands before god to intercede for his people and before the people to advocate the cause of god he not only ascends daily the altar to plead for the people and to cry out with the prophet spare o lord spare thy people and give not thy inheritance to reproach but every sunday he mounts the pulpit to vindicate the claims which god has on his subjects certainly if an attorney is bound to study his client's cause before he defends it no matter how trifling the issue how much more imperative is the obligation of the priest to study well his case when he reflects that an immortal soul is on trial and before men who are often the worst enemies of their own soul he has to convince the people that the narrow road which their inclinations abhor is to be followed and that the broad road which their self-love and their passions tend to pursue is to be abandoned Conviction in this case requires rare tact as well as eloquence and learning. But the minister of religion has to defend the soul not only against the corruptions of the heart, but also against those doctrinal errors that are daily springing up in every direction and which are plausibly preached by false teachers who bring to their support the most specious arguments couched in the most attractive language. To refute these errors often requires the most consummate skill and the profound knowledge of history and the solely scripture. It is no wonder, then, that the church insists that her clergy be educated men. Hence, our ecclesiastical students are usually obliged to devote from ten to fourteen years to the diligent study of the modern and ancient languages, of history and philosophy, of the great science of theology, and holy scripture before they are elevated to the sacred ministry it is true indeed that owing to the rapidly increasing demand for clergy in the united states our bishops have hitherto been sometimes compelled to abridge the course of studies of the candidates for the ministry but now that the church is more thoroughly organized and that seminaries are multiplied among us they are happily enabled to extend to their young levites the advantages of a full term of literary and theological training if the priest should be eminent for his learning he should be still more conspicuous for his virtues for he is expected to preach more by example than by precept if in the old law god charged his priests with the admonition be sanctified ye that carry the vessels of the lord how much more strictly is holiness of life enjoined on the priests of the new dispensation who not only touch the sacred vessels but drink from them the precious blood of the lord purer says st chrysostom than any solar ray should that hand be which divides that flesh that mouth which is filled with spiritual fire 
that tongue which is purpled with that most awful blood in order to foster in us the spirit of personal piety we are constantly admonished by the church to be men of prayer the priest should be like those angels whom jacob saw in a vision ascending to heaven and descending therefrom on the mystical ladder he is expected to ascend by prayer and to descend by preaching he ascends to heaven to receive light from god he descends to communicate that light to his hearers he ascends to draw at the fountain of divine grace he descends to diffuse those living waters among the faithful that their hearts may be refreshed he ascends to light his torch at the ever-burning furnace of divine love he descends to communicate the flame to the souls of his people the church indeed considers prayer so indispensable to her clergy that besides the voluntary exercises of piety which their private devotion may suggest she requires them to devote at least an hour each day to the recitation of the divine office which chiefly consists of the psalms and other portions of holy scripture the homilies of the early fathers and prayers of marvellous force and unction End of chapter 29chapter thirty of the faith of our fathers this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by jadopi the faith of our fathers by james cardinal gibbons chapter thirty celibacy of the clergy the church requires her priests to be pure in body as well as in soul and to present their bodies a living victim, holy, well-pleasing unto God. Our Savior and His Apostles, though recognizing matrimony as a holy state, have proclaimed the superior merits of voluntary continency, particularly for those who consecrate their lives to the sacred ministry. There are eunuchs who have made themselves such for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He who can take it, let him take it. Our Lord evidently recommends here the state of celibacy to such as feel themselves called to embrace it, in order to attain greater perfection. St. Paul gives the reason why our Savior declares continency to be a more suitable state for his ministers than that of matrimony. He who is unmarried careth for the things of the Lord, how he may please God. But he who is married is solicitous about the things of the world, how he may please his wife, and he is divided. Jesus Christ manifestly showed his predilection for virginity, not only by always remaining a virgin, but by selecting a virgin mother and a virgin precursor in the person of St. John the Baptist, and by exhibiting a special affection for John the Evangelist, because, as St. Augustine testifies, that apostle was chosen a virgin, and such he always remained not only did our lord thus manifest while on earth a marked predilection for virgins but he exhibits the same preference for them in heaven for the hundred and forty four thousand who are chosen to sing the new canticle and who follow the lamb whithersoever he goeth are all virgins as st john testifies apocalypse chapter fourteen the apostle of the gentiles assures us that he led a single life and he commends that state to others. I say to the unmarried and to the widows, it is good for them if they so continue, even as I. There is no evidence from Scripture that any of the apostles were married except St. Peter. St. Jerome says that if any were married, they certainly separated from their wives after they were called to the apostolate. Even St. Peter, after his vocation, did not continue with his wife, as may be inferred from his own words. Behold, we have left all things and followed thee. Among all things must be reckoned the fellowship of his wife, for he could hardly say with truth that he had left all things if he had not left his wife. Our Savior immediately after enumerates the wife among those cherished objects, the renunciation of which, for his sake, will have its reward. St. Paul declares that, 
A bishop must be sober, just, holy, continent. And writing to Timothy, whom he had consecrated bishop, he says, Be thou an example to the faithful, in charity, in faith, in chastity. In another place he enumerates chastity among the virtues that should adorn the Christian minister. In all things let us exhibit ourselves as the ministers of God in much patience, in chastity. Although celibacy is not expressly enforced by our Savior, it is, however, commended so strongly by himself and his apostles, both by word and example, that the Church felt it her duty to lay it down as a law. The discipline of the Church has been exerted from the beginning in prohibiting priests to marry after their ordination. St. Jerome observes that bishops, priests, and deacons are chosen from virgins or widowers, or at least they remain perpetually chaste after being elevated to the priesthood. To Jovinian he writes, You certainly admit that he cannot remain a bishop who begets children in the episcopacy, for, if convicted, he will not be esteemed as a husband, but condemned as an adulterer. Again he says, What will the churches of the East, of Egypt, and of the Apostolic See do, which adopt their clergy from among virgins, or if they have wives, they cease to live as married men? St. Epiphanius declares that, he who leads a married life is not admitted by the church to the order of deacon, priest, bishop, or subdeacon. In the primitive days of the church, owing to the scarcity of vocations among the unmarried, married men were admitted to sacred orders, but they were enjoined, as we learned from various canons, to live separated from their wives after their ordination. This discipline, it is true, was relaxed to some extent in favor of a portion of the clergy of the Oriental Church, who were permitted to live with their wives if they happened to espouse them before ordination. But, like the priests of the Western Church, the Eastern clergy were forbidden to contract marriage after their ordination. It is important also to observe that the unmarried clergy of the East are held in much higher esteem by the people than the married priests. It cannot, indeed, be denied that at certain epochs of the Church's history, especially in periods of disordered society, there were too many instances of the violation of clerical celibacy. But the repeated violations of a law are no evidence of its non-existence. Whenever the voice of the Church could be heard, it always spoke in vindication of the laws of priestly chastity. Let me now call your attention to the propriety and advantages of clerical celibacy. First, the priest is the representative of Jesus Christ. He continues the work begun by his divine master. It is his duty to preach the word, to administer the sacraments, and above all to consecrate the body and blood of Christ, and to distribute the same to the faithful. Is it not becoming that a chaste lord should be served by chaste ministers? If the Jewish priests, while engaged in their turn in offering the sacrifice of animals in the temple, were obliged to keep apart from their wives, should not the priests of the new lamb, who offer daily the sacrifice of the immaculate lamb, practice continual chastity? If David and his friends were not permitted to eat the bread of proposition till he had avowed that for the three preceding days they had refrained from women, how pure in body and soul should be the priest who daily partakes of that living bread, of which the bread of proposition was but the type. And if the people at Mount Sinai were forbidden to come near their wives for three days before receiving the law, should not they whose office it is to preach the law at all times abstain altogether? Thorndike, an eminent Protestant divine, in his work entitled Just Weights and Measures, makes the following observation. The reason for single life for the clergy is firmly grounded, by the fathers and canons of the church, upon the precept of St. Paul, forbidding man and wife to depart unless for a time to attend unto prayer. First Letter to the Corinthians, Chapter 7, Verse 5 For priests and deacons being continually to attend upon occasions of celebrating the Eucharist, which ought continually to be frequented, if others be to abstain from the use of marriage for a time, then they always. Second, writers frequently discuss the secret cause of the marvelous success which marks the growth of the Catholic Church everywhere in spite of the most formidable opposition. 
Some ascribe this progress to her thorough organization, others to the far-seeing wisdom of her chief pastors. Without undervaluing these and other auxiliaries, I incline to the belief that, under God, the Church has no tower of strength more potent than the celibacy of her clergy. The unmarried priest, as St. Paul observes, first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 7, is free to give his whole time undivided to the Lord, and can devote his attention not to one or two children, but to the entire flock whom he has begotten in Christ Jesus through the gospel. While the married minister is divided between the cares of his family and his duties to the congregation, a single life, says Bacon, doth well with churchmen, for charity will hardly water the ground where it must first fill a pool. Third, the world has hitherto been converted by unmarried clergymen, and only by them will it continue to be converted. St. Francis Xavier and St. Francis de Sales could not have planted the faith in so many thousands of souls if they were accompanied on their journeys by their wives and children. Of all the gems that adorn the priestly diadem, none is so precious and indispensable in the eyes of the people as the peerless jewel of chastity. Without this pearl, the voice of a hyacinth becomes as sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. With it, the humblest missioner gains the hearts of multitudes. Everybody is aware of the numerous conversions to Christianity effected by St. Francis Xavier in Japan in the 16th century. After the lapse of many years from the death of St. Francis, when a French squadron was permitted to enter the Japanese ports, a native Christian named Peter having learned that French priests were on board, put their faith to the test by proposing to them these three questions. Are you followers of the Great Father in Rome? Do you honor Mary, the Blessed Virgin? Have you wives? The French priests, having satisfied their interrogator on these points, and especially on the last, Peter and his companions fell at the missioner's feet, exclaiming with delight, Thanks! Thanks, they are virgins and true disciples of our Apostle Francis. A contemporary writer has wittily remarked that perhaps the most ardent admirer of hymeneal rites would cheerfully admit that he could not conceive St. Paul or St. John starting on a nuptial tour, accompanied by the latest fashions from Athens or Ephesus and the graceful brides whom they were destined to adorn. They would feel that Christianity itself could not survive such a vision as that. Nor could the imagination in its wildest moods picture the majestic adversary of the Arian emperor attended in his flight up the Nile by Mistress Athanasius, nor St. John Chrysostom, escorted in his wanderings through Phrygia by the wife of his bosom arrayed in a wreath of orange blossoms. Would Ethelbert have become a Christian if St. Augustine had introduced to him his lady and her bridesmaids? We frequently hear of unmarried bishops and priests laying down their lives for the faith in China and Korea, and imprisoned in Germany. Heroic sacrifices such as these are, however, too much to be expected from men enjoying the domestic luxury and engrossed by the responsibility of a wife and children. But does not St. Paul authorize the marriage of the clergy when he says, Have we not power to carry about a woman, a sister, as well as the rest of the apostles? The Protestant text mistranslates this passage by substituting the word wife for woman. It is evident that St. Paul does not speak here of his wife, since he had none, but he alludes to those pious women who voluntarily waited on the apostles and ministered to them in their missionary journeys. It is also objected that the apostle seems to require that a bishop be the husband of one wife. The context certainly cannot mean that a bishop must be a married man, for the reason already given that St. Paul himself was never married. The sense of the text, as all tradition testifies, is that no candidate should be elected to the office of bishop who had been married more than once. It was not possible in those days always to select single men for the Episcopal office. Hence the church was often compelled to choose married persons, but always with this restriction, that they had never contracted nuptials a second time. They were obliged, moreover, if not widowers, to live separated from their wives. 
Others adduce against clerical celibacy these words of St. Paul. In the last times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to spirits of error, forbidding to marry. This passage, however, alludes to the Ebionites, Gnostics, and Manicheans, who positively taught that marriage is sinful. The Catholic Church, on the contrary, holds that matrimony is not only a lawful state for those who are called to embrace it, but that it is also a sacrament, and that the highest degree of holiness is attainable in conjugal life. Some go so far as to declare continency impracticable. Our dissenting brethren in the ministry are so uxoriously inclined that, perhaps for this reason, they dispute the possibility, as well as the privilege, of priests to remain single. But in making this assertion, they impugn the wisdom of Jesus Christ and his apostles, who lived in this state and recommended it to others. They slander consecrated priests and nuns, and they unwittingly question the purity of their own unmarried sisters, daughters, and sons. How many men and women are there in the world who spend years, nay, their whole lives, in the single state? And who shall dare to accuse such a multitude of incontinency? Nor should any one complain of the severity of the law of clerical celibacy, since the candidate voluntarily accepts the obligations after mature consideration. Finally, I cannot be urged against celibacy that it violates the divine precept to increase and multiply, for this command surely cannot require all marriageable persons to be united in wedlock. Otherwise, bachelors and spinsters would also be guilty of violating the law. The number of men and women consecrated to God by vows of chastity forms but an imperceptible fraction of the human family, their proportion in the United States, for instance, being only one individual to about every four thousand. Moreover, it is an incontrovertible fact that the population increases most in those countries in which the Catholic clergy exercise the strongest influence. For these married people are impressed with the idea that marriage was instituted not for the gratification of the flesh, but for the procreation and Christian education of children. End of chapter 30 Recording by Jadopi www.jadopi.wordpress.com Chapter 31 of The Faith of Our Fathers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jadopi. The Faith of Our Fathers by James Cardinal Gibbons. Chapter 31 Matrimony. Matrimony is not only a natural contract between husband and wife but it has been elevated for Christians by Jesus Christ to the dignity of a sacrament. Husbands, says the Apostle, love your wives as Christ also loved the church and delivered himself up for it. So also ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall adhere to his wife, and they shall be one flesh. This is a great sacrament, but I speak in Christ and in the church. In these words the Apostle declares that the union of Christ with his church is the type or model of the bond subsisting between man and wife. Now the union between Christ and his church is supernatural and sealed by divine grace. Hence also is the fellowship of a Christian husband and wife cemented by the grace of God. The wedded couple are bound to love one another during their whole lives, as Christ has loved his church, and to discharge the virtues proper to the married state. In order to fulfill these duties, special graces of our Savior are required. The fathers, councils, and liturgies of the Western and the Oriental churches, including the Coptic, Jacobite, Syriac, Nestorian, and other schismatic bodies, which for upwards of fourteen centuries have been separated from the Catholic communion, all agree in recognizing Christian marriage as a sacrament. Hence the Council of Trent, speaking of matrimony, says, Christ himself, the institutor and perfecter of the venerable sacraments, 
merited for us by his passion the grace which might perfect that natural love, and confirm that indissoluble union, and sanctify the married, as the Apostle Paul imitates, saying, Husbands, love your wives, as Christ also loved the church, and delivered himself for it, adding shortly after, This is a great sacrament, but I speak in Christ and in the church. Ephesians chapter 5 Whereas, therefore, matrimony in the evangelical law excels in grace, through Christ the ancient marriages, with reason have our holy fathers and councils and the tradition of the universal church always taught that it is to be numbered among the sacraments of the new law. The gospel forbids a man to have more than one wife, and a wife to have more than one husband. Have you not read, says our Saviour, that he who made man in the beginning made them male and female? And he said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they two shall be in one flesh. Wherefore they are no more two, but one flesh. Our Lord recalls marriage to its primitive institution as it was ordained by Almighty God. Genesis chapter 2 Now marriage in its primitive ordinance was the union of one man with one woman, for Jehovah created but one helpmate to Adam. He would have created more if his design had been to establish polygamy. The scripture says that man shall adhere to his wife, not his wives, it does not declare that they shall be three or more, but they shall be two in one flesh. Hence Mormonism, unhappily so prevalent in the United States, is at variance with the plain teachings of the gospel, and is consequently condemned by the Catholic Church. Polygamy, wherever it exists, cannot fail to be a perpetual source of family discord and feuds, it fosters deadly jealousy and hate among the wives of the same household. It deranges the laws of succession and primogeniture and breeds rivalry among the children, each endeavoring to supplant the other in the affections and the inheritance of their common father. Marriage is the most inviolable and irrevocable of all contracts that were ever formed. Every human compact may be lawfully dissolved but this. Nations may be justified in abrogating treaties with each other. Merchants may dissolve partnerships. Brothers will eventually leave the parental roof, and, like Jacob and Esau, separate from one another. Friends, like Abraham and Lot, may be obliged to part company. But by the law of God, the bond uniting husband and wife can be dissolved only by death. No earthly sword can sever the nuptial knot which the Lord has tied. For what God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. It is worthy of remark that three of the evangelists, as well as the apostle of the Gentiles, proclaim the indissolubility of marriage, and forbid a wedded person to engage in second wedlock during the life of his spouse. There is, indeed, scarcely a moral precept more strongly enforced in the gospel than the indissoluble character of marriage validly contracted. The Pharisees came to Jesus, tempting him and saying, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? Who answering said to them, Have ye not read that he who made man from the beginning made them male and female? And he said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. Therefore, now that they are not two, but one flesh, what, therefore, God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. They say to him, Why, then, did Moses command to give a bill of divorce, and to put away? He said to them, Because Moses, by reason of the hardness of your heart, permitted you to put away your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. And I say to you that whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And he that shall marry her that is put away committeth adultery. Our Savior here emphatically declares that the nuptial bond is ratified by God himself, and hence that no man, nor any legislation framed by men, 
can validly dissolve the contract. To the Pharisees interposing this objection, if marriage is not to be dissolved, why then did Moses command to give a divorce? Our Lord replies that Moses did not command, but simply permitted the separation, and that in tolerating this indulgence the great lawgiver had regard to the violent passion of the Jewish people, who would fall into a greater excess if their desire to be divorced and to form a new alliance were refused. But our Savior reminded them that in the primitive times no such license was granted. He then plainly affirms that such a privilege would not be conceded in the new dispensation. For he adds, I say to you, Whosoever shall put away his wife and shall marry another committeth adultery. Protestant commentators erroneously assert that the text justifies an injured husband in separating from his adulterous wife and in marrying again. But the Catholic Church explains the gospel in the sense that, while the offended consort may obtain a divorce from bed and board from his unfaithful wife, he is not allowed a divorce of inculu matrimoni, so as to have the privilege of marrying another. This interpretation is confirmed by the concurrent testimony of the evangelists Mark and Luke, and by St. Paul, all of whom prohibit divorce of inculo without any qualification whatever. In St. Mark we read, Whosoever shall put away his wife and marry another committeth adultery against her. And if the wife shall put away her husband and be married to another, she committeth adultery. The same unqualified declaration is made by St. Luke. Every one that putteth away his wife and marrieth another committeth adultery, and he that marrieth her that is put away from her husband committeth adultery. Both of these evangelists forbid either husband or wife to enter into second wedlock. How aggravating soever may be the cause of their separation! And surely, if the case of adultery authorized the aggrieved husband to marry another wife, those inspired penmen would not have failed to mention that qualifying circumstance. Passing from the Gospels to the Epistle of St. Paul to the Corinthians, we find there also an absolute prohibition of divorce. The Apostle is writing to a city newly converted to the Christian religion. Among other topics, he inculcates the doctrine of the Church respecting matrimony. We must suppose that as an inspired writer and a faithful minister of the Word, he discharges his duty conscientiously, without suppressing or extenuating one iota of the law. He addresses the Corinthians as follows. To them that are married, not I, but the Lord, commandeth, that the wife depart not from her husband, and if she depart, that she remain unmarried, or be reconciled to her husband, and let not the husband put away his wife. Here we find the apostle, in his master's name, commanding the separated couple to remain unmarried, without any reference to the case of adultery. If so important an exception existed, St. Paul would not have omitted to mention it. Otherwise, he would have rendered the gospel yoke more grievous than its founder intended. We must, therefore, admit that according to the religion of Jesus Christ, conjugal infidelity does not warrant either party to marry again, or we are forced to the conclusion that the vast number of Christians whose knowledge of Christianity was derived solely from the teachings of Saints Mark, Luke, and Paul were imperfectly instructed in their faith. Nor can we suppose that St. Matthew gave to the married Christians of Palestine a privilege which St. Paul withheld from the Corinthians, for then the early Christian church might have witnessed the dissatisfying spectacle of aggrieved husbands seeking in Judea for a divorce from their adulterous wives, which they could not obtain in Corinth, just as discontented spouses in our times sue in a neighboring state for a legal separation which is denied them in their own. Christ is not divided, nor do the apostles contradict one another. The Catholic Church, following the light of the gospel, forbids a divorced man to enter into second espousals during the life of his former partner. This is the inflexible law she first proclaimed in the face of pagan emperors and people, and which she has ever upheld in spite of the passions and voluptuousness of her own rebellious children. 
Henry the Eighth, once an obedient son and defender of the church, conceived in an evil hour a criminal attachment for Anne Boleyn, a lady of the queen's household, whom he desired to marry after being divorced from his lawful consort, Catherine of Aragon. But Pope Clement the Seventh, whose sanction he solicited, sternly refused to ratify the separation, though the pontiff could have easily foreseen that his determined action would involve the church in persecution and a whole nation in the unhappy schism of its ruler. Had the Pope acquiesced in the repudiation of Catherine, and in the marriage of Anne Boleyn, England would, indeed, have been spared to the Church, but the Church herself would have surrendered her peerless title of Mistress of Truth. When Napoleon I repudiated his devoted wife Josephine and married Marie Louise of Austria, so well assured was he of the fruitlessness of his attempt to obtain from the Holy See the sanction of his divorce and subsequent marriage, that he did not even consult the Holy Father on the subject. A few years previously, Napoleon appeared to Pius the Seventh to annul the marriage which his brother Jerome had contracted with Miss Patterson of Baltimore. The Pope sent the following reply to the Emperor. Your Majesty will understand that upon the information thus far received by us, it is not in our power to pronounce a sentence of nullity. We cannot utter a judgment in opposition to the rules of the Church, and we could not, without laying aside those rules, decree the invalidity of a union, which according to the word of God no human power can sunder. Christian wives and mothers, what gratitude you owe to the Catholic Church for the honorable position you now hold in society. If you are no longer regarded as a slave, but the equal of your husband, if you are no longer the toy of his caprice and liable to be discarded at any moment, like the women of Turkey and the Mormon wives of Utah, but if you are recognized as the mistress and queen of your household, you owe your emancipation to the Church. You are especially indebted for your liberty to the popes, who rose up in all the majesty of their spiritual power to vindicate the rights of injured wives against the lustful tyranny of their husbands. How opposite is the conduct of the fathers of the so-called Reformation, who, with the cries of religious reform on their lips, deformed religion and society by sanctioning divorce. Henry the Eighth was divorced from his wife Catherine by Cranmer, the first reformed primate of England. Luther and his colleagues, Melanchthon and Bucer, permitted Philip, Landgrave of Hesse, to have two wives at the same time. Karlstadt, another German reformer, justified polygamy. Modern Prussia is now reaping the bitter fruits of the seeds that were sown within its borders. Seventy-five percent of the marriages now contracted outside of the Catholic Church in Berlin are performed without any religious ceremony whatever a union not bound by the strong ties of religion is easily dissolved this subject excites a painful interest in our own country in consequence of the facility with which divorce from the marriage bond is obtained in many of our states we have here another exemplification of the dangerous consequences attending a private interpretation of the sacred text when luther and calvin proclaimed to the world that it was not wise to prohibit the divorced adulterer from marrying again they dreamed of the fruitful progeny which they destined before long to spring from this isolated monster of their creation. There are already about thirty causes which allow the conjugal tie to be broken, some of which are so trifling a nature as to provoke merriment were it not for the gravity of the subject, which is well calculated to excite alarm for the moral and social welfare of our country. Persons are divorced by the courts not only for infidelity, but also without even the shadow of scripture authority, for alleged cruelty, intemperance, desertion, prolonged absence, mental incapacity, sentence to the penitentiary, incompatibility of temper, and such other causes as the court, in its discretion, may deem sufficient. For the year ending June 1874, 1,742 applications for divorce were presented in the state of Ohio. If such is Ohio's record, what must be the matrimonial condition of Indiana, which is called the paradise of discontented spouses? In Connecticut there were, in 1875, 4,385 marriages and 466 divorces from the marriage bond. 
The number of divorces obtained in the same state during the last fifteen years has reached 5,391. This is the record of a state whose public school system is considered the most thorough and perfect in the country. The statistics given of Ohio and Connecticut will enable us to form some idea of the fearful catalog of divorces annually obtained in the United States. There are some who regard the Catholic Church as too severe in proclaiming the absolute indissolubility of marriage, but it should be borne in mind that it is not the Church, but the divine founder of the Christian religion that has given us the law. She merely enforces its observance. The law, how rigorous soever, is mercy itself, when compared with the cruel consequences which follow from the easy concession of divorce. The facility with which marriage is annulled is most injurious to the morals of individuals, of the family, and of society. It leads to ill-assorted and hasty marriages, because persons are less circumspect in making a compact, which may be afterwards dissolved almost at will. It stimulates a discontented and unprincipled husband or wife to lawlessness, quarrels, and even adultery, well knowing that the very crime will afford a pretext and legal grounds for a separation. It engenders between husband and wife fierce litigations about the custody of their offspring. It deprives the children of the protecting arm of a father, or of the gentle care of a mother, and too frequently consigns them to the cold charity of the world for the married couple who are wanting in conjugal love for one another are too often destitute also of parental affection. In a word, it brings into the household a blight and desolation which neither wealth nor luxury can repair. There is but one remedy to this social distemper, and that is an absolute prohibition of divorce of inculu. In accordance with the inflexible rule of the gospel and of the ancient church, in Catholic countries divorces are exceedingly rare, and are obtained only by such as have thrown off the yoke of the Church. If the sacred laws of matrimony are still happily observed by so large a portion of the Protestant community, the purity of morals is in no small measure due to the presence among them of the Catholic religion, which exercises a beneficial influence even over those who are outside the pale of her communion like the sun whose benignant light and heat are felt even in those secluded spots which his rays can but obliquely and dimly penetrate end of chapter thirty one recording by jadopi www.jadopi.wordpress.com end of the faith of our fathers by james cardinal gibbons